chapter one of the evacuation of england the twist in the gulf stream this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by judy mason the evacuation of england the twist in the gulf stream by l p gratacap chapter one part one in washington april nineteen o nine alexander laycraft was regarding with as much interest as his constitutional lassitude permitted the progress of a distinctly audible altercation on pennsylvania avenue washington d c the disputants had not felt it necessary under the relaxing influence of a premature spring to interpose any screen of secrecy such as a less exposed position or subdued voices between themselves and the newsmongering and hungering let it be added proletariat of our nation's capital a small crowd composed of the singular human compound always pervasive and never to be avoided in washington which in that centre of political sensations is made up of street loafers accidental tourists perambulating babies niggers and presumptive statesmen enclosed this argument and from his elevated station within the front parlour of the mckinley mr laycraft was afforded a very excellent view of and an equally distinct hearing of the disagreement and its principles the two disputants were themselves sufficiently contrasted in appearance to have allured the casual passer-by to observe their contrasted methods in debate one the taller was a thin angular man with unnaturally long arms a peculiar swaying habit of body an elongated visage terminating in a short stubby growth of whiskers and a sharp crackling kind of voice with unmistakable nasal faults he seemed to be a southern man modified by a few imitations of the northern type he was addressing a bulky rather disdainful man in a checkered suit of clothes who had advanced the season's fashion by assuming a straw hat and whose rosy face broad and typical features and yet not plethoric expansion of body strong and stalwart frame betokened much animal force and reserved power of action he might have been a northern man as alexander laycraft looked at them it was the southern man who was speaking and his uplifted arm at regular intervals rose and fell as the palms of both hands met in a cadence of corroborative of wax it may interest the reader to know that the particular time of this particular incident was april nineteen o nine let me tell you this mr tomkins drawled the southerner with loquacious ease the crackle and sharpness of his intonation appearing as his excitement increased the necessity of our states demand the canal at whatever cost it will be the avenue for an export trade to the east which will convert our stored powers of production into gold and it will react upon the whole country north and south in a way that will make all previous prosperity look like nothing our cotton mills have grown our mineral resources have been developed georgia and alabama are to-day competing with your shaft furnaces and steel mills for the trade of the railroads and builders and for that matter we are building ourselves we can support a population ten times all we have to-day our resources have been just broached but exhaustion is a thousand years away our rival has been cuba she has robbed us of trade she has put our sugar plantations out of business even her iron which i will admit is superior in quality has scaled our profits on raw ingots but she can't hold us down on cotton open up this canal and we will gather the riches of the orient our ships will fill it with unbroken processions 
and in the train of that commerce in cotton every section of the union will furnish its contribution to swell the argosies of trade i tell you sir and the excited speaker conscious of admiring sympathy in the crowd around him raised his voice into a musical shout in which the crackle was quite lost the commerce and mercantile integrity of these united states will be restored and american bottoms for american goods will be no longer a vain aspiration it will be a realized dream an actual fact he paused as if the projectile force of his words had deprived him of breath and then at the momentary opportunity mr tomkins in a clear and metallic voice with a punctuative force of occasional hesitation undertook his friend's refutation i'm not contesting the fact mr snowden he said that the opening of the canal means a good deal to your portion of the country does it mean as much to the rest of the country and does it mean so much to you for a long time you mention cotton do you know that the cotton cultivation of india and egypt has increased enormously and that it has grown with cheaper labor than you can command you have made the negro acquainted with his value you have raised his expectations you have thrust him into a hundred avenues of occupation and every one of his new avocations adds a shilling a day to the worth per man of the remainder who stick to field work and cultivate your cotton fields the cotton of egypt and the cotton of india i mean its manufactured forms will go through that canal to asia and japan and polynesia just as surely as yours will and it'll go cheaper it is poorer cotton i know but that will not affect the result that isn't all brazil and the argentine republic are growing cotton and they are doing well at it europe will take the raw stuff from them and keep up her present predominance in that market while she turns their cotton balls into satinettes and ginghams for the almond eyes of asia the canal breaking down a barrier of separation between the two oceans turns loose into the pacific the whole frenzied greedy and capable cohorts of european manufacture it will make a common highway for europe and our unbuilt clippers and tramp steamers will stay unbuilt or unused to rot on their ways in the shipyards the west coast will be sidetracked and our trunk railroads will cut down their schedules and their dividends at the same time roosevelt put this canal through and your southern votes helped to elect him against his protest but brought to it by an overwhelming public sentiment that applauded his power to chain or sterilize trusts and he promised last march to your southern rooters at his inauguration to see that before his present new term was over before nineteen thirteen the canal would be opened and perhaps he'll make good you southerners elected roosevelt and you have killed the democratic party the new powers of growth of that party were most likely to develop among you but you shoved aside the proffered offer of political supremacy because you too had surrendered to the idols of mammon and were willing to sell your birthright for a mess of pottage well you've got the canal and you've got roosevelt and let me tell you mr snowden and the restrained almost nonchalant demeanour of mr tomkins became suddenly charged with electric earnestness you'll get hell too this admonitory expletive uttered with a force that seemed to impart to it a physical objectivity caused the increasing circle of auditors to retreat sensibly and without more consideration giving a glance of mute scorn at the flushed face of the southerner the speaker pressed his way through the little crowd which after a moment's suspension of judgment seemed reluctant to let him escape and disappeared his opponent was distinctly chagrined the wrinkled lines about his peculiarly pleasant eyes indicated his strained attention and were not altogether unrelated to a sudden muscular movement in his clenched hands 
his hopes however for some sort of forensic gratification might have been sensibly raised as he discovered himself the sole occupant of the small vacant spot on the sidewalk walled in by a human investiture the first line of which was made up of two piccaninnies three newsboys one rueful cur and some impromptu mothers who had taken the family babies out for air and recreation but overcome by the indigenous love of debate had forgotten their mission and held their charges in various attitudes of somnolence or furtive rebellion against the hedge of men behind them it was evidently expected that the southern gentleman would relieve his feelings and it was also evident from a few ejaculations haphazardly admitted from the concourse that the majority of those present was in his favour mr snowdon looked around him reflectively and a sense of personal dignity forced its way against the almost overpowering impulse to appeal to popular approval and convinced him that the place and the audience were inopportune for any further discussion he could not however escape the demonstrated force of popular expectancy and with a consenting smile a shrug of his shoulders and with his hat raised above his head swinging gently he called out three cheers for teddy in the canal in an instant the group seized the invitation and under the cover if it may be so violently symbolized of the cloud of vocality his enthusiasm evoked mr snowdon like the fortuitous and directive deities of the epics vanished there remained an unsatisfied group to which more accessions were quickly made the whole movement evidently animated by some emotion then predominant in the national capital this group broke into little knots of talkers and as the day was closing no urgency of business engagements and no immediate insistency of domestic duties interfered with the easily elicited washingtonian tendency to settle on the public curb the vexed questions of state if not to enlighten providence on the more abstruse functions of his authority alexander laycraft willingly surrendered himself to the study of this representative public all thing and felt his exasperating torpor so much overcome by a new curiosity as to make him not averse to stepping out into the hall of the hotel descending the steps into the street and engaging himself in the capacity of a rotational listener at the various groups sometimes not exceeding two men who had become vocally animated and felt themselves called upon to supply the deficiency of objurgation so disagreeably emphasized by the sudden departure of the northern and southern disputants the illuminative results of his ambulatory inspection and his own expostulations or inquiry may be thus succinctly summarized mr theodore roosevelt elected in his own behalf in nineteen o five as president of the united states after having served out the unexpired term of william mckinley who was assassinated in november nineteen o one and with whom he had been elected as vice president had been again re-elected in the fall of nineteen o eight against his emphatic rejection at first of a joint nomination of the republican and democratic parties the campaign if campaign it could be called had been one of the most extraordinary ever recorded and in its features of popular clamour the grotesque conflict of the personal repugnance of an unwilling candidate nominated against his will and in defiance of his own repeated inhibitions to nominate him at all because of his solemn promise that he would defer to the unwritten law of the country and not serve a third term was altogether unprecedented and to some observers ominous he was reminded that his first term although practically four years was still only an accident that there was no subversion of the unwritten law in his serving again as his actual election as president had occurred but once that his popularity among the people was of such an intense almost self-devouring ardor that it was an act of suicidal negation of unpatriotic desertion 
to shun or reject the people's obvious need that a war yet unfinished had been begun by him against corporate interests and that its logical continuance devolved upon him that the unique occasion of a unanimous nomination to the presidency carried with it a sublime primacy of interest that cancelled all previous conditions promises or wishes on his part and laid an imperious command upon its subject that deprived him of volition and absolutely dissolved into nothingness any apparent contradiction of his words and acts finally it was insisted that the panama canal was nearing completion that its remarkable advance was due to mr roosevelt that this fact had been prepotent in shaping the councils of southern democrats in proposing the otherwise unwarranted endorsement of a republican nomination that a strong minority sentiment had crystallized around an angry group of capitalists who were only too anxious to get rid of roosevelt altogether and that in the case of his refusal these men would so manipulate the newspapers and inflame public apprehension against some possible outbreak of social radicalism financial heresy and anarchistic violence that a reaction begun would become unmanageable and some tool of the reactionaries and the railroads would be swept into office and with him a servile congress and roosevelt's work so aggressively and successfully prosecuted would be all sacrificed nor was this all the return to a divided nomination with an unmistakable intention on the part of the conservatists to repeal all disadvantageous legislation to the monopolies corporations and trusts would at once precipitate a conflict of classes a radical man possibly a demagogue would be placed in opposition to the choice of the plutocracy his election was also not improbable the powers of socialism enormously strengthened by the adhesion of an educated class might be triumphant and the succeeding steps in social revolution would bring chaos this dilemma was so pertinaciously displayed so forcibly accentuated that roosevelt had yielded at the last moment not insensibly affected as what spirited man would not be by the magnificent assemblies mass meetings throughout the country tumultuously vociferating the call of the people the southern people with characteristic warmth and through the suddenly consummated attachment of senator tillman to roosevelt and under the coercion of senator bailey's logic and power of argumentative persuasion had swelled the tide of popular approval roosevelt became an idol his election was almost unanimous a handful only of contestants having gathered in a kind of moral protest around governor hughes as a rival candidate governor hughes nomination was achieved through a combination of opposite political interests as anomalous as that which chose roosevelt and having precisely the same quality of coherence it represented dissatisfied republicans an alienable remnant of democrats and had drawn into it a few sporadic political elements that barely sufficed to give it numerical significance w j bryan who would have been otherwise a candidate himself had endorsed roosevelt furnishing thereby an example of political abnegation which had enormously increased in popularity and assured him the nomination of nationalists as the new fusionists were called in nineteen thirteen this was also deemed a wise forethought as provision against the possible success of the rampant hearstites hearst would have been the socialist candidate in the last campaign had not the principal himself on hearing of roosevelt's nomination sapiently withdrawn fearing defeat which would have too seriously discredited him in the next national struggle the prohibitionists had by an act of virtual self-repudiation thrown their not inconsiderable vote to roosevelt the socialists were the only important opponents of his election and 
their surprising record made the prophetic warnings which had convinced roosevelt of the necessity of his candidacy appear like a veritable intervention of providence at least this was the language commonly used with reference to it roosevelt had displayed remarkable self-control and consistent gravity and had even in a very extraordinary address at his inauguration deprecated the unanimity of his election he deplored the precarious dilemma of a country which found itself forced to do violence to its traditions in order to escape an imagined danger almost synchronous with his re-election the announcement had been made that the panama canal upon which the president in his former term had exerted the utmost pressure of his inexhaustible enthusiasm energy and exhortation was advancing very rapidly engineering difficulties unexpectedly had vanished a system of extreme precision in the control of the work itself largely the device of the president had facilitated the entire operation and a promise of still more rapid progress was made this promise had produced a storm of southern enthusiasm the south completely restored in its financial autonomy had been growing richer and richer and their public men had not hesitated to paint in the brightest colours the further expansion of their prosperity with the opening of this avenue of commerce between the oceans assuring its people the markets of asia and their rapid promotion to the political social and financial primacy in the united states northern capitalists had not been incredulous to these predictions and in a group of railroad magnates whose interests now seemed seriously threatened a sullen resentment was maintained against roosevelt in which the unmistakable notes of designs almost criminal had been detected mr tompkins whose altercation with the southerner had led laycraft into this voyage of interpolation and discovery was a paid agent in the employ of this cabal alexander laycraft was an englishman inheriting an english temperament without english prejudices he was fortunately free from the worst faults of that insular hesitancy which imparts the curious impression of timidity and had advanced far enough in cosmopolitan observation to get rid of the queerness of provincial ignorance he was indeed a sane and attractive man and provided by nature with a forcible physique a good face and a really fascinating proclivity to make the best of things admire his companions and bend unremittingly to the pressure of his environment he had not escaped the dangers incident to youth and his heart had become attached to a lady of baltimore one of the undeviatingly arch and winning american girls to whom he had been introduced by her brother commercial correspondent the nature of his affairs he was the secretary of an english company which operated some copper mines in arizona and canada had made him a frequent visitor to the shores of the new world and he had not been unwilling to express his hope that the united states would become his final home these sentiments were quite honest though it might have elicited the cynical observation that the capture of his affections by miss garrett had done more to weaken his loyalty to the crown than any dispassionate admiration of a republican form of government but the imputation would have been malicious laycraft did feel an earnest admiration for the american people and yielded a genial acquiescence to the claims of popular suffrage his connection with america had been fortunate and he had come in contact with men and women whose natures by endowment and whose manners and habits conversation and tastes by inheritance and cultivation were elevating and engaging men and women whose nobility of sympathy with all things human was reflected in an art of living not only always decorous and refined but guided too by the principles of urbanity and justice the garrets of baltimore were a widely connected and in numbers an imposing social element and none of the various daughters of light and loveliness who bore that name more merited consideration in the eyes of manly youth than the capricious captivating and elusive sally 
her graces of manner were not less delightful than her conversation was spirited and roguish and her assumption of a demure simplicity had often driven alexander laycraft to the limits of his english matter-of-fact credulity in explaining to her the relations of the king to parliament or the municipal acreage of the old city of london all of which information this very well-read and much-travelled young woman as might be expected was possessed of but just for the purposes of her feminine and cruel fancy not too well disposed toward her patient suitor disingenuously concealed sally really enjoyed the painstaking gravity with which the young englishman explained the eternal principles of english rule and the never-to-be-forgotten superiorities of london mr laycraft had met sally under circumstances the most provocative of admiration in her own home where the sincerity of hospitality and the urgency of an american's deference to the best instincts of courtesy did not altogether mitigate her coquetry and mirthful affectations and even by the faintest gloss of repression made them the more delicious the englishman was bewitched and his infatuation declared itself so plainly that sally whose heart was quite untouched by his distress tried the resources of her ingenuity to avoid meeting him alone laycraft on the morrow of the day whose clothes had so deeply inducted him into a study of american politics expected to make a deferred visit to the garrets at baltimore and he had quite firmly resolved that he would reveal his desperate extremity to sally and plead his best to show her how empty life would be to him without her and that it would be shockingly obdurate in her to decline to regard him as the goal of her marital ambitions he felt some fear of her revolting gaiety and his fears were not assuaged by the remembrance of any particular occasion when her conduct towards him permitted him to indulge in hopes still the thing must be done his unrest must be quieted to know the worst was better than this feverish anxiety of doubt and besides with a prudence not altogether british he thought he could endure repulse better now than later and in the event of that evil alternative he could cast about him for alleviating resources which might be more easily found now than if he waited longer and if he continued to expose himself to the perilous encounter of her eyes and the tantalating caresses of her wit End of chapter one part one Chapter One, Part Two of the Evacuation of England by L. P. Gratacap. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Laycraft returned to the hotel, he found a letter waiting for him, which he saw at once was from his friend Ned Garrett. He tore it open and discovered, to his considerable discomfiture, that it postponed the event of his momentous proposal. It read, "Dear Laycraft." aunt sophia is very sick at lichfield connecticut mother and sally have gone on can you put off your visit until may say the twenty eighth you will find it dull here without sally and mother i shall go with them as far as new york we all intend if aunt sophie concludes to remain in this bright world a little longer and the doctor endorses her good intentions to visit gettysburg on memorial day decoration old style the president will deliver a memorial oration come with us and see the great battlefield which is a wonderful monument to the nation's dead a beautiful picture itself and probably you will see and hear things worth remembering besides write to the house and i will get your letter when i return in two weeks but do come yours sincerely edward t garrett laycraft put down the letter slowly he was disappointed a summons to the west to the mines in arizona had reached him just the day before and he must get out there before a week was over he had thought to have finished this affair first and to find in the tiresome trip distraction if sally was unfavorable to his appeal or unexpected interest if he succeeded in winning her assent 
still he could readily accept the invitation he would be back in may and perhaps after all the occasion might be more favourable sally softened into a little sympathetic humour by her visit to her sick aunt and he strengthened by the encouraging reflection of having successfully dissipated the little cloud of misunderstanding or worse at the mines might produce conditions psychologically adequate to bring about his victory he stepped to the window the view from it was always pleasing at this moment in the descending shades of the closing day and with the vanishing lights hurrying westward beyond the potomac it possessed an ineffable loveliness the great white spectre of the washington monument immaterialized and faintly roseate against the softly flaming skies and brooding genius-like above the trees of the reservation was always there and that night it assumed the strangely deceptive but fascinating vagary of an exhalation as if built up from the emanations of the earth and the vapours of the air remaining immobile in the still ether as a portent or a promise the man's face grew clouded as the fairy obelisk faded and with the enveloping darkness became again discernible as a dull and stony pile that evening laycraft felt particularly restless and detached he felt the need of entertainment and of entertainment of a sort that would fix his faculty of thought awaken speculation and immerse him in reasonings and the intricacies of argument the few theatrical bills presented no attractions more weighty than a clever comedian in a musical farce a sensational melodrama much better said laycraft and vaudeville music was shunned there was nothing quite serious offered and then music has so many painful influences on the apprehensive mind and is turned to such cruel uses in the economy of nature for making uneasy lovers more agitated no he didn't wish music baffled for an instant he concluded to walk muscular exercise mere translation on one's legs is a marvellous remedy for the diabolical blues and then it can never be told what the unseen holds for you if you only go out to meet it in the streets and amongst other people hunting perhaps like yourself diversion from their own inscrutable megrims it the unseen may quite divertingly mix you up in a comedy or a tragedy or consolingly give you a glimpse of other human miseries immeasurably greater than your own so walk it was he had hardly covered two blocks towards the white house when he met dr m the most amiable and accomplished editor of the national museum and one of those multifaceted gentlemen who respond to every scientific thrill around them and hold in the myriad piled-up cells of their cerebral cortex the knowledge selected labelled and accessible of the world laycraft knew the doctor had indeed consulted him upon a chemical reaction in the elimination of cadmium from zinc the doctor with genial fervour grasped his hand persuasively put his own disengaged hand on laycraft's back and dexterously turned him around with the observation you are going the wrong way ben reads a paper to-night before the geographical society over at the museum on a live subject it's about earthquakes and the panama canal the matter has a good deal of present interest the president may be there it's worth your while come along laycraft jumped with pleasure if an englishman may be said ever to respond so animatedly to a welcome alternative this met his requirements exactly he would in these surroundings and under the stimulation of an intellectual effort in listening to a lecture which he hoped might possess literary merit as well quite forget his immediate solicitudes it is curious resumed dr m as they directed their steps towards the umbrageous solitudes of the reservation how inevitably many practical questions demand an answer at the hand of geology or physiography which are however never consulted and disaster follows 
in the spring of nineteen o six a destructive outbreak of vesuvius occurred and much of the ensuing loss of life might have been prevented by reliance upon scientific warnings indeed the loss of life on this last occasion of the volcano's activity was greatly reduced through the premonitions of its approach by delicate instruments for that matter from the beginning the volcanologist at least as soon as such a being was a more or less completed phenomenon in our scientific life would have pointed out the considerable risk of living on the flanks of that querulous protuberance but it can hardly be expected i suppose that large populations can effect a change in habitation as long as the dangers that threaten them occur at long intervals and the human fatality of unreasoning trust in luck remains unchanged take for instance the case of the village of torre del greco four and a half miles from the foot of vesuvius it has been overwhelmed seventeen times but the inhabitants the survivors return after each extinction to renew their futile invocations for another chance i suppose queried laycraft that we are to be informed to-night whether the canal from the scientific point of view is a safe investment mm, perhaps doubtfully returned the doctor you see it's this way in the spring of the year that saw the outpouring of lava that invaded the villages of southern italy san francisco suffered from a serious earthquake that ruptured the public structures of the city dislocated miles of railroad tracks ruined the beautiful stanford university shook out the fronts of buildings and precipitated a fire that all but wiped out the queen city of the pacific coast it has been feared that some such seismic terror might demolish the superb structures of the canal and we are to learn to-night whether these earth movements threaten the new waterway at the isthmus i have reason to believe rejoined laycraft that this canal has been itself a source of political disturbance and that it is likely to affect convulsions in your body politic as dangerous in a social way as those which brought about the financial and physical upset at san francisco don't worry on that score replied his companion i can tell you that the political texture of this country is not to be worn to a frazzle by any collision of interests such things adjust themselves and the way out only means a new entrance to brighter prospects and bigger undertakings yes i guess someone will be hurt but individuals don't count if the whole people are benefited still remonstrated laycraft the people is made up of individuals and it's simply a fact that you can't disturb the equilibrium of one part of society without jostling the rest in a way yes slowly answered the doctor but it is quite clear to my mind that the enormous advantages of the canal will hide from sight the losses that may be inflicted on the railroads in the dislocation of rates and even that will be temporary as the new business raises our population and their passenger traffic touches higher and higher averages the canal has been an expensive enterprise suggested laycraft it would be a great misfortune if it brought any kind of material reverses rubbish retorted the doctor this prating is the madness or the envy of croakers and cranks do you think that a connection between the oceans that will shorten the route from one to the other by nearly six thousand miles and bring our eastern seaboard with all its tremendous agencies of production within reach of a continent that is slowly becoming itself occidentalized and demanding every day the equipment of the west is a mercantile delusion we are all gainers it is a scheme of mutualization on a world-wide scale but america distributes the profits and holds the surplus the two friends by this time had reached the entrance of the museum and passing through its symbolic portals turned to the left and found themselves in a dull room portentously charged with an exhaustive exhibit of the commerce of all nations here on tables and shelves was displayed a wonderful assortment of primitive and modern ships primeval dugouts philippine catamarans mediterranean pirogues sloops schooners brigs brigantines 
barks barkentines luggers lighters caravels dutch monstrosities models of those extraordinary ships which motley has described as built up like a tower both at stem and stern and presenting in their broad bulbous prows their width of beam in proportion to their length their depression amidships and in other sins against symmetry as much opposition to progress over the waves as could well be imagined the latin trireme and the greek trireme the iron clouds of france used in eighteen fifty five the monitors of the civil war the recent wonders in battleships torpedo boats and destroyers with naphtha launches submarine wonders the old-time american cutters and models of the stately packets that once made the trip from new york to portsmouth in fourteen days with a various and diversified exhibit of yachts and pleasure boats all burnished japanned and varnished and now dimly lustrous in the feudal illumination of the room above them on the walls was a prolix illustration of the hydrography of the world charts of currents pelagic streams areas of calms submarine basins maps of rainfalls prevalent winds storm regions precipitation barometric maxima and minima and then still higher up on the walls that dispensed knowledge over each square inch of their dusty and dusky surfaces lay a craft decried the tabulations of tonnage of the merchant marine of the nations of the earth with fabulous figures of imports and exports and the staple products of this prolific and motherly old earth caressed into fructification by the tireless arms of her scrambling broods of children laycraft was soon deserted by the doctor who found occasion to wander among the slowly arriving scientific gentry and politely inquire after the health of the particular scientific offspring whose tottering footsteps each one was engaged in nurturing into a more reliant attitude before the world laycraft found the dim room with its preoccupied occupants vacantly settling into the seats around him and its motley array of picturesque models strangely congenial it soothed by the abrupt strangeness of its contents the subdued intellectual placidity of the audience and by its mere physical retirement from the outer bustle of the streets and the iterative commonplaces of the hotel corridor the exact process of subduction would have been hard keenly to analyze but laycraft seemed to forget his personal disquietude and develop into a congenial oneness with these earnest men and women around him eager to know and not too patient towards sophistry or pretension he hardly cared to know who was who it made no matter they all seemed freed from the petty vanities of living and now engrossed in the triumphant tasks of thought and he felt himself elevated into a kind of mental abstraction which eagerly carried on its functions in an atmosphere of ideas and yet how was it that just above the little desk which was to receive the honourable burden of the lecture's manuscript he suddenly distinctly saw the fair face with its light blue eyes its delicate blush of colour and the slightly mocking pout of the lips of sally the beloved laycraft almost rose upright in his astonishment at the impossible hallucination he was leaning forward half incredulous of the report of his own senses and half subjected by delicious whim that the apparition was an augury of success when a commotion spreading on all sides of him roused his attention and the vision fled he would have willingly had it stay people were rising in his vicinity and soon the assembly was on its feet some one had entered who was the cause of this unusual excitement the president came to his ears murmured by a dozen persons near him and he had hardly sprung to his own feet when with many salutations a strongly formed rather bulky man with a manner of almost nervous scrutiny passed by him moving down the aisle to the front it was indeed president roosevelt and laycraft now startled into the most active interest slipped forward a seat or two to gain a position which might afford him a better view of this remarkable person the audience remained standing until the president 
escorted by a tall red-whiskered gentleman whom dr m who had just turned up in search of his friend whispered was dr george o smith the distinguished director of the survey had reached a seat reserved for him at the front of the hall laycraft now observed more closely the character of the convocation and realized its composite and representative elements dr m always himself immersed in the study of the lives achievements and distinctions of the prominent men of the country was an enthusiastic verbal cicerone through the maze of faces which seemed suddenly to have condensed into a really crowded audience here was dr d the alaskan explorer in the early days of the nineteenth century the world recognized authority on the tertiary fossils of the east and west coasts and a man of erudition and delightful literary skill beyond him sat dr m a quiet-faced man curator of the national museum author of textbooks and gifted with a singularly shrewd thoughtfulness at his side sat the sphinx-featured f of chicago a gentle-minded scholar to whom the heavens had entrusted the secrets of their meteoritic denizens and who by a more fortunate circumstance held a pen of consummate grace again at his side was the jupiter-browed ward an erratic over the face of the globe possessed with a transcendent enthusiasm for the same celestial visitors that f described and chasing them with the zeal of a lynx in their most inaccessible quarries a man of immense conviviality and controlling the smouldering fires of a temper that defied reason or resistance at the front of the rows of chairs and not far from the cynosure of all eyes the president were two notable students of the past life of the globe professors o and s men whose studies in that amazing storehouse of extinct life which the west held sealed in its clays and marls limestones and sandstones had continued on higher and more certain levels the work of marsh and lady and cope and who had transcribed before the whole world in monuments of scientific precision the most startling confessions of the fossil dead to one side on the same row sat professor b known in two continents for chemical learning especially on that side of chemistry which mingles insensibly with the laws of matter and whispering in his ear with sundry emphatic nods sat next to him dr r of washington learned in the ways of men's digestion and the enigmas of food and the arts of food makers in the row behind the expressive head of young aureoled with years and honours was seen and at his side the face of newcomb who had set the seal of his genius and industry across the patterned stars here was a h the geologist reticent and receptive there c weighted with new responsibilities in furnishing time to the rapacious biologist and in discovering new ways of making this old world behind them sat m wise beyond belief in bric-a-brac and brachiopods vindictively assertive and self-sacrificingly tender and kind there was mcgee and i w a v and b w bringing to the speaker the homage of archaeology of petrology of zoology and morphology in a group of motionless and eager attention were a the sage meteorologist beloved in two continents b abstruse and difficult meditative as a man might be who kept his hand on the pulses of matter and b skilful in weighing the atoms of the air or probing the volcanoes of the moon in one line mingling in conversation that reached laycraft's ears as a strange jargon of conflicting sciences were g h and h k and beyond them mute as if by mutual repulsion sat f the agile scrutinizer of nature's crystals p holding in his labyrinthine memory the names of half a universe of shells and b n to whom each plant of the wayside bowed in recognition of a master's knowledge of itself against the wall in a triad of sympathy was a the surgeon s the neurologist and r and alone in an isolation that belied his intense geniality was k and through all the scientific congeries 
which were far more extended than laycraft could recognize or even dr m recall was a more garrulous grouping of politicians statesmen diplomats ministers the well-dressed circles of the rich and the dilettantes drawn to this unusual assemblage by the presence of the president the quiet and dull room faded and with contents tiresomely drilled into the exact alignments of a museum hall took on an almost brilliant appearance the fancy amused itself with the thought that it too felt in its stagnated life the unique occasion and shook itself into a momentary wakefulness to note and record its distinguished guests that its streaked walls tried to hide their unseemly rents and the multiplied models and charts struggled to look recent and familiar and appreciative amid such intellectual tumult but now the audience was forgotten at that theatrical moment when the chairman and the lecturer advanced over the platform to assume the directive guidance of the evening they did advance with that curious gaucherie which somehow always disables the scientific man in his official and public utterances and seems by some trick of compensation the more unredeemable as the unfortunate victim of its cynical attachment is the more distinguished and renowned dr s stepped gingerly forward a tall effective man with hair hardly sanguine in colour and quite conventional in arrangement with a cerebral development that somehow disappointingly dwarfed the lower contours of his face domed and broad as it was with much scholarly promise he was followed by the speaker of the evening mr Bin, who seemed half inclined to screen himself from observation behind the utterly inadequate profile of the famous director the two men momentarily catching the full assault of the numerous eyes each pair among them being the visible battery of a questioning and critical mind behind it underwent an obvious confusion of intention and movement and became somewhat mixed up with the table and chairs and with each other the director extricated himself came forward to the edge of the platform and in a voice of half propitiatory jocularity introduced the subject and the speaker he alluded to the favourable conjunction of the meeting of the american association for the advancement of science and that of the national academy of science which brought so many eminent thinkers and observers together and administered an especial emphasis to the question to be considered this evening he mentioned with a deferential bow in the direction of the president that they had all been deeply honoured by the presence of the chief executive of the nation to whom perhaps more than to any one else in the brilliant audience the grave question of the structural and geological stability of the isthmus of darien was one of overshadowing interest and he congratulated every one that the subject was in the hand of one whose geological fame was beyond dispute and his carefulness of statement unimpeached and the director sat down pulling off to one side of the stage lest his own refulgence might dim the legitimate monopoly of that article by dr bin laycraft observed that as the lecturer unrolled his manuscript on the reading desk the president leaned outward adjusted his eyeglasses and scrutinized the geologist who from a rather embarrassed fumbling with his sheets seemed conscious of the inquisition a moment later as if satisfied with his inspection the president leaned back bulky and immobile and became an absorbed listener mr bin well known for his lithological studies and the possession of a good style in the scientific sense was a short man evincing under control however the peptic influences of years with a face of decided legibility in which sense and penetration seemed equally indicated he had provided himself with charts which had been distended in an irregular line above his head and to these he occasionally referred his reading of the important pages before him was clear and audible but totally neglectful of the informing appliances of elocution of melody of voice accent and deliberation the lecture was brilliant and distinguished and quite comparable in its qualities to the serious people who had gathered in great intellectual force to receive its instructions End of chapter one part two
Chapter Two, Part One of the Evacuation of England by L. P. Gratacap. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The lecture. Note: If the reader is too much interested in getting to the upshot of this tale, let him skip the lecture. But it is a mistake. This lecture was delivered by Mister Ben on the ninth of April, nineteen o nine, and is well worth while mr president dr smith and ladies and gentlemen began the speaker the area of the panama isthmus and the west indies has been an area of successional changes very considerable in their amount very persistent in their frequency it embraces a tropical area contiguous on its pacific side to a meridional section of the earth which is very unstable and which almost monopolizes the contemporaneous volcanic energy of the earth it adjoins or is limited itself on the east in the atlantic by the antillean islets the emergent crests of submerged volcanic vents it could be presumptively held on these grounds that the isthmus itself partook of these characters of inequilibrated crustal motions it might be affirmed with a fair amount of precision that its future history would continue this impression the west indies as defined by hill embracing the islands that with cuba form a long convexity terminating in trinidad on the coast of south america represent to-day a disintegrated continent they are supposed to have embodied a former geographical unity it had terrestrial magnitude and lay atlantis-like between south america and north america at a time when the present narrow neck of land upon which our eyes are now as a nation fixed with anxious preoccupation was itself swept over by the confluent waters of the two oceans and when at that point which now forms an attenuated avenue of intercourse between north and south america the tides of a broad waterway alternated in their allegiance to the east or west coasts of the separated continents and possibly a precarious and fluctuating contribution from the warm gulf stream found its way into the pacific the discussion of this question opens up for our consideration the examination of the geographical structure of these oscillating terrains as to what these are made up of and it is evident that we must reach some general conclusion as to the succession of the strata composing them and their relative positions to each other as whether they are in the language of stratigraphy conformable or unconformable the inference and argument are simple if we find that the rocks composing these sections are crystalline ancient and deeply bedded formations presumably coexistent so to speak with the original or very early formative beds of the world and referable to its beginnings we are permitted by all the analogies of induction and deduction to assume that these rocks have at least a relative stability on the other hand if our examination reveals the fact that they are recent deposits more or less unconsolidated easily disturbed in their positions easily readjusted in their molecular or physical structure then by the most unexceptional and matter-of-fact observation we shall regard them as questionably permanent indeed as unmistakably non-resistant to the subterranean forces of terrestrial mutation again it is clear that a pile of bricks or of any other superimposed building blocks is the more secure in its equilibrium if the component parts overlie each other along the broadest surfaces and come into contact or fit as we say in parallel position if these bricks succeed each other in lines of brick that are flat and then in lines that are vertical or placed on their thinnest and narrowest edges and these two contrasted positions alternate or are irregularly disposed with reference to each other in the same wall such a construction implies involves elements of weakness and under the shock of any incident force would succumb in ruin more quickly and more irretrievably than the former 
if further the latter building style had suffered ruptures and dislocations and the gaps or openings and broken surfaces of contact between its parts had been invaded or replaced by an irregular or incongruous assortment of filling differing from the original bricks in substance texture and hardness then we have a third pattern of composition that again is weaker than either of its predecessors but further if this least massive and most vulnerable type of structure has been subjected to repeated and considerable strains of elevation and depression and strains recurrent at short intervals then without inspection we know that its interior coherence has been much shattered and that it has undergone a progressive dilapidation but i am constrained to go one step farther in this hypothetical picture of structural defectiveness to return to our wall of brick it can be made up of bricks laid upon each other in consecutive tiers it can be made up of tilted tiers of bricks bricks laid on each other but inclined to a horizontal plane and finally it is conceivable that the bricks may be so arranged as to be inverted in their relations to the horizontal plane the diagrams make clear these contrasted positions now of all these types of structures the last obviously best meets the requirements of a type which will prove the least susceptible to dislocation i think that can be apprehended almost without explanation a moment's reflection will make it conspicuous the bricks tilted up in inclined tiers or beds upon disturbance if the cohesion between them is seriously impaired tend to fall away from each other and gravity increases the effects of the initial displacement if the bricks lie flat they do not fall apart upon the cessation of any push or upheaval but remain disordered falling back into some quasi position of rest if the bricks are inverted and form in section a series of lines converging to the base of the wall their disarrangement is largely rectified by their own gravity bringing them back into their first positions in geology strata overlying each other in succession as the bricks do when on their flat faces are called conformable if they succeed one over the other with the edges or summits of the lower abutting against the horizontal surfaces of the next as do the bricks when they are placed in flat and vertical positions in alternating strips that is unconformability if the strata are usually horizontal like the evenly piled series of bricks they are called undisturbed if inclined against each other they are inclined and they may make monoclinals having one slope or anticlinals when they lean up against each other like the opposite sides of a peaked roof or synclinal when inclined towards each other in an inverted position like the same roof overturned with its ridge pole on the ground and its inclined sides lifted into the air or like the bricks in the last pattern of structure described when we carry these similes into nature we have all kinds of rocks and we have them in mountains in plains and all the familiar configuration of the earth's surface now we find that those portions of the earth immediately beneath our feet extending for a mile or so into the surface of the earth are variously made up of layers strata beds formations lying on one another and conformable or unconformable undisturbed or thrown into anticlinal or synclinal folds that the material in its general mineral character is limestone marls or sands and sandstone slates clays metamorphic rocks like gneiss and quartzite etc and associated with them are granites which may have been melted lava-like rock before it cooled and crystallized while there is plentiful evidence of abundant outflows of igneous melted or viscid rocks evidence of lines of eruption of foci or craters of eruption thus as in the brick structure where unrelated and later material has been introduced in fissures gaps openings holes etc of the walls we have some of the architecture of the earth an original bedded structure invaded by very contrasted substances 
and which give to that architecture as in the brick wall of our homely illustration lack of homogeneity and lack of strength in the west indies and on the isthmus of panama we have the states of instability which we have signalized viz secondary deposits of a somewhat loose and unconsolidated material and wanting in the deeply bedded crystalline rocks in which new england in the adirondacks and the piedmont or higher regions abutting on the coastal plain in the northern united states furnish a solid and probably fundamentally deep-seated pediment of resistance to shock again in the west indies and in the isthmus we have the beds unconformable over each other which you will recall in our symbol of the brick wall was a feature of weakness also these unconformable beds are inclined in anticlinals a further aspect of structural insolvency and further these beds have been widely pervasively in places infiltrated and ruptured by subsequent introductions of volcanic substance ashes lava and intrusive magmas thus the geological aggregates present the previously illustrated condition of fragility and the absence of the so-called tectonic elements of rigidity but still one step more in our disheartening study of this equatorial problem i a few moments past called your attention to the fact that if this least massive and most vulnerable type of structure has been subjected to repeated and considerable strains of elevation and depression and strains recurrent at short intervals then without inspection we know that its interior has been much shattered and that it has undergone a progressive dilapidation precisely such catastrophes are discovered in the history of the geological region now before us the islands of the west indies have been subjected to great changes of elevation they have risen and fallen during the last geological age the tertiary perhaps four times in their rise they have gathered to themselves marginal extensions of land now hidden beneath the ocean at comparatively slight depths while they have at the same time doubtless become blended and unified into a great antillean continent this continent was dominated by volcanic protuberances whose growth upward over accumulations of ashes has been again symptomatic of undermining operations threatening later subsidence and submergence in our day we have been called upon to deplore the ravages caused by the eruptions of mount pele and la souffriere on the islands of martinique and st vincent and it is natural to insist that regions which have a precarious autonomy in which such volcanoes can exist must be regarded with diffidence as permanent geographical areas it was pointed out by professor robert t hill that the current and formerly undisputed conception that the rocky mountains of north america and the andes of south america were not only analogous physiographically but univalent in fact that the continuous elevation of central america brought them into an oblique alignment and that their mutual prolongations met in the isthmus of panama was erroneous it involved a complete misconception it was a geographical fallacy and leads to misleading conclusions as to the permanency of this intermedian region itself preeminently individualized and liberated from the circumstances and implications of either the rocky mountain continent or the andean continent this area has a different geological ancestry today it invokes an especial treatment and possibly expects a future contrasted with that of the two great continents whose longitudinal extension it contravenes by its east and west lines by the prerogatives of a separate origin the rocky mountains terminate in the plateau of mexico a little south says hill of the capital of that republic and that the mountains have no orographic continuity or other features in common with those of the central american region and the same authority describing the terminus of the andes says the northern end of the andean system lies entirely east of the central american region and is separated from it by the rio atrato the most western of the great rivers of colombia 
in fact the deeply eroded drainage valley of this stream nearly severs the pacific coast from the republic of colombia and the ismithian region from the south american continent the central american volcanoes belong to the type that is repeated along the caribbean shores of colombia and venezuela and those in the isthmus of panama and those of the great antilles the genesis of this american mediterranean land aggregate was in an independent geological impulse and the land aggregate itself impinged by intersection upon the dominant land surfaces of north and south america to bring together north and south america as a simultaneous geological phenomena is wrong to make them other than an accidental geographical continuity questionable it is this intermediate zone the antillean continent with lateral elongations grasping within its continental solidarity the parallel zones of central america and the isthmus that gives them terrestrial unity extend the axis of the rocky mountains and it passes almost two thousand miles west of the coast of south america extend the axis of the andes and it bisects the western extremity of cuba and passes along the seaboard of the united states there is no exact geological identity here although there is the strictest geographical homology each is the backbone of a continent each upheaved and variously modified igneously invaded sediments derived from some pre-existent continent they may be brought into a just comparison but they are not strictly parts of one phenomenon they are however more closely related to each other than the antillean areas are to either this antillean area i shall here call the colombian continent as the great discoverer landed at its two east and west extremities the landfall on san salvador in the bermudas and on the coast of honduras in central america as well as at cuba and at the mouths of the orinoco and his bones rested for a long time in the soil of san domingo it this colombian continent is a significant intercalation it unites north and south america but it unites them subject to the phases of its own generation let us understand this there is a system of growth a law if i may so term it of geomorphic sameness in the development of large or for that matter small geological territories the familiar story of the growth of our north american continent has been often told it is a commonplace of textbooks the wide triangular archean nucleus to the north the oldest rocks outlines and outliers down the east and the same in the west drew the framing limits of the continent at the first to be filled in up and out by the momentous additions through the ages of advancing time in europe less well or simply defined boundaries the growth together rather of divided islands prevailed and the picture of development was quite varied from the picture in this western world again in africa with edges of uplift and centres of depression another geological tale with its incidents and accessories infinitely modified comes into view and in this prevalence of structural style we geologically speaking find a prevalence of certain geological phases or conditions what were these in the growth and disappearance of this colombian continent what they have been we can with rational probability assume they will be the colombian continent i have called a dismembered a fractionized continent if from cuba through haiti puerto rico and the lesser antilles one land surface obtained and the now submerged and radiating gorges found only as submarine canyons were above the ocean becoming as professor spencer has laboriously proven subaerial river valleys we should have one presumable phase of this continent the phase of its maximum cohesion and extension and such a phase is measurably or for purposes of argumentative inference sensibly established it is said with careful premeditation by hill 
that the numerous islets of its eastern border the bahamas and windward chain which extend from florida to the mouth of the orinoco are merely the summits of steep submarine ridges which divide the depths of the atlantic from those of the gulf of mexico and caribbean sea were their waters a few feet lower these ridges would completely landlock the seas from the ocean when thus constituted it afforded a display of physical features of astonishing contrasts and its mere scenic resources were doubtless of unparalleled splendour and as to-day it was involved in the luxuriant productivity of the tropics its mountains measuring now as high as eleven thousand feet above the sea level were then thrust upward into stupendous peaks by the addition of the sloping miles which are now below the ocean we can imagine the extreme wonderfulness of this continent uniting in an unbroken but marvellously varied expression of physical and vegetable contrast the plains valleys and mountains of cuba the towering and draped peaks of jamaica the confusion of the gloomy vales and ranges of haiti and san domingo the levels and coastal ranges of puerto rico and the manifold picturesque charms of the lesser antilles lifting high into the ceaseless currents of the trade winds the smoking summits of a chain of disturbed volcanoes all in the boundless abundance of its natural endowment of loveliness and productivity formed an unique and extravagantly ornamented landscape an area whose highest elevations contemplated the remote waters of the shrunk atlantic from pinnacles raised ten to twenty thousand feet above its azure waves nor is this all this hypothetical the colombian continent may have had connections with central america through projecting and peninsulated capes reaching through jamaica to yucatan or honduras and wide intervals of dividing gulfs of water in all probability sundered it from north or south america and it remained as i here emphatically insist it remains to-day a geographical and geological phenomenon unrelated to the great continents to which through their preponderating value the mind almost unpremeditatingly assigns it but at the period of this greatest elevation when this tropical region assumed individual independence and embodied a geognostic importance comparable to the vast continents it lay between at this time the isthmus of panama did not exist and through a wide waterway the atlantic mingled its tides with those of the pacific we are thus led to believe that as between the west indian terrains and the neck of land now embraced in the isthmus of panama we have a relation of isostasy the speaker armed with this formidable verbal equipment of attack upon his audience had walked to the front of the platform and harbouring some unusual confidence in his powers had deserted his manuscript isostasy he had realised possessed probably unqualified novelty and by way of assurance lest its terrors might empty the hall he assumed a colloquial relation to his day's hearers and offered an explanation of this unexpected mystery isostasy he resumed is simply this equilibrium it is the maintenance of average level as if one part of the earth's surface was pushed up above a mean level then the requirements of isostasy would depress another part below it we can also call it the adjustment of a changing load as if through depression from the dumping upon the floor of the ocean of a great amount of sediment derived from the land surface of the earth neighboring areas of the land of the oceanic floors were raised two contiguous regions might and the lecturer turned directly toward the president who in his own earnestness of attention had elbowed himself round into a direct line with mr Bin in the case of the west indian continent and the isthmus of panama have maintained between them an up-and-down reciprocity of movement as when one was up the other was down and vice versa mr Bin looked introspectively at the walls and ceilings of the room as if engaged in a mental rehearsal and 
review of his staggering statement and returned to his desk and manuscript satisfied that he had thrown the assembly into an uneasy apprehension of danger he again began his reading it is true if i understand mr spencer correctly that the atlantic ocean was cut off by the elevation of the columbia continent from even the interior basins of the caribbean sea and the gulf of mexico at least in the early pliocene times that these depressions were then broad plains receiving in part the drainage of the antillean highlands this again emptying into the pacific ocean but this is not a proven theory and it involves an extravagant readjustment of the physical features of a region that to my mind more expressively can be considered immemorially permanent in their general aspects at least i reiterate the reciprocity of movement between the antillean continent and the isthmus of panama the cause i have suggested may be untenable but there seems strong geological proof of some such alternating relation between the west and east sides of this interrelated region the great antilles on one side the isthmus of central america on the other end of chapter two part one chapter two part two of the evacuation of england by l p gratacap this librivox recording is in the public domain our survey of the question produces one impression and that very forcibly viz that this narrow ridge of separation is ephemeral that it is perishable that under the tests or against the shocks of earth strains it will succumb and the lecturer raised his voice half to turn deferentially to the chairman dr smith who accepted the attention with an assenting nod again the waters of the two oceans will unite and the impetuous violence of the rushing oceanic river the gulf stream that now races and boils through the caribbean sea will fling its torrential waves across this divide into the pacific the audience that with manifest absorption had thus far followed the speaker was disturbed a movement of chairs a half audible protest of whispered incredulity and a sensible emanation around him of mental repugnance to such a catastrophe made laycraft momentarily turn his eyes from mr bin to the frowning countenances at his side but the speaker raised his voice with reassuring quickness as if to stay the emotional resistance he had aroused we have no reason to believe that in our lifetime or the lifetimes of many generations yet to come so strange a reversal of present conditions should occur and again that in this matter we may be calmly judicial we have reason at least for a moderate fear whatever state of unstable equilibrium of unadjusted balance is implied or actually is resident in this section of our earth a section that has undergone the extremes of hyposymmetrical displacement we may conceive that like the explosive cap or the compressed spring or the bent bow it will win instant relief upon the impact of any force deep-seated enough and powerful enough to liberate its tectonic strain i am thus brought to consider that world-wide source of terrestrial deformation earthquakes but i should forget the indulgence of your patience up to this point if i should now undertake any partial review of these astonishing and alarming occurrences i am deeply impressed however with an aspect of the subject that demands attention that throws into sharp relief the prophecies of disaster with which willingly or unwillingly we have all become familiar the lecturer here rolled forward to the front of the platform a blackboard on which in coloured chalks the earth looking somewhat like a shortened egg with its north and south poles situated on the long flattened sides was depicted while a black line or axis drawn through it terminated in the sahara desert on one side and near the society islands on the other 
two ominous circles in vermilion were described on it concentric respectively with the ends of the black line one sweeping along the western coast of north and south america and crossing the isthmus of panama the other encircling the coasts of africa and gathering in their fatal course the azores canaries and the cape verde islands and on both these terrifying curves in black letters was printed the hypnotic intimation belt of weakness or earthquake ring the effect on the audience was sufficiently impressive the staring rude drawing around which a cyclone of blue scratches purporting to be clouds was expressively raging intensely steeped the observers in a spell of wonder and trepidation even laycraft by the contagion of a common obsession craned his neck and fixed his eyes with a stupid absorption upon the crazy and paradoxical diagram the speaker continued noticing with undisguised satisfaction the ocular concentration produced by his obnoxious figure with its anomalous portents it is well known that we have in the boundaries or shorelines of the pacific a surprisingly larger number of earthquakes recorded than anywhere else in the world and this seems in some way coincident with the prevalence of active volcanoes in the same region professor harton has enumerated for the world four hundred and seven volcanoes two hundred and twenty five of which are active of these latter one hundred and seventy two are on the margin of the pacific professor milne who lived a long time in japan for the express purpose of studying the earthquake problems of those islands has observed the surprising frequency of their earthquakes and it is a volcanic zone they occupy we have in contradistinction to this area about the pacific a reversed circle which envelops the western coast of africa and by this chart here the lecturer pushed back the blackboard and standing alongside of it began with a pointer of elucidation a direct allocution to that subject of confusion we are made immediately cognizant of the opposite and yet symmetrical disposition of these zones this should have from its simplicity and a quasi-permanency in its phenomena its earthquake phenomena a general explanation the explanation is not reassuring it is not proven but it is accepted by many and has for me a very reasonable probability let us at least not recoil from its consideration under the encouragement of this exhortation the audience seemed to slide forward in their seats a few inches with the impetus of a renewed hope this chart said the speaker presents to you the structural conception of professors jeans and solace of the form of the earth it is the shape more or less familiar to you commonly known as a pear-shaped earth the tip carrying the sahara desert on its bulging top and its broader and inferior extremity holding the disturbed pacific basin now it makes a very practical difference what the shape of the earth is because the shape affects the stability and has an important influence upon the fluctuating strains under its surface observe that the chart is developed upon two circles of instability these lines of weakness and the lecturer swept his pointer over the contrasted belts one around africa and the other inflicting the west coast of north america with its ominous intersection the pointer paused on the latter circle stopping near the position of san francisco you recall the speaker continued the terrifying affliction of this great city in nineteen o six and the pall of discouragement and gloom which it cast over the region in which the city naturally held the sway of mercantile supremacy now it was shown by professor h h turner the english astronomer that san francisco lies on one of the two great earthquake rings which surround the end of the pair as in this chart like wrinkles produced by the crowding down of the protuberances under the force of gravitation and according to this view such rings marking lines of weakness and yielding in the rocks would not exist if the earth was in its shape what we most usually assume to be its figure an oblate spheroid with the present north and south poles at the ends of its axis of rotation 
to which axis of rotation the rest of the earth was symmetrically disposed the existence of these earthquake and volcanic rings was known before the pair theory had been defined but then of course their relation with any peculiar form of the earth was not understood the ring surrounding the pacific or butt end of the pair includes a large part of the shores of the pacific ocean running from alaska down to the western coast of south america then across to the east indies and back around the other side through japan the other ring is somewhat smaller in diameter including the earthquake regions of west africa and the atlantic islands now the point of interest is this as garrett p service has significantly said if the pair hypothesis is accepted and the two great earthquake rings are found to be definitely connected with the strains to which the planet is subjected in its effort to attain a state of equilibrium under the forces of its own gravitation and rotation which tend to compel it into spheroid shape then we have a perfectly rational explanation of the existence of certain places where earthquakes are sure to occur more or less frequently and of other places like eastern america where they are very rare and never of maximum violence everyone present this evening and the lecturer gave an embracing wave of his hand knows of the singular aberrancy in the rotational motion of the earth which has been often geographically described as the wobbling of the poles astronomers have proven a real tipping of the poles alternately to one side and then to the other a swaying of the poles like the recurrent oscillations of a top as it goes to sleep but this swaying in the earth's case is periodic and unchanging it is sometimes rather abrupt and at other times the tipping is regulated and progressive but it is established and has had a generally accepted explanation in the attraction of the swelling equatorial prominence of the earth by the sun and moon while suggestions have also been made that it was due to internal shiftings of mass or to changes of exterior weightings through the alternate and variable formation and melting of polar snows but it has in the light of the present theory of the pear-shaped earth a new and rather startling explanation we are however this evening not so much concerned with the broader cosmic aspects of this state of affairs as with the immediate consequences to the permanence of our land surfaces the mechanics of this condition and its possible effectiveness in developing contrary placed zones of rupture can be easily conceived this awkwardly conditioned sphere revolving upon a shorter diameter revolving also with astonishing velocity and bearing at either extremity of its longer axis unequal masses is obviously in a state of peripheral strain that is it is in strain at such distances from either of the disproportioned ends the one in the south seas the other in the desert of sahara as would represent the more or less sharply sloping surface from its average rotundity towards these oblique extremities gentlemen the speaker seemed excitedly rushing into danger but with a fixed expression aimed somewhere at the blank and uninfluential physiognomies at the back of the hall like that of an engineer who can neither restrain nor reverse the speed which may either carry him safely over a tottering support or plunge his train to the bottom of the gulch gentlemen the isthmus of panama is in this zone the canal is there this last reminder uttered with no very reasonable deliberation and it is to my mind an absolutely established certainty that the secular instability of that region shown by geological investigation will again become apparent and he raised his voice with a kind of exhalation of defiance as if he spurned equivocation and invited denial and it will become apparent with increased violence this conclusion is unwelcome it may seem destructive to those natural hopes which the approaching completion of this wonderful enterprise the panama canal have so freely and inevitably fostered science in the last resource to her counsels must be austerely judicial she cannot take cognizance of man's projects or respect his hopes the panama canal is part of the isthmus of panama 
participates in all the vicissitudes of the latter and we know that those vicissitudes mean dislocation and subsidence when such frightful results will happen it is impossible to say that they must happen we can positively assert the lecture was over the lecturer retreated and again repeated his deferential nod to the chairman dr smith as if importuning his assistance in corroboration of his mournful vaticination the audience still remained immobile coagulated into a sort of mental prostration by this dismal prophecy and yet again as if contemplating like a cat's stagnation preparatory to its murderous spring some outward and physical resentment and the spring came in the middle of the hall arose a tall and alert figure perhaps noticeably bent as if from the effort of attention or perchance from forensic habits for the man as dr m quickly informed laycraft was senator tillman of south carolina the face of this sudden expostulant was handsome in the extreme and the features strongly marked were blended together in an expression of youthfulness that seemed to win a strange charm from their association with the white hair and the just beginning wrinkles of advancing years senator tillman lost no time his interruption was decisively intentional it was part of an impulsive impassioned nature shaking his index finger which from long practice pointed undeviatingly at the object of his remarks the senator in a voice harsh and penetrating began my dear sir we are indebted to you for information but we stop there we are not required to credit you with prediction this scientific discussion will not alter our confidence nor stop the work on the canal it can't i am not inclined to think that this nation will be stultified by the oracles of geology it is a matter of simple determination that science makes mistakes and i would advise no one in this room within the hearing of your voice and no one outside of it to whose eyes your reported views will appear to allow them a scintilla of serious import in nineteen o six mark smith a voteless delegate to congress from arizona told this story once commented smith a couple of my friends were riding through a desolate bit of country in arizona near the mexican border presently they came upon a man who was hanging by the neck from the limb of a tree a couple of buzzards were roosting above him but they made no attack upon him my friends drove away the buzzards and discovered on the breast of the dead man a placard bearing these words this was a very bad man in some respects and a damn sight worse in others my friends accounted for the moderation of the buzzards on the theory that they had read the placard that was all smith had to say but it was assumed that he agreed with the opinion of the other men about the subject of their discussion well i beg to say of science that it is very bad in some respects and a damn sight worse in others and its present conclusion in regard to the isthmus of panama is one of the latter the audience long before this denouement to the senator's retort was reached had arisen the president had arisen also and stood with his back to the stage facing the senator steadily growing more unrestrained and angry laycraft and dr m were half standing their hands supporting them on the backs of the chairs of the men in front of them the scene was interesting and the first movement toward the repression of the senator succumbed to curiosity and in all directions the intelligent faces about them were variously disturbed by symptoms of vexation or amusement it was uncommonly entertaining mr ben and dr smith with becoming smiles of moderation were drawn to the front of the platform and no one after the senator had swung into the torrential flow of his remonstrance thought of anything else but to catch almost breathlessly his words when he concluded a wave of laughter genuine but a little nervous went through the assembly then the president stepped to the aisle turned a moment to shake the hand of the lecturer and offer him his congratulations and bowed to dr smith in an instant the aisleway was clear the president moved on between the applauding people and as he came opposite senator tillman who had himself pressed towards the egress as if to intercept him he stopped 
there was a quick instinctive restraint everyone waited for his word senator tillman the president spoke with sharp emphasis i thank you for restoring our spirits i remember mark smith i remember he took my advice in accepting the statehood bill you may have misapplied his story but you have at least furnished us with a novel reason for encouragement again the applause broke out and the president disappeared the audience decorously dispersed and followed him and leacraft and dr m soon found themselves on pennsylvania avenue walking rapidly and silently End of chapter 2, part 2chapter three part one of the evacuation of england by l p gratacap this librivox recording is in the public domain baltimore may twenty ninth nineteen o nine laycraft finished his task in the west the disputes were smoothed out the differences adjudicated and a problem or so which had mixed up the overseer and the mining superintendent at the mines in an acute wrangle disposed of he was back to washington on his way to baltimore and sally garrett the invitation from ned garrett to visit baltimore and go with sally and himself to gettysburg on the twentieth of may had been accepted and every movement he had made each step he had taken since that memorable ninth of april when he first learned of the complexion of political affairs in the united states and had heard mr binn's remarkable lecture had been thoughtfully adjusted to getting back in time for the pleasure and the opportunity of seeing sally his own earnest desire to possess her for himself to compel her wayward and tantalizing spirit to acknowledge his mastery had increased and like most young men in similar relations to the unknown quantity of susceptibility in a popular young woman's heart his anxiety grew with every lessening minute between the present and the moment of confession but at any rate laycraft felt no indecision come what might he had no misgivings about his own feelings and lingered with no trepidation over the thought of asking miss garrett to marry him defeat was preferable to the hardship of doubt he would be less miserable after rejection if rejection it was than he was now tormented with an immeasurable uncertainty and his english heaviness that semi-sepulchral seriousness which by some amusing compensation in the gifts of nature is mingled with the very substantial merits of these people induced a rather grim sadness in his mind and he reached the door of seventy-two monument square baltimore with no actual palpitation but with a strange sense of the importance of his own fate which made him grave leocraft had many personal merits he had an excellent mind a reasonably fearless heart a sense of justice itself the best gift of god to man and a face which if not distinguished by remarkable beauty became under the excitement of feeling and in the more propitious circumstances of good health attractive from a manly comeliness not handsome perhaps but certainly not commonplace and he had physique he was tall and strong and his strength acknowledged obedience to an intelligence which made it formidable the door of the quiet house before which he stood opened and there laycraft almost stumbled into unconsciousness as if expecting him as if flying on the wings of if not love something else uncommonly pleasant as if impatient to cross the laggard moments which separated them was sally garrett it would be difficult to reproduce in words this difficult and puzzling young lady difficult to impart by any means less effective than painting or having proven ineffective unless somehow helped out by personal acquaintanceship the impression which gave both to her active admirers and to those who for reasons best known to themselves had tried to forget her charms sally was decidedly pretty 
she readily under the phases of excitement and gaiety moved upward into the realms of beauty she was fair not large delicately modelled with perniciously accomplished eyes that looked out from beneath the pencilled eyebrows and under their long lashes with all kinds of provocative invitations that were no sooner accepted than their desperate little giver revoked them with derision and anger her lips of course met the most scrupulous requirements of the critic and her teeth were as fatally perfect in colouring she furnished an example of protean adaptability the emblems of fury were seen in her flushed cheeks and the tokens of contrition in the same when they grew pale with grief this was the secret of her compelling art she bowed to all emotions and as they controlled her they set upon her face the evidence of their presence refined by the resistance of a nature which abhorred the wrong feelings improved by the welcome of a spirit which was magnanimous and sympathetic no wonder that leacraft loved her no wonder that a bewildered lot of other young men were in a similar predicament i presume at this point i owe some deference to feminine importunity how was sally dressed well sally had good taste perhaps a trifle insubordinate by nature but a rigorous subjection to good social usage had made it fairly unimpeachable at that particular moment in the afternoon of may twenty seventh nineteen o nine after his extrication from the subterranean embraces of the baltimore and ohio tunnel and an uninspired walk along charles street sally to laycraft's eyes presented the acme of sartorial perfection she wore a white lizardy gown in which were inwoven threads of grey which gave it atmosphere a kind of filminess quite indescribable but very inviting above that a waist of almost the same colour without the grey threads and fitting tightly at the wrists with faintly voluminous sleeves a stock of daffodil yellow encircled by an aquamarine necklace and in her clustering golden-brown cascades of hair rushed up into a chaste confinement between pearl-starred combs she had thrust an amethyst aigrette it was a wilful thought a vagary of sheer carelessness but it looked well and laycraft might have danced a jig if he knew how of pure ecstasy and if his imperturbable nature would have permitted so gross a jest it was one laycraft had himself given her only last christmas you can see or infer ladies that your attractive sister given as i have tried to do her natural adaptability for embellishment must have looked more than pleasing that to a young man approaching her with idolatry in his heart and prayers on his lips she must have looked very nearly like the embodiment of the feminine ideal like that inscrutable loveliness which first wins from a man his careless notice and the next moment has him chained to its feet in servitude well such were the circumstances and leacraft hastily removing his hat looked with all his eyes at the fair vision and found himself embarrassed in speaking his formal salutation how do you do miss garrett why mr laycraft replied the arch tormentor i thought it was ned he has just gone to get our tickets for to-morrow and you mr laycraft go with us you will see our great battlefield and hear our president i am sure you will find both wonderful but come in mr laycraft the vision with intoxicating grace swung back the door and preceded the tongue-tied suitor to the parlour mr laycraft left his hat and valise in the hall and followed another instant they were both seated in the deep room from whose walls the portraits of ancient and meagre or stately and peptic garrets looked down upon them and in looking were amused or distressed according to their nature at the display of modern elegance helped out by a tasteful condescension to antiquities and heirlooms the next moment was successfully engaged in greeting mrs garrett the mother of the vision a dignified and well-preserved lady who honoured all her children's friends with motherly hospitality but resented mentally all masculine strategy whose ulterior aims were the destruction of her daughter's peace of mind 
her devotion to her daughter was itself part of a devotion which made everything which bore the garret name sacred in her eyes and which reflected a family pride unmitigating in its self-exaction unrelenting in its engrossing enmity to all that offended it ned will be glad to find you here mr laycraft it was only last night that ned said he wondered if you had got rid of the business engagements that took you out west and expressed himself willing to believe that if you had you would not forget his invitation for decoration day at gettysburg it was the voice of mrs garrett a little somnolent in quality with a subdued melodiousness and monotonously even in tone indeed mrs garrett few things could have less readily escaped my mind it has been an alleviation to think of it when i got bored with quarrelsome miners whatever good luck i have had in settling the mine troubles came from my own eagerness to get back to baltimore and leacraft turned with actually a very grave face towards the meditative sally oh mr leacraft said that unconscionable woman we have ned's old classmate brig barry to go with us to gettysburg he is in the army a lieutenant who has fought indians on the reservations and has lots of medals for bravery and is just the best thing in the way of a man you ever saw i half think your english prejudices will be a little discouraged when you see him or else you will love him as well as we do and this merciless compound of mischief and bewitching beauty looked out of her blue-gray eyes with an absurd imitation of solitude which half made leacraft forget manners yes acquiesced mrs garrett mr barry is a great favorite i almost fear that mr leacraft will find him unreasonably popular i am sure replied that rapidly aspiring sycophant that i ought to feel no inclination to impugn miss garrett's good taste this was so evident an affectation to shield a too obvious chagrin that the wicked object of the innuendo simply laughed outright and was vicious enough to reply that she had never felt it necessary for her own comfort to have her own personal opinions endorsed by any one a cruel barb that lacerated the tender englishman feelings immensely the next instant the front door opened with a rough shake and a commotion of hurrying feet announced the arrival of ned garrett ned garrett was a typical american of the best breed and with the most unmistakable marks of that american suavity sweetness and splendid confidence not a whit tainted with assumption or vanity which makes the american man the best type of man the world over he too was tall and fair with fascinating aplomb and a frank surrender to the claim of friendship without a too credulous endorsement of all social paper not readily negotiable as he saw leycraft he ran to him with a glad welcome of surprise and pleasure good bernie i am right glad to see you i knew you would not forget us and you will have great reason to be satisfied with yourself for coming the affair at gettysburg to-morrow will be splendid the president will give us something characteristic the day will be the nations and the reunion of the veterans of both sides you know this country once tried to strangle itself with its own hands will be honored by a tremendous turnout of people i know with a laugh that you englishmen hate crowds unless they are turned to good account in celebrating the lord mayor's day or the jubilee of a king or something swell and uninteresting but it won't hurt you to see the meaning of a great land's reverence for its fallen dead and the big fellow full of enthusiasm his handsome countenance dilated with pride shook leycraft's hand who was quite as delighted to greet his friend whom he appreciated on his own account without considering his influential relations to the desirable sally sally and her mother were now standing and with from the former a smile of approval and from the latter a gesture of satisfaction the two ladies departed a servant appeared and the young men ascended the stairs to prepare for dinner a variety of intentions had been coursing through leycraft's mind and while ostensibly he was engaged in the commonplaces of address 
an interior agitation of plans and designs all indubitably pointed towards the denouement of his visit were tingling through his cerebral cortex with various success he felt a sudden pressure of prudence assert itself as if by some sort of psychological premonition he was made aware of the danger of temerity left by ned garrett to assume the conventional apparel for dinner and lingering with a delighted inspection of the details of his bedroom which he thought just reflected to the nice point of a modest assertion of feminine adroitness a really exquisite taste he ran over the possible and best programme for the short campaign he felt it necessary to devise for the capture of the gentle and ethereal enemy as he gazed with increasing uneasiness and poorly repressed envy at henry's piquant and picturesque coloured sketches of a virginia wedding and the departure of the bride which offered themselves so suggestively between the white curtains on the saffron tinted paper he came to this conclusion he would that evening if the occasion presented itself for a really favourable interview let sally know how much he thought of her and how hopelessly unhappy he must become if she could furnish him with no encouragement that would do just now but when they got to gettysburg he might expect to find a convenient moment to be more explicit indeed to urge her to the critical extremity of telling him what he might hope for this progressive method he fancied promised the best results and his thoughts still recalling with infatuation the uncalled-for insertion of his aigrette in her hair on the very day when he was expected he imagined if there was not absolute surrender on sally's part now there might be compromising negotiations for surrender later with complacency he looked at himself in the glass walked to the hallway and descended he had reached the broad stairway which entered the centre of the first floor of this sumptuous home descending on the two sides in a series of separate steps and then uniting into a wide terrace of steps expanding upon the hall at the bottom and guarded by a balustrade which ended in two newel posts of surprising proportions each carrying an enormous rookwood vase from which sprang a mingled white and red exuberance of sweet alyssum and geranium as laycraft stood at the top of the terrace of steps he commanded a full view of the lower hall and right beneath him at the foot of the terrace under the rokewood vases he saw sally garrett the girl whom a moment ago he had with some unction and self-flattery ventured to think was not averse to his attentions pinning on the lapel of the evening suit of a most offensively good-looking young man a boutonniere of geranium and alyssum filched the theft was evident from the great vase above their heads and to accomplish which it seemed to the maddened observation of Leacraft that the young man must have lifted the young lady this was a conjunction of agencies too terrible to dwell on with equanimity and in pure fright Leacraft stopped a moment and became an involuntary spy upon the proceedings evidently not intended for an inspection so inimical as his it was sally's voice well brick i must confess that as an accomplice in crime you are shockingly cool it was quite unnecessary for you to expect more than the flowers and yet leocraft seemed to hit the balustrade with his foot the interruption was perhaps involuntary in leocraft's condition human nature could not stand a more excruciating strain sally looked up so did the young man oh mr leocraft this is fortunate i want you and mr barry to be excellent friends mr barry is wonderfully strong and you are so wise with his agility and your advice i will have two escorts to-morrow that will save me from any exertion of mind or body mr barry will help me over the hard places and you will explain things pardon with a coquettish glance at her companion and a demure courtesy to leocraft you must go through the usual introductions my cousin mr barry mr leocraft 
remember i rely upon both of you and you must be as amicable as doves and with that equivocal enforcement of neutrality this impossible beauty vanished ned garrett appeared and saved the situation or at least diminished an insufferable embarrassment the three men were the next instant summoned to dinner they were met at the door of the dining-room by mr garrett a tall gentleman still giving evidence of an athletic youth mr garrett was a man somewhat tormented with impatience but genial withal and possessing a singular power of rapid utterance conjoined also with the power of business-like demonstration he shook hands with leacraft cordially and addressed a salutation of flattering familiarity to mr barry leacraft had suffered a very staggering blow as he recalled the affair of the stairway and he fell back with only a half-satisfied security upon sally's intimation that this unwelcome intruder the brig barry of her previous encomiums was a cousin and the plague of it all was that he leacraft was overpoweringly conscious of this same brig barry's indisputable charms mr brig was a type of physical perfection he carried on straight but not too broad shoulders a finely shaped head such which at their best are only seen in america a head which announced to the world its intelligent emotions through the medium of an expressive face wherein brown eyes dark straight eyebrows a strong large mouth an aquiline nose and blue-veined temples overhung by short curled hair combining their mutually enhancing details and making their young owner the target of feminine admiration cousins are by no means denied the privileges of marital union and as there are all kinds of cousins and the privilege is less and less questionable according to the numerical distance between them it became a matter of preliminary importance for leacraft to find out what kind of a cousin brigberry was to sally garrett in pondering sadly over this uncertainty his well-formed plans so agreeably outlined during his toilet fell into disorder and as it were evaporated his agony of heart was not relieved when he observed the cruel object of his misgivings sally was placed at his side at the dinner-table opposite them sat mr barry and ned garrett and the ends of the table commodiously accommodated mr and mrs garrett sally was radiant she was well dressed and leacraft's eyes first sought its place the aigrette was gone and he noticed acutely conscious of all tell-tale signals of interference by others with his own designs a solitaire diamond ring on her right hand his discomfiture was complete it was a sad discovery and sally gleaming with a light of happiness it was not his good luck to dispense relentlessly added to his distress by showering the loathed brig berry with glances of commendation and approval but when could this engagement he shuddered at the word have been made leacraft solicitous from the moment he entered the baltimore house in the afternoon had scanned that same hand with a jealous scrutiny about two hours before and it was guiltless of rings quite free he could have sworn to that was it possible that he had witnessed the closing rites of their pre-conjugal union from the top of the stairway it was most likely for a moment the unhappy man felt a swinging sensation a kind of revolting nausea that put an actual pain in his heart and a sudden impulse almost straightened him upon his legs and would have sent him flying from the house seized him which only an indomitable spartan furor of resistance in his english soul could have conquered End of chapter 3, part 1chapter three part two of the evacuation of england by l p gratacap this librivox recording is in the public domain the next instant he too was smiling even observing with pleasant alacrity that when brig berry raised his wine-glass to his lips his eyes fell invitingly upon sally 
and that flattered fairy responded by sipping from her own not indeed that such telegraphy of signals was obvious or unmannerly no it required the jealous eyes of an irritable rival to have seen it at all it certainly was a cruel ordeal it certainly taxed laycraft's self-possession it was so fathomless and unexpected not a word from ned about it and sally had always before appeared austerely impartial perhaps it was a sudden fancy an illusion hopeless on her part because she could never marry her own cousin the englishman rummaged painfully in his stock of conservative teachings to prove conclusively that so abhorrent a social impropriety could never be permitted but there was the ring well a ring what of it a common gift nothing more it was madness for him to jump at conclusions so recklessly two cousins admiring each other yes loving each other in a beautiful domestic family way and separated for a long time were naturally rejoicing in reunion stupid to attribute so much as he had done under so slight provocation to their mutual affection the affection doubtless of a brother and sister keener indeed as why not ruminating thus propitiously and only half conscious that he was going through the formalities of a coarse dinner and was but poorly assisting the conversation which consciously he thought had not yet developed into any consecutive line of talk he suddenly seemed to come back to his senses as these words proceeded with cellarous distinctness from the lips of the older garret a dispatch was received in the office this afternoon about an hour ago from cologne which startled us a good deal three earthquake shocks have been felt in cologne and an enormous tidal wave swept over limon bay in the direction of mindy there was loss of life at cologne the coast towards the embouchure of the chagre river has sunk sensibly and a rumour prevailed at cologne at the time the despatch was sent that the walls of the great Sulebra cut had collapsed this is bad news if it is true bad news for the president bad news for the country so enormous a disaster will be known at once if it to be known at all the fact that no press accounts have been given out makes me hope that our despatch is a mistake a canard perhaps oh the poor president exclaimed the sympathetic sally he will need his courage now it can't be so horrible they surely can't mean papa that the canal is destroyed that would be too shameful the operations of nature said ned garrett are not generally susceptible to shame nature is about the most shameless thing on the face of the earth and they all smiled at the thought yes said mr berry and laycraft watched him with eager eyes and listened with critical ears nature has a happy way of discriminating between shame and compassion she tries to make up for her cruelties by some new blessing but she never tells anybody that her cruelties ever made her blush if this news is a portent of worse if the canal should be destroyed if the isthmus is invaded by the oceans a canal without locks will be given to us free of charge and we have spent one hundred and thirty million dollars already as a financial proposition it is hard to see why we have not paid as much for one as for the other dryly commented mr garrett laycraft felt it incumbent upon him to say something and his fatal overvaluation of seriousness allured his tongue into a statement statistical and scientific something which might impress sally but which only afflicted that young degenerate person with an immoderate preference for the way her cousin brigberry might have said the same thing i am rather curiously reminded began laycraft of a lecture which i heard in washington last april in which the lecturer mr bin ventured to offer a very alarming prediction as to the instability of the central american zone and especially the portions of it embraced in the isthmus he was rebuked at the time in open meeting by a senator but if your information turns out to be correct perhaps he is about to receive a stunning corroboration 
it would be of some psychological interest to know whether mr binn in that case preferred his own reputation to his country's welfare i heard of binn's talk remarked brigberry i was near the mexican line and we had had a brush with some greasers which were kicking at uncle sam's tariff a washington paper turned up in camp and there was binn's jeremiad i think the paper had it science budding in and to laycraft's surprise sally laughed but a moment later she turned to laycraft with unaffected interest and said but mr laycraft do you think mr binn knew and her voice was plaintive and concerned it is reserved for astronomy said mr garrett to have prospective knowledge to know the future exactly with a calendar in one hand and a watch in the other i think it is not an imputation on the credibility of science to say that in other departments its knowledge of the future is speculative mr binn began laycraft was not at all didactic as regards time but he was emphatic in the general scope of his predictions he regarded the isthmus and the central american area as belonging in their geological habits to the west indies and he had a very poor opinion of the fidelity of the latter to implied obligations he regarded it as capricious and wayward unsubstantial in its composition and a bit fickle in its attachments it was almost impossible not to think that the speaker was not putting a little bit of something more than science in his words he continued his views also involved a curious reference to a rather topsy-turvy theory that the earth was pear-shaped and that the belt of earthquakes and crustal disorders along the borders of the pacific resulted from this hypothetically crooked figure of the earth brig berry was listening with intense attention and a whimsical glimmer of a smile turned the ends of his lips while his eyes very gravely with a slight contraction of their eyelids watched laycraft with half inquisitorial perplexity i think he broke in that the west indies will manage to take care of themselves at least present indications go to prove that instead of disappearing they are on their way to bigger things commander beecham who has just come from the isle of pines told me yesterday that the island was rising that in a short time it might become part of cuba the question might then be asked as we own the isle of pines whether we had not annexed cuba i have heard of the isle of pines said mrs garrett but hardly understand what it is perhaps a little enlightenment on the subject would not be unwelcome to the rest of you do brig pleaded sally in the role of instructor you may be as successful in geography as in other subjects and laycraft flushed and sacked back hard to resist the harsh blow of this subtle reminder of his worst suspicions mr barry looked around as if to secure the suffrages of the company and found every eye fixed upon him in expectation it was his turn to impress sally he last looked at her and as he did he laughingly began i shall have no compunctions in being a trifle to schoolmaster the isle of pines mrs garrett lies in a deep bight or bay near the south coast of the western part of cuba there are some six hundred and thirty thousand acres in it and it is but ninety-nine square miles less in extent than our little state of rhode island this island bears a sort of filial relation to cuba it is part of the general chain of the insular mainlands of the antilles it is not a coral key or mangrove swamp it forms a plateau from fifty to one hundred feet above sea level broken by ridges of hills or cliffs that start out over its surface like the bones on the back of a thin cow sally's deferential attention to mr barry's learning was here interrupted by a very audible titter i beg to remonstrate against any levity in my class and i think miss garrett you owe me an apology for attempting to disturb my recital this mock rebuke completed sally's disorder her eyes wet with tears of merriment looked at brigberry who had assumed himself the amusing expression of offended dignity and she murmured excuse me sir with such a delicious mockery of piteous appeal that her father laughed aloud but laycraft maintained his stern reserve with eyes uplifted from the face of his rival 
small as this island is it offers room for two mountain ridges at its northern end which reach the respectable elevation of fifteen hundred feet and are composed of limestones there are other ridges in the island lower and less steep the whole island is surrounded by swamps except towards the south where it is rocky commander beecham says that in the last month strange uplifts have been noticed almost unaccompanied by any serious seismic this last word miss garrett may affect you unpleasantly it means earthquake disturbance and shoals and reefs are now bristling out of the sea like the teeth on a comb and another singular circumstance can be mentioned the island abounds in warm springs curative for your benefit miss garrett i may say that the word means healing for rheumatism and throat affections and these springs are sinking the water seems to recede within the recesses of the earth while in other cases the subterranean channels have either crushed together or have become filled up the springs are simply not there they have vanished the commander has made observations on the coastlines and it seemed to him that they were all rising the cuban coast is rising too he came through havana and the shipways in the harbour have become so shallow that there was a gloomy prospect that the city would be cut off from the sea i only heard all this strange news an hour ago and i fear the excitement caused by meeting miss garrett is to be held responsible for my forgetting to mention it before the allusion was noticed only by laycraft the next voice was that of mr garrett whose face had darkened with apprehension extraordinary it may be that our dispatch is correct it may be that there is a sort of seesaw here that as the west indies rise the central american coast sinks but why not a whisper of such occurrences in the papers the seesaw fancy said laycraft now thoroughly aroused and forgetting his immediate disappointment in the face of a formidable physical phenomenon was mr binns he gave me the feeling that he thought that like an inflated surface where the higher elevation of one part meant the lowering of another part so the access of height in the west indies meant the loss of height in the isthmus and the provocation to any change would be earthquakes as to the papers not publishing anything explained barry there are no newspaper correspondents in the isle of pines and i recall now that beecham told me that the authorities at havana were so frightened over the reports of the harbour masters that they had prohibited their circulation the thing may prove grave enough let us hope said ned garrett that such rumours do not get abroad before to-morrow they are only half-proven assertions based upon some accidental and momentary circumstance in a few days the isle of pines may be the same as it was with the salt springs thrown in and the harbour of havana back again to its old position without so much as a jolt the sea serpent is now advancing towards our shores at the summer resorts why not a few nightmares from the tropics a truce to ghosts let us drink to the president and the canal the glasses were raised their lips before they touched the sparkling glimpse offering as if in silent prayer to the consecration of the beaded wine unuttered hopes for the country's great head and its great enterprise had but felt the amber current flowing from the engraved chalices musical with the tinkling bits of ice when a sharp cry of voices a babble of tumultuous and precipitated outcries smote upon their ears entering the open windows like an execrable assault it was the shouting thrilling with an unusual impetus of omen of the newsboys as if they had forgotten their mercantile relations to the news which whether of joy or grief they commonly announce in the shrill yells of indifference and gloating expectation now their multitudinous voices mingled in a monstrous hoarseness as if constrained by a personal and immediate sorrow and horror even ejaculations from men in the streets buying the papers from the hawkers entered the room and brought pallor to the cheeks of the mute company ned garrett pushed back his chair and sprang to the door followed by brig barry and the rest stayed immobile like a stricken throng waiting the next minute for an impending immolation 
scarcely thirty seconds had elapsed when the two men came back with the papers of the street one having the baltimore times the other holding in his hands the southern herald the faces of both men were pale and on the cheeks of ned garrett shone a trace of tears barry was the first to enter the room and as mr garrett now standing at the head of the table his body half turned towards the door his face suffused with unchecked emotion as mr garrett said well what is it he faltered and dropping the paper to his side he faced the convulsed merchant and was silent it was ned garrett who cried out the isthmus is crumbling to pieces and the canal is doomed the order of events as we hear any sudden stroke of affliction as we suddenly confront the inevitable bereavement as we feel the sharp thrust of calamity penetrate our hearts varies with temperaments and sex but for the most part it reflects the order of events under physical attack the stunned senses and the reaction it is in the reaction that the difference among men most visibly appears slowly mrs garrett arose and left the room and sally after a pause during which she had stolen to the side of brig barry and lifted the paper from his side where it had fallen in his unnerved hands followed her the four men were left behind and of them only laycraft was seated it was laycraft who first spoke this is awful but the nation is far greater than any misfortune that can befall it the other three turned to him with one accord as if saved from their own wretchedness and moved in his direction as if to embrace him it was the right word it brought relief and to one at least as he turned his back to the speaker it brought tears mr garrett the elder looked intensely at laycraft his eyes almost glittering with the sudden joy of consolation and said thank you mr laycraft for that true word it is the one we need you are an englishman and your confidence in us is part of your own anglo-saxon strength and part of your best knowledge that we are nourished by the same blood let us sit down and you brig ned garrett's back was still turned to them read the papers to us the first reports may be much exaggerated some servants had by this time collected in the room at the side of the butler's pantry and waited there irresolute mrs garrett and sally also softly returned and took their places at the table with them as with ned garrett the thought of the president's misery unnerved them barry had spread the paper before him the dark headlines swept across the sheet in ominous relief they read the nation's loss earthquakes and land subsidence engulf the isthmus and the canal the awful cataclysm of nature the president deeply affected the most terrible catastrophe in modern times news from aspinwall of the most appalling character has been received in washington and though an initial effort to conceal or suppress the dispatches was made wiser counsels prevailed and the country will know the worst america must now vindicate her courage and maintain the reputation she justly holds among the nations of the world for self-reliance and self-control a long telegram received at the executive mansion in washington to-day was given to the country by the orders of the president after availing remonstrances from the members of the cabinet who wanted the news withheld until confirmatory dispatches were received it is believed that these were received and that the president ordered the distribution of the news in a word it announces the destruction of the canal and the submergence of the canal zone through a series of progressive changes in the earth's surface at that section accompanied by severe earthquake phenomena the confluent waters of the atlantic and pacific oceans will mingle over the buried structures of the canal and one hundred and fifty millions of dollars representing the labor of three years and nearly fifty thousand men with an enormous accumulation of material will have been spent in vain the nation's credit remains unimpeached and unimpeachable but the moral effects of this stupendous calamity can scarcely be overestimated End of chapter three part two
Chapter Three, Part Three of the Evacuation of England by L. P. Grattacap. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The story in detail. A series of quickly succeeding earthquakes shook the city of Panama on the evening of May twenty seventh. They were slight in character though distinguished by peculiar rotatory effects turning natural objects halfway round and producing curious effects upon pedestrians who became dizzy under their influence these seem to have passed inland and to have accumulated in one severe shock at miraflores just as a number of waves in water chasing each other may combine to form a resultant wave higher than its components and generally if the confluence takes place in the right phase of a height which is the sum of the heights of the smaller elements at any rate a most violent disturbance occurred at the latter place throwing down houses and opening hillsides which was followed by an alarming sinking of the ground the railroad track disappeared part of the canal walls were swallowed up an immense influx of water from la boca poured in and the former side of the village became a lake-like expanse no further shocks were felt although doubtless considerable dislocation farther west had taken place and the locks on the canal beyond the culebra cut in the direction of gamboa sao pablo and tavernilla were perhaps impaired as if the hidden energies of the earth had become reinforced and the subterranean fires had renewed their devastating fury on the morning of the twenty eighth a sharp upheaval of the ground at tavernilla in the old delta plain of the chagres river took place almost immediately succeeded by as rapid a collapse and depression this alarming operation of the ground was repeated upon a titanic scale in the submerged delta plain between Panablanca and gatun it was reported that at first small monticules of rock mud and sand appeared in the vicinity of agua clara but these proved to be ephemeral elevations subsiding foot by foot until with one monstrous convulsion the whole ridge of hills between limon bay to the west on the canal line and barrage at the old french dam slipped bodily into the sea with unutterable sounds the rocks as it were exploding with immeasurable violence the discharge of the mountain mass into the oceanic depths caused terrific tidal waves to rush outward and north and south in colossal walls of water one of these swept upon the panic-stricken inhabitants of colon its solid phalanx suddenly approaching from the sea and in conjunction with earthquakes that had emptied the houses of the horrified occupants bringing them all to the verge of madness from sheer fear the skies as if engaged in some hideous conspiracy of destruction with the moving earth suddenly darkened deluges of water poured from the ebony and swollen clouds lightning in incessant lines of quivering brilliancy shot from their lurid depths and thunders intensified by a thousand reverberations shook the recesses of the trembling hills it was not surprising that the spectators of these monstrous happenings with their earth vanishing beneath their feet the overcharged skies emptying the arsenals of their electric fires upon them and the irresistible floods of the ocean rising like avengers to overwhelm them should have cast reason to the winds and dumb with amazement and insane almost with horror should have sunk upon their knees and waited for the engulfment which was to them part of this preternatural ending of the world few were strong enough to resist the frightful strain and the woods and hills near colon were filled with men and women in all states of frenzy some with cowering limbs and bowed heads awaited the summons of death or the call of judgment while others lost alike to reason and moderation nakedly execrated heaven or stark mad plunged weapons of defence into the bodies of prostrate women 
a few engineers at cologne had hastily constructed a camp on the higher hills towards the north in which they were imitated by engineers at other points these had communicated with the equipment at cologne and it was from the latter city which had at last accounts suffered little else than shocks of varying violence but not destructive that the first news had been sent later advices from aliahuela at an old dam station to the north of gamboa in the hills and on the water tributaries of the chagre news had just been received that the perturbations continue and that the areas about aspinwall Colon, are becoming progressively invaded by the sudden sinking movements and the worst fears are entertained for the permanence of all sections of the canal a telegram received from greytown nicaragua announces the awakening of the volcanoes of costa rica especially poas and irazu steam and smoke are arising from other previously dormant peaks and ashes have fallen in large amounts in the streets of greytown in an interview with mr f c nicholas the well-known industrial prospector of central america that authority says the zone of possible disturbance may extend quite far north and south of the canal strip though in his opinion the more disastrous results may be expected in the mountainous and volcanic chains along the old proposed route of the nicaragua interoceanic canal he has himself felt the tremors of the earth there and here ten or more years ago his ear caught so slight however that it might have been only fancy the faint rumbling of the mountains as if in travail which at the time was interpreted by the guides as a premonition of storm mr nicholas added at the close of his interview that when i left cologne after my visit to nicaragua common report had it that in nicaragua there was a valley of fire surrounded with blazing volcanoes and that i had seen it a good example of spanish-american exaggeration it may indeed now happen that this fanciful picture might in even a more extravagant and dreadful way be realized and the long pent-up forces of the earth slumbering through ages become reawakened with the most disastrous consequences to the whole central american domain through a contagious outbreak of volcanic forces and terrestrial subsidences berry paused and his eye travelled down the page of the paper he stopped and exclaimed they've got wind of the things beecham told me about listen the isle of pines is rising and in the opinion of local authorities the shoals at low water between it and cuba will afford an almost unbroken transit to the greater island the windward passage between cuba and haiti has been invaded by new reefs and the monas passage between san domingo and puerto rico is also reported by sailing vessels recently arriving at havana to present unusual and uncharted features as if the floor of the ocean was also there undergoing elevation these marvellous modifications of the earth's surface seem connected with renewed activity in the volcanic islands of the lesser antilles mount pele is again reported to be in eruption on the island of martinique while la souffre on st vincent is in active eruption and dominica santa lucia and the barbados have been visited by unprecedented tides which have been regarded as evidence of the subsidence of the foundations of the islands themselves we stand aghast before these incomprehensible phenomena our minds recoil before the awful powers of the natural world we stumble in darkness at the meaning of this inscrutable visitation truly we may recall the words of the psalmists then the channels of the waters were seen and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke o lord at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils barry ceased reading he had read all the paper contained he turned mechanically to the sheet ned garrett had laid on the table and glanced over it remarking it is the same and then there was complete silence 
it was leacraft again who helped to restore their composure i think he said that in any event the water connection between the atlantic and the pacific oceans is assured suppose the canal structure as it was supposed to be finally at its completion is all swept away or rendered impossible an obviously easier access from one ocean to another is created if a complete change in the relations of land to water surfaces is now in progress if mr binn's disagreeable predictions are now about to be realized a good many remarkable and not altogether regrettable conditions may supervene the waterway may become a veritable strait providing easy unbroken and capacious connections between the caribbean sea and the pacific ocean the islands of the west indies may slowly converge into one land surface and a new continent invite populations and industries which the wild slothful or decadent peoples of south america with their hot fever-laden and deleterious climates could not encourage or support we may be entering upon a new chapter in the history of the world and in the history of nations who could tell upon what strange threshold we are standing let us wait and see man is subordinate to and the victim of circumstances circumstance also gives him his opportunities what wonders may not the hand of god work in this marvellous reconstruction of land and water and if two hundred millions of dollars as representing the final cost of the canal seems to have been swallowed up what of it a nation whose annual appropriations as i only read yesterday or on the scale of six hundred millions a year should regard with comparative complacence a loss of one-third of that amount when it arises from a permanent and desirable change in physical perhaps human conditions as leacraft was speaking the little group of his auditors remained motionless with it did not escape leacraft's jealous notice sally and brig at its centre in a sort of mutually consoling contact and the servants a little behind in a scrutinizing attitude anxious through a sense of sympathy with the evident distress of the household mr garrett spoke and leacraft rose to his feet we have indeed suffered a harsh blow but it has its afterthoughts of alleviating hope and you have shown us that our alarm is more emotional than substantial the country has been fed upon the proud anticipations of the accomplishment of this canal it has become a political question it has coloured the utterances of our public men it has been the dream of the president as the crowning work of a preeminent list of services to the nation his energy has pushed it to the verge of completion and in its prosecution the nation and the president have become united in positive endorsement it may be all right yet let us hope and pray so flushed with real feeling mr garrett shook the hand of leacraft and in a sort of review the rest imitated his example and left the room leaving ned and leacraft behind it was then that leacraft turned to ned garrett and said i thought i saw an engagement ring on the hand of your sister the statement was a question ned garrett looked at his friend with singular intensity of interest and sympathy he realized the anguish of the man who loving his sister beyond all earthly price forgot a country's peril in the eagerness of his hope that perhaps his heart-breaking fears were unjustified the two men were standing ned garrett took leacraft's hand and placed his other hand upon his shoulder and his earnest face uttered its inviolable commiseration yes burney sally is engaged to mr barry they turned and left the room that night it was not the convulsions of nature breaking down the barriers of two worlds and bringing into action new forces and new vicissitudes among the peoples of the earth that marred the sleep of the restless englishman no it was the face of sally garrett smiling into the bending face of brig barry and touching his lips End of chapter 3, part 3
Chapter Four, Part One of the Evacuation of England by L. P. Grattacap. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gettysburg, May thirtieth, nineteen o nine. The Garrett party reached Gettysburg at midday, May thirtieth, nineteen o nine, having passed through in the train from Baltimore the delightfully rural scenes of Western Maryland and Southern Pennsylvania recent rains had swelled the brooks and expanded the ponds the wide undulations of hills and vales were radiant in verdure responding with the alacrity of new vegetation to the encouragement of the skies that now in a broad arch of fleckless blue seemed to bend over them in pride and emulation a thousand pictures of loveliness of homely domestic bliss of agricultural plenty of bucolic thrift and retirement met their eyes and leocraft himself found a solace to his grieved soul in resting his eyes upon spots of soft and uninjured beauty wherein nature and the gentle craft of pastoral life combined their artless charms to make the landscape serene and inviting to the eye it was almost with regret that they left the train at gettysburg the noise or motion of the cars and the uninterrupted succession of pleasant views from their windows had prevented conversation in which none of them from preoccupation or from anxiety from in one person at least sadness or from in this case to be exact two persons extreme happiness cared to enter and when gettysburg itself was finally encountered they found it in the last spasms of inordinate repletion the most exorbitant greed of guide and hackman guide bookman publican and popcorn or peanut vendor was abashed before a popular consumption that threatened to drive them into a confession of impotency everything that had cubic capacity whether it moved or stood still whether it was a vehicle or a house was aching under the intolerable pressure of its human contents everywhere clouds of flags decorated the air the houses were beribboned and beflagged and innumerable lines crossing the streets in a web of suspensory confusion carried pennants and pictures to the last limits of their carrying capacity and to the bewilderment unutterable and admiration unrepressed of the crowds beneath them these crowds had become almost stagnant because of the crowds in front of them and these in turn by reason of other crowds in front of them until the successional torpor seemed to reach out of sight and presumably ended in some greater peripheral crowd which having attained its appointed place by choice or selection refused to budge to make their way was almost impossible to the visitors whether they besought the services of a driver or tried the painful expedient of threading the human mass on foot in this extremity they simply remained where they were at first arriving hoping either the slow motion of the democratic assemblage would afford them some sort of escape or at some critical moment the vast throng would resolve itself into dispersion and under the influence of direction or force get itself better adjusted to the requirements of its individuals now it was understood by all the published programmes of that day's exercises that the address of the president was to be delivered at that historic spot known as the high water mark which marks the uprushing tide the foaming crest and insurmountable limit of the rebellion which thereafter receded in wavering surges to the south in the great reservation devoted as a monument to the battle which saved the union this spot is central and the acres stretched about it would accommodate an army it was quite inexplicable why this annoying interference and congestion prevailed it turned out to be a military precaution the president was to be installed safely at the speaker's stand escorted by veterans of the north and south before the people should be permitted to assemble around him 
and a cordon of military enclosed the little village keeping confined within it the straining and impatient visitors the village of gettysburg which was used in the great battle as a hospital and which entirely escaped injury in the three days conflict was more than a mile away from the place chosen for the ceremonies of the day when the dam was removed it was seen there would be a dangerous stampede for position music too swept exhilaratingly over the throngs from the distant scene of the festivities and its martial notes awakened to desperation the disappointed and vexed multitude the large numbers twisted and irksomely tied up within the narrow streets and turbulently mixed up on the little square of the village groaned aloud voices suddenly rose high in altercation and abuse a farmer whose rickety wagon laden with his sons and daughters had got packed between a curb and a particularly dense fragment of the crowd made up of vituperative young men and was in almost certain danger of being upset was engaged in a lusty expostulation not unassisted by the quick and sharp lashes of his whip over the heads of the dodging group the latter not averse to some retaliatory measures that might serve the purpose of freeing their general resentment at their imprisonment attacked the irate proprietor of the wagon and pushed his shivering vehicle over spilling its screaming and swearing occupants upon the heads of the bystanders who were utterly unable to escape and added their din to the commotion this diversion attended with laughter shouts and cries of pain had nearly subsided when a new and more alarming disorder arose in the neighbourhood of the garret party who had betaken themselves to the porch of one of the souvenir shops a wandering and aimless dog suffering from kicks and repulses had turned on some of its persecutors and yelping and snapping with inflamed and frightened eyes had suddenly been diagnosed by an inconsiderate observer as mad this information as usually proclaimed in a loud denunciatory tone raised in a second an indescribable hubbub room to run from the bewildered canine was not to be found and the only thing to do for those in the vicinity was to squeeze more violently against their companions leaving a slender and irregular space in which the dog gyrated biting at friend and foe alike the undulous area of movement thus formed swayed to and fro with the distracted struggles of the dog and soon swung violently towards the garrets who became rudely jolted and pressed by frantic men and women in whose legs apprehension of the dog's teeth seemed to have produced extraordinary motions for they shuffled and kicked and scrambled in a way very undignified and ridiculous the upshot of it was to drive a frenzied pack of people towards the souvenir shop in the hope of entering the shop and evading the wretched canine somewhere beneath their skirts and trousers an absurd design as the shop itself was solid with condensed humanity brig barry saw the danger and quickly hustling sally and mrs garrett between the men of his party told all to stand firmly after knitting their arms within each other forming an elastic and impenetrable wall as it was the colliding tides around them sent them on an unexpected orbit of translation and a few minutes later they found themselves pushed towards the trolley tracks not far from the dishevelled and maligned looking local hotel but in a less exposed and stormy quarter and now a marvellous change took place the barriers were down the rolled-up soldiers opened the avenues of approach the president members of his cabinet the commissioners of the reservation and the veterans of the north and the south were in place and the delayed populace released from its confinement with instantaneous expansion hurried over the roads and fields to the station of the high water mark on cemetery ridge it was a picturesque spectacle when the condensation was removed it became apparent in how much splendour the girls and women of the country and the near and distant towns had been arrayed 
they came from harrisburg from emmitsburg along the fatal road that longstreet's rangers had followed from taney town from hagerstown where lee's army had its rendezvous before the battle of seminary ridge from chambersburg which ewell had dragooned from a wrightsville where early was balked by the turning of the susquehanna bridge on the twenty ninth of june from newville from hanover from fairfield the bells and bows had gathered and with them no indifferent number of their fathers and mothers they wore their best ginghams and calicoes and silks the ancient trousseaus refitted and remade still imparted the aspect of richness to their wearers who ensconced beside their furrowed and tanned husbands also refurbished so to speak with store clothes and a rainbow necktie felt the novelty of life return and something of the freshness of the glad morning of existence the girls were most happy and the boys voluble and attentive the caravan of vehicles would have tasked the vocabulary of tattersalls though it was not altogether so remarkable for the variety of its contents as the indefinite suggestion of varied ages in its parts and here and there some time-worn carryall creaking under the infliction of an unusual load and drawn by some rosinante whose feeble gait and frequent halts betokened a sad contemporaneity with the vehicle itself offered a pathetic note in the hurrying splendour of the congregated regalia of the barn and stable and garage the garrets once extricated from their embarrassed position armed with passports one in the hands of brig barry and a special card in the possession of mr garrett as guest of the chamber of commerce of baltimore had little difficulty in securing the essential indulgences for a delightful day in a three-seated coach wagon with a splendid team of horses they bowled along as far as the beginning of hancock avenue which leads from the national cemetery to the round tops here they alighted and surveyed the wondrous scene it was resplendent a sun burning with the soft brilliancy of june bathed the grand distances towards the blue hills in light while the blue hills themselves receded with artistic forbearance behind an atmosphere that veiled them in an evanescent purple and yet seemed to magnify their height the slopes of cemetery ridge were covered by people and the lower levels where the Kodori farm building stood the peach orchard where sickles and longstreet met for the mastery the grain field beyond over whose long stretches pickett's charge was made were filled with moving groups the distant woods the nearer groves the grassy fields little and big round top all were transfigured in the golden blaze and the innumerable monuments that gave the park-like ridge a sort of scenic artifice seemed to become accordant in the vastness of the panorama with its natural and simple features the farmlands the white houses dotting fields or emerging with human interest from lines of shadowing trees the peace of the distant perspective accorded a welcome contrast to the foreground of the picture immersed in the waves of a popular assembly automobiles flying like clouds rushed along the faraway roads bicycles in undulating and streaming lines grew large with rapid approach the gathering spots of people merged together and became irregular squares the squares united and became tracks and the tracks by an incessant accretion coincided along their edges until cemetery ridge the slopes towards little round top and the field below the angle where cushing and armistead died were unbrokenly covered with the vast congregation pulsating ceaselessly by an interior agitation everywhere the heterogeneous assortment of conveyances were halted near the national cemetery and the people made their way to the enclosure where the president was to address them along the triumphal monument enfiladed boulevard of hancock avenue the garrett party had noticed the earnestness and apparent preoccupation of the people 
the news of the previous night had spread its sinister announcements through the papers of the country carried to every village on the myriad fingered currents of the telegraph it had left its impress in the serious sombre and sometimes dully frowned faces of the men i feel sorry for the president said sally the canal seemed almost himself and the people thought of it and him together what will he do the president answered ned garrett will not flinch ever since he went down to the isthmus in nineteen o six and made the dirt fly he has watched the canal with his whole heart in it he knew what it meant for the country for the world and now the speaker hesitated he will know what to say and do how i believe in that man but i can't see continued brigberry that the idea of the canal is lost let us suppose there is a shifting and readjustment down there the two oceans are left behind not much different and if the isthmus breaks down splits up and goes to thunder there's water enough to cover the remains and we have the canal anyway but it isn't our canal any more ejaculated sally it seems said mr garrett as if our grief had been premature there is enough to worry over in this frightful catastrophe and its limits no one to-day can correctly estimate but as briggs says the canal idea is saved or at least it seems reasonable to believe that it may be if nature makes a bigger canal if she changes the face of the earth enough as leacraft told us last night to unite the oceans and make a strait the commercial union of the western and eastern continents is secured on a larger scale perhaps our national pride must suffer some but the fact remains though it would have saved our exchequer a handsome outlay if nature consulting our financial happiness had done her work a little earlier if we'd only waited sighed mrs garrett ruefully they had reached the edges of the throngs who stood in the sun engrossing every coin of vantage and an orderly examining their tickets conducted them through a narrow lane of envious gazers to a stand of seats to the south of the president's rostrum from this position their eyes fell directly upon the amazing outpouring of the people an ocean of individuals hopelessly cancelled from any chance to hear the president's voice yet extending outward in a solemn silence and but furtively invaded by those busy concomitants of such public gatherings button men and popcorn merchants for the most part such annoyances were inordinately thrust aside but scurrying over the most distant outposts of the mammoth audience their eager shapes were seen and inconstantly borne inward by the breeze the shrill invitation of their voices was heard leacraft fixed his eyes upon the president and he was near enough to him to note his expression president roosevelt sat squarely facing the people now crushing in with an irresistible impulse from the distributed masses before him he seemed serious at moments almost solemnly so at others he turned to his companions with alacrity and his face even smiled at some allusion or whispered comment again his eyes wandered dreamily leacraft thought sadly to his notes and then he moved restlessly and leaned forward and even half rose eagerly scanning the expectant faces a jumping up of half a dozen men at the rear of the platform a signal of a waved handkerchief followed and the band stationed somewhere behind the distinguished occupants of the platform began the star-spangled banner everyone not already standing rose heads even uncovered and the spirited strains seized by the concourse were flung back in a torrent of vocality that sounded like the far and near thunder of the ocean's surges it was overwhelming as if before the spirit of the nation the living and the dead those whose discarnate beings might seem rushing in upon them from the viewless depths of space summoned again to the fields of their endeavour by the martial air 
hats were doffed in all directions until scarcely a covered head among the men remained and many eyes streamed with irrepressible tears the note of a requiem the prouder challenge of defiance the lofty questioning of hope the loving clasp of fraternal patriotism the aspirations of a race solving in the foremost files of time the problem of the world's political creed seemed blended together in the avalanche of sound and it was maintained to the end even the verses of the national anthem were well remembered and that trying and unattainable high note like the scream of an eagle which closes the lips of most singers in dubious apathy was now sustained the president sang lustily and then he stopped his head bowed he might have been in prayer it was noticed by all and it almost seemed as if the music quailed and sank before the mystery of a man's outpoured petition to his god it was over the music ceased the frail voice of the chairman sounded its quavering invitation to prayer and a clergyman arose and droned an invocation the president was introduced and stood forward he was well in view one hand grasped the railing before him the other clutched some separated papers he looked well and the man's vitality his zealous unmitigated self-exaction were realized as he was seen the tumult rose to a tremendous climax cheers rolled forward and backward like the fluctuating billows of a sea they receded to the outer margins far toward the haggerstown road where they vanished in murmurs they crashed inward in volleying thunders and the president stood erect nerved to a steel-like rigidity the air was swept with flags the intoxication of the emotion increased women palled before it and men grew pale with the delirium of sudden enthusiasm it seemed as if music alone could lead them back into the resignation of attention it was a stupendous tribute the man to whom it was given had no reason for misgiving no retributive judgments for his actions to dread slowly very slowly the cheering and cries died away and then ensued a silence as remarkable and as impressive the two contrasted states of the multitude might have been interpreted as a generous invitation to the man to speak and as a judicial reservation of mind as to its own verdict when he had spoken it almost seemed so and the quick heart of the president might again have felt the palpitation of a doubt whether he stood approved or critical people withdrew into the refuge of an impartial scrutiny leocraft felt all this and he could not help also feeling a curious interest in the purely psychological enigma it presented end of chapter four part one chapter four part two of the evacuation of england by l p gratacap this librivox recording is in the public domain the president was speaking his voice reached leocraft thin and sharp my friends he began to-day we celebrate again the brave deaths of brave men and the sacrifices they made for the maintenance of our common country and we are gathered together on the battlefield which more than any other battlefield in that historic war represented the culminating energies of both sides the last vital contention for the mastery these men left behind them the inestimable example of fortitude and after the battle of gettysburg it was more difficult for the southern man to continue the fight in the face of disaster with the depleted country behind him and a foe flushed with victory and drawing upon almost illimitable resources than for his northern brother for whom at last the tide of war seemed to have turned we to-day need the lesson of this fortitude of the man in grey my friends a disaster has overtaken us the crowd before the president seemed to compress itself in a further effort to get closer to him 
and it is our duty to remain firm and unfalteringly confident i can scarcely doubt that you have all heard that nature has destroyed the nation's work the face of the earth at the isthmus of panama is altered our work our expenditures the lives of thousands of hard-working men have been sacrificed and we stand aghast before a natural revolution unequalled in our day unparalleled perhaps in all the annals of history something which in its wide devastating power crushes our pride and for a moment makes us cease to think to plan to build i come to you this morning with strange tidings tidings so unspeakably great in their influence upon our knowledge that i almost hesitate to pronounce them lest i might find myself the victim of some horrible and wicked hoax the isthmus of panama from Cibo island in montijo bay on the west to the confines of the valley of the atrato river at the edge of the columbia on the east is deviously here with a regular movement of depression in another place with violent shock sinking beneath the waters of the opposite encroaching oceans that swings backward and forward on either side in awful tidal deluges the latest news confirms all previous reports slowly surely even with hastening steps the narrow neck of panama with its shallow shores its long exposure of swamp and mud-flats with its crumbling hills covered with tropical life will be engulfed and the two continents of north and south america will return to a pristine condition of geographical autonomy it is hard to believe i cannot recount to you the wonderful pictures terror-inspiring and yet majestic with the majesty of nature's awful deeds which have been sent to us the loss of life has been considerable but not proportionate to the stupendous agencies involved after the first earthquake upheavals the quickly succeeding disappearance of the solid ground furnished an adequate warning and the populations along the canal way at the villages and camps and at aspinwall and panama retreated to the hills and with them the animal life in a singular co-partnership of fear it is now regarded as certain that we are about to see the last vestiges of the canal itself the work of these last four years disappearing in the folding in and submergence of the rock strata the president then told the story of the catastrophe as it had been narrated in the dispatches received at the white house he painted in graphic words the shaking down of the hills the dislodged blanket slipping from the hillsides like a shawl from a shuddering woman carrying with them the crashing trees the jungle growth the entwined tenderless creepers and vines while above the trees swaying towards each other and then outward as if following the crests and troughs of hidden waves above these tottering trees the birds in screaming volleys rose and fell the bared rocks showed rents and tremendous explosions sent their shattered fragments into the air while long weird groans issued from the ground as if the buried foundations of the hills were undergoing the tortures of mutilation in other places it had been quite different the ground slowly seemed to melt away and with a sort of shuddering succession of chills the land disappears how long how much further this swallowing up of the land will go no one can tell but it has seemed to those who have some knowledge of the region that it may embrace the s-shaped isthmus only and that the tapering ends of the bulwarks of elevation in the rocky mountain chain on the north and the andes on the south will resist this degradation that costa rica on the north and colombia on the south will rudely define the north and south edges of the new avenue or gateway of unions between the oceans that the new canal in this way reconstructed by the titanic convulsions of nature will become a wide and useful passage for commerce the president indulged the evident curiosity of his popular audience in a scientific discourse his own interest was evident he discussed earthquakes he plunged into an essay on volcanoes he spread luminously before the people the theories of the pear-shaped earth the slipping of faults 
the loading of the earth's crust the original formation of the deep creases in the earth's surface which now held its gathered waters the president made a model expositor he was clear and interesting his style his illustrative similes were attractive and deliberately helpful it was almost amusing to note the contrasted effect of this improvised academic demonstration upon the people and upon the political sages of the platform the former were attentive and absorbed their faces lit up with the quiet pleasure of intelligent appreciation frequently at some pungent expression that pictured to them in stirring forcible photographic phrase the stifling struggle of land and water the fierce unrest far down there in the tropics which was unsettling the foundations of the earth and slowly establishing a new order of things pregnant with revolution in the day and fate of nations carrying in its geological material insensate womb of meaning the dissolution of states the upset and consternation of rulers a menace to civilization the ruthless unwavering threat to human accidents and institutions to all this the political magnates listened with bored indifference they expected a party appeal some appetizing bid for popular suffrage a shot at the south a resounding puff for the republican candidates a political acknowledgment of their personal industry in securing the re-election of himself new projects of expenditure and a program of national expansion they turned and twisted and some deliberately slept or engaged in low conversations with an expressive irony of shrugs and smiles the president paused his hands came together and he leaned far forward and a moment's hesitancy marked the termination of his scientific periods he continued with sudden earnestness and vigour with almost self-surrender to the impetus of his thought my friends these are the facts and no lamentations can change them we must learn from the courage and devotion of the men who left this field defeated to face this new predicament not with resignation simply but with the constructive determination to seize this new turn in events and force it into our service to make it only a more complete realization of our first designs this is the triumph of opportunity thus shall we wrest from the confusion of chance its empire of the fitting moment and drive its scattered impulses into the straight the narrow path of our strictest needs the canal as a commercial necessity cannot be eclipsed or abandoned the original project is replaced replaced by something greater more permanent more cosmopolitan it becomes no longer a provincial fact a national asset simply it is a feature of the earth what exactly has happened how complete is the transformation no one exactly knows but if the assistance of engineering is still to be invoked it can only be in a way of a help to nature the facts remain and now my friends a stranger possibility confronts us nay it lifts up a sinister and awful an ominous portent for the leading nations of the world it seems likely that this physical alteration may mean a change in the climate of the older portion of the earth again the president launched into a scientific lecture and he was fortunate as at first as alertly careful as broadly popular as adroitly technical without obscurity it was well received and its conclusion was altogether wonderful Laycraft had good reason to listen with all his ears the president described the contrasted temperatures of similar latitudes in europe and america how england on the latitude of labrador was warmer than new york which found its adirondack mountains chilled in the depth of winter to almost forty degrees below zero on the same degree as southern france itself the type and synonym of warmth he made it clear how the thermal flood of warm waters upon the shores of europe heating the drifting airs above it till laden with moisture 
they too added their gifts of rain and warmth to great britain and the shores of scandinavia how this gulf stream a wayward impressionable wandering river pushing past florida with a cubic capacity of seven hundred thousand cubic feet of water in half a second of time and held in its fluctuating course by the laws of gravity how this marvellous oceanic flood controlled the material conditions of england's greatness grasped as it were in the filmy fingers of its webbed and spreading tides its wealth its maritime supremacy its intellectual distinction its domestic thrift and sunny sweetness and then the president ended and leacraft bent forward gripped the railing before him with sudden fierceness a knell strangely appalling sounded in his ears a portent widely distracting and unreasonable drove the colour from his cheeks the president ended with these words the gulf stream whipped into violent activity by the southeast trade winds beats impetuously upon the islands of the west indies washes the beaches of central america and whirls its spinning tides within the gulf of mexico and then repulsed by the continuous shorelines of north america returns to europe bearing its mantle of verdure to be thrown over the hills the capes the valleys the western edges and islands of the old world but now the barrier is gone the gulf stream before the strong and rapacious winds is no longer turned aside by impossible walls of land but triumphantly sweeps into the pacific and with it vanishes the glory of england for ourselves it means singular disaster though it may bring compensating changes if england disappears as a world power we are robbed of a friend we have lost a market what words shall measure the moral meaning of the first what revenues express the yearly increasing value of the latter we stand on the threshold of a new era the termination of this remarkable address was its most momentous and unexpected announcement as the president sat down there was no applause just a ripple of clapping hands as a half-hearted recognition of an invariable habit the speech had been utterly robbed of political significance despoiled of rhetorical or personal emphasis it failed entirely as the usual thing in public oratory and it left behind it an oppressive sense of impending changes the president seemed depressed by his own vaticinations and those around him chilled into anxious forebodings sat stiffly silent and unresponsive the moment was saved from intolerable embarrassment by the band the leader stepped forward waved his baton and the solemn strains of america the transplanted hymn of england rose plaintively like a prayer to leacraft it sounded like encouragement like sympathy some one began to sing hats came off the guests rose and the multitude sang if the star-spangled banner had been exultant and triumphant thronged with the memories of achievement and victory america throbbed with supplication and underneath the supplication the fervour of allegiance sacrifice and love the peculiar awkwardness of an unusual and unique predicament was removed the speakers following the president made no allusion to the canal and all the marvellous happenings far away in central america they led the people's thought back again to the soil they stood upon to the memories of a glorious past to the hopes of the future the realization of the present tasks the reiteration of the nation's wealth and happiness its strength under misfortune its illimitable resources they were successful the pall of misgivings which the president had invoked was lifted the band broke out again with reassuring liveliness and good humour and holiday satisfaction revived then came a procession through the reservation to big round top and back again on the lower ground past the devil's den and over the emmetsburg road to gettysburg 
and in the clamorous excitement the parade of uniforms the brilliant atmosphere congratulations and convivial indulgence all the president's words became clouded and unreal and if the isthmus was covered by water if the gulf stream was deflected if it meant blight for england what of it the united states would only become greater its magnification would be unquestioned boundless the stars in their courses worked for them and the mutations of the earth's surface only brought to them unrivalled aptitudes for new chances for new power this was said a good many times by a good many kinds of men and the intangible something it suggested by repetition assumed the force of demonstration there was a distinguishable forgetfulness of the disasters that had come and a listless thought of those that were threatened a few observant and reflecting minds brooded over the strange catastrophe and yielded an attention to their implications this attitude sprang from knowledge and in the case of leocraft from a personal interest in the singular sequence of events which the president portrayed and which even the placidity of an englishman's confidence in his destiny failed to contemplate as injurious fiction it was a thing to be reflected upon at least and added its sombre influence to deepen the gloom of leocraft's disappointment but it also gradually developed for him a remedial efficacy not simply as a spurious employment for his thoughts but through a substantial relevancy to his emotional needs leocraft's mental inclinations carried him towards speculative forecasts he had cultivated his predilections along all sorts of scientific horoscopes and had enjoyed the indulgence of his fancy in studying nations and inventions with a view to composing a plan or description of their future condition phase and expression he had arrived at some curious results but they represented solely the changed surface of society in its industrial civic or social states or else in their more immaterial flights pictured the enduring alterations of religious or philosophic systems in all these speculations he had quite neglected the physical constants of the world its climate and topography his thought engaged itself with the mechanical structure of civilization as affected by new discoveries allied with an increasing utilitarianism in which the individual vanishes before the imperious supervention of the state the incorporated multitude the abstract wisdom of the most knowing minds influenced by a solicitous paternalism for the whole but now he found himself confronted by a new exigency the geological interferences of nature and it piqued his curiosity it assailed his fancy with indubitable fascination by reason of his intellectual proneness to these questions which quite deeply occupied his mind he felt at this moment that the tremendous and supreme chance of his own mighty nation succumbing to the accidents of a tidal caprice might offer him an alternative refuge of interest which would help to dull the pain of his misfortune so convulsing a spectacle as the pitiless war of nature upon the embedded bulwarks of a great commercial nation's prosperity terrified him as a possible historical fact above all it terrified him as a british subject it became so overwhelming in the magnitude of its effects that he shudderingly admitted to himself that his love for sally suffered a relieving diminution as though in such events the end of the world seemed precipitated and all human ties became obliterated were dissolved the day closed in resplendent beauty the sun curtained in a haze shed a diffused glory through the upper sky and sank at last in a grating of narrow bars of cloud that lay across the west like reefs of gold slowly transmuted into a purple nimbus upon the faintly turquoised ether the great crowds dispersed the troops escorted the president away and music from near and far seemed to mingle dreamily with the mute harmonies of the sunset the garrets with mr leacraft and brig berry returned that night by train to baltimore 
the night proved a sleepless and excited one for leacraft he felt ill at ease there was much reason for uneasiness and heartache and the hours passed in a dull series of mournful reflections upon his own trouble and the immodest threat of nature at the prestige of his people the next morning he entered the library and found miss garrett bending over the morning paper she looked up as he appeared in the doorway and there was for both a moment's hesitation before the morning's greeting passed their lips it was sally who spoke first and her voice was eager with alarm mr leacraft the president's lecture surely it was nothing else is all here and there's more news from the isthmus the land is sinking all sinking and she turned to the paper almost all the canal has now disappeared beneath the assault of the waves and a stormy waste of waters sweeps across the isthmus of panama isn't it simply fearful and nothing can be done miss garrett answered leacraft slowly his eyes sadly resting upon her face grown more beautiful he thought by the dwelling of a tender fearfulness in her eyes it is a fearful thing an occurrence such as this is a pretty sharp shock to our sense of security i can't forget the president's words as an englishman i really contemplate coming events with a positive terror but there is something else miss sally i beg to speak about another sorrow for me though i must not permit my selfish regret to cloud your happiness sally garrett came quite close to leacraft she had a true estimate of his strong and dignified nature she yielded the just homage of affectionate regard but her heart had never been moved by the englishman's impressive seriousness leacraft was about to speak again when voices were heard approaching and among them the vigorous intonations of brig barry leacraft stopped and a shadow of suffering crossed his pale face sally understood too clearly she put out her hand and seized his and pressed it kindly and leacraft understood her sympathy brig and ned garrett came into the room and soon the discussion of the strange events taking place at the isthmus occupied the group to which in a few minutes mr and mrs garrett were added leacraft shortened his visit under the pretext of an engagement in new york and it was years after that he again saw miss sally garrett then become mrs brig Berry after the stupendous facts on the following pages had made the kingdom of great britain part of the frozen north end of chapter four part two chapter five part one of the evacuation of england by l p gradicap this librivox recording is in the public domain the eviction of scotland alexander leacraft was standing at a window in the upper story of the caledonia railroad station in edinburgh november twenty eighth nineteen o nine and was gazing with fixed and tormented eyes upon an unusual scene the sky below carlton hill was a leaden grey with the blear dullness of a snow-laden atmosphere and a singular and menacing bar of half-eclipsed red light like a cooling bar of incandescent iron shone with irregular palpitations through the descending sheets of snow it was a strange and appalling picture already a week's precipitation had filled up the deep moat of the prince's street gardens choked up the tracks of the north british railroad and mounded the ragged edges and wandering parapets of the citadel until its outlines were effaced in a colossal accumulation like a titanic snowball and a long incline of spotless snow sloped to st cuthbert's church itself half buried in the powdery blanket the blurred lineaments of calton hill so familiar and so beloved by scotchmen were uncertainly descried the nelson monument the unfinished paris dial the medieval ranges of the penitentiary 
the cheese-box summit of the observatory already the large group of buildings on the pentland hills had disappeared from sight and the classic sombreness of the college facade had laycraft been near at hand he would have seen that the monument to scott the tribute to one fame by the aspiring genius of another dead before fame had quite enrolled him in her categories was deeply buried and that the inclined head of the wizard was quickly vanishing under the piled-up pillows of billowy snow alexander held a field-glass in his hand the window at which he stood was open and the snow blowing in upon it had raised a mound about his feet the observer was however oblivious to this invasion he leaned far out and turned his inspection from point to point with rapid movements and obvious anxiety a curious thing was happening immediately below him and astonished him in the leafless branches of the churchyard trees had gathered a vast concourse of crows and the black feathered congress was being momentarily augmented by new arrivals streaming in from all quarters too evidently dislodged for more natural and habitual resorts their discordant cries seemed a melancholy symbol of doom an awful silence otherwise possessed the athens of the north it was practically a deserted city and its desertion was only part of a widespread calamity which now had begun the shocking chapter of national eviction the usual hum and bustle of the streets had gone the tram cars no longer trundled through its streets and a half-hearted effort to make a path along the centre of prince's street accommodated a few distracted pedestrians and official retainers yet unwilling to join the army of migration which had slowly moved away from a city that the pitiless rigour of a new dispensation in climate had doomed to a wintry burial alexander laycraft himself awaited reluctantly the departure of a train of emergency which was expected to carry away the last remnants of edinburgh's population he had come to the unfortunate city freighted with misgivings when the news reached london itself experiencing peculiar vicissitudes of the terrifying severity and earliness of the winter in scotland he recalled his forebodings which the president's speech had awakened though the later reports of the complete reversal of the gulf stream into the pacific and the accomplished destruction of the central american neck of land had already stirred the scientific minds of england to the utterance of half-hearted warnings the matter had now suddenly loomed up into a frightful reality and the devastating storms sweeping out of the black heart of the north had brought scotland the faroe islands and iceland into a common fate of extinction the sheltering power of the gulf stream was removed from great britain and the frost of the arctic world so long repulsed but now no longer compressed within the arctic circle expanded with instantaneous certainty spreading the shroud of its killing cold over the same latitudes in europe that for ages had slept beneath its spell in america the population in part of the north of scotland had escaped by means of ships to other countries or to southern england many villages isolated houses and remote districts had suffered cruel hardships and the entombed bodies of thousands of families waited for a recovery which perhaps only in ages yet unborn could come to them the white burden of snow mantled the valleys and hillsides of scotland the higher hills of the trossachs and the grampians the defiant crest of goat fells in arran and the twin peaks of the island of the holy mount enormous drifts had risen in white waves almost to the summit of bruce's monument at stirling and the old abbey of cambus kenneth had disappeared ice of great thickness prevailed in the clyde and the movement of the tides had forced it up in threatening hummocks upon the drab stone cottages and villas of grenock and gurrock from aberdeen to leith the cities had been slowly deserted 
after desperate efforts to free them from their entombment the trains going south to england were loaded with the rich contents of mansions and summer castles agonizing scenes had been witnessed at a thousand points where the heartbroken people sadly turned their backs upon all they had and all they loved and knew heroic rescues were as numerous as the occasions demanding courage and inflexible daring had been frequent throughout great britain the trembling soul of the nation shrunk upon itself with a nameless dread as it suddenly found its existence confronted with the inexorable processes of nature when the appalling and relentless squadrons of the ice king with vengeful speed issued in all the fierce panoply of wind and hideous life-killing cold from the last tenements of their abode to slay a prosperous and proud people europe felt a sickening doubt as to the permanence of its life and works and the autumn brought the shrewd and eager fingers of the cold into the streets and houses of hamburg berlin cologne antwerp amsterdam ostend havre and even paris attention to the vaticinations of science was mingled with the prophetic denunciations of religious frenzy pallor marked the features of the rulers of the people and speechless stupor had seized the common people who looked to the skies in pitiful confidence that their misery and desolation would touch the heart of that inscrutable providence who reigning beyond the stars held the reins of the winds and the bit of the frost in his multitudinous omniscience but in england and especially in scotland at the opening of the dreadful winter the precipitation of snow had attained monstrous proportions for four weeks the vault of the skies had been thick with falling clouds of snow leacraft left the window and descended the solitary halls no longer swept by groups of tourists to the street a broken crease in the snow-banks offered him a precarious access to prince's street it appeared almost obliterated in places at others it seemed a narrow slit between threatening walls of snow that almost toppled over it while blinding storms of fine particles hissing over the undulous surface above at times poured into the compressed chasm filling it up many feet in a second of time abandoned cars stalled one behind each other for a block both on princes street and under the castle in the lothian road had become the refuge of the workers and some were made into improvised hospitals and camps a few relics half starved and fainting with fatigue and exposure were being treated with rough consideration in these accidental retreats which buried under snow resembled caves the feeble light of oil lamps and candles yielding a flickering illumination through the dull chill gloom within them leacraft made his way with difficulty to prince's street and groped along the aisle that cut the street in two here he discovered a phalanx of men with sledges and mallets who by dint of passing to and fro without clearing away the snow were compressing it into a sort of solidity that gave a firm footing with the continuous fall of snow and the abrupt windfalls of snow drifting into the cut this path was rapidly rising and was also most irregular in its outlines at some points it rose high enough to permit any one walking on it to see above the adjoining banks of snow one of these elevations was directly opposite hanover street along which formerly ran the cars to the botanic gardens leacraft had reached this spot and stood an instant upon the commanding back of pounded snow looking with amazement upon the silent waste around him the sunken gardens to the south marked by a wide superficial depression with their terraces on either side outlined in shoulders of white to the north up the low hill that culminated in george street he saw the houses on either side buried as high as their second stories in the snow from which their attic stories emerged like titanic gravestones 
the statue of george the fourth had become the centre of a rotating whirl of snow that kept the nether limbs of that potentate from the encroaching crystals but had carved out an inverted cone in the packs around him whose curling edges hung over like cornices about the strangely excavated bowl it was at this point that leacraft's ears caught a distant sound of mingled cries a piteous union of a woman's voice quickly succeeded by the more robust shout of a man the sounds seemed to rise and fall they were at times almost lost in the rising roar of the wind or reduced to ghost-like semblances of sound and again they came with the clearest impact on his ears the shrill scream the longer resonant hello or help it was impossible for him to determine whether the cries were answering each other or whether they indicated a mutual and consentaneous peril he was not alone in their detection a number of figures those of the men engaged in keeping the paths open all sheeted like ghosts with a pellicle of icy snow had slowly gathered about him drawn together by this weird summons a distinct horror possessed them there was somewhere in the immobile and voiceless streets before them at least two perishing lives could they be found could they be extricated from their rising tomb of snow at times the voices grew fainter as if their subjects were surrendering their vitality to cold and exhaustion and then again they sounded in the approaching darkness there were now no lights at night in the doomed city more appealingly clear as if by a despairing struggle of strength they hoped to prolong their fruitless invocation no one spoke leacraft broke the silence we must save them he said it's nigh canny work to do muttered one of the shapes nearest to him but it's a gruesome matter to let them de that why urged a second weel weel they're nigh the first the countryside is as full o' corpses as a crow's gizzard o oats admonished a third leacraft had been listening he felt sure that the sounds proceeded from somewhere on george street a little to the eastward of its intersection with hanover he suspected that the fugitives had taken refuge in st andrew's church he turned to look at the muffled forms about him if two of you will help me with snowshoes we can reach them there was at first no response only a protesting shrug and a disposition to avoid any direct refusal by moving away leacraft spoke again the snow packs easily we can get there on snowshoes in a short time there can be no danger these unfortunate people are imprisoned in the church i think there's a woman there the man needs help to get her out he probably could break his way over here but he can't drag her with him and he won't leave her it's murder to turn our backs on them leacraft was alone save for the presence of the second speaker the rest had disappeared and the thud of their mallets and the rattle of the sledges acquainted him with their distant operations meester i'll gi a hand there's snowshoes down the track in a tram i'll ham here in a jiffy he vanished down the long cut leacraft called after him bring two bottles of whisky you can use my name for them at the hotel while he waited for the man's return leacraft outlined a possible avenue of approach to the imprisoned couple if couple it was he could indistinctly see the day was waning that on the west side of hanover street by reason of the northwesterly direction of the storm the housetops had formed a partial protection to the street below and that the heavy ridged hill of snow occupied the centre of the street lurching over against the west up the short slope this partial shelter continued but in george street beyond the storm drove scurrying blasts of wind that whirled the snow upward in fantastic pirouetting volleys and doubtless with wicked intent had piled the drifts up in insurmountable entrenchments against the doors of the buildings on that street the prospect of progress there was discouraging still there would be ways 
the renewed calls nerved him to desperation the volunteer returned with the snowshoes a pair for both of them and an extra pair for the imprisoned man and the bulging bulk of three bottles of whisky he explained the latter excess they guide me the thraw and i had no heart to hold the ither back let well enough alone i say now my brave friend we must know each other's name though we shall not be separated as we must be tied together but men working in peril become close companions said leocraft to the man well sir it makes some odd difference what name we go by but an you like it just call me jim leocraft opened one of the bottles of whisky and handed it to his companion who eagerly accepted the invitation and took so hearty a draught that leocraft felt some misgivings over his usefulness the man explained it's no drum habit i have sir but the cord a gone to me banes and me wee drap pits fire in me spirit it's bunny stuff it's nay mickle harm to keep the fires burning in a blast like this tech my advice and do the same yourself sir leocraft was indeed not unwilling to follow this example and thus reinforced the two men plunged into the snowbanks that with irregular surfaces of hills and valleys spread before them they floundered desperately forward finding that the snowshoes were indispensable and the precaution of being tied together most helpful the calling voices with intermittent pauses were still heard and both leocraft and his companion exerted themselves to return the calls with reassurance it was evident that they had at least at times been heard for the distant shouts became timed to their own and this indication of recognition served to strengthen and increase their efforts the work was difficult and with recurrent accesses of the storm's fury the snowy wreaths detached from the cornices of the houses or whirled from off the edges of the tumultuous drifts blinded and overwhelmed them fortunately the wind came in gusts and it was this circumstance that permitted leocraft first to hear the voices between the wintry assaults of the wind and the pauses of its fury they stumbled on forcing their way under the shelter of the western houses and at the corner of george street struck boldly out towards the monument where leocraft had discerned the inverted cone of snow the cause of this formation was now apparent and rendered their further progress more precarious the wind surged down george street and by a slight deflection in its course from the axis of the street itself was thrown into a vertical motion at the corners of hanover street and became a cyclone whose towering and fiercely moving walls were materialized to the eye in the successive shells of snow raised in oscillating spires above the tops of the houses where it again was seized by the direct wind and sent in dusky masses skywards the picture of george street at this point was appalling enough the snow lay deeply piled in the street forming a high central ridge and crossing this obliquely were traverse drifts which had a slow motion down the street towards the melville memorial these even at times coalesced assuming the aspect of a big comber at sea and advancing with similar menace when these snow billows flowed into the depression about the statue they filled it and then the revolving winds like a gigantic and invisible auger excavated it again tossing the snow out in spurts resembling the geyser-like bursts in front of a snowplow at such moments it would have been almost impossible to have crossed the spot with the buffeting wind shaking with flagitious fury the folds of snow about the traveller and entombing him also in their rising sheets leocraft and jim had just reached the eastern edge of the hollow described above when one of the travelling billows of snow poured into the pit on its western margin and the impetuous blasts began to dislodge the inrushing tide with incredible velocity the shocks of snow overwhelmed the rescuers and for a moment it seemed as if the contest between them and the fury of nature was too unequal a struggle 
the support of the snowshoes held them fairly well above the snow but this onslaught knocked them down and once down the industrious drifts hastily began their entombment to speak was impossible and all laycraft could do was to jerk the rope which connected them as the summons for jim to reach him his purpose was obvious together one or the other might make such a purchase of his companion as to extricate himself and then assist his friend to rise jim understood the suggestion of the pull and groped his way forward and touched leacraft whom he found prostrate his body offered a flooring for him to rise upon and in this way he regained the surface his head emerging into the blustering air he quickly established himself and hauled laycraft upward who expected the movement and had drawn his knees upward to help him regain his feet the two men were now again upright and in action but terribly exhausted and half immersed in the snow the wave had passed and reformed partially after its disruption while its north and south wings which had escaped the passage of the pit like white breakers moved on before it a simultaneous motion with both which had something almost comic in it and would not have under different circumstances escaped receiving its tribute of merriment brought from the pockets of each the whisky bottles that quickly contributed some of their contents to the renewal of their ebbing strength as they carefully replaced the helpful vials they heard again but now more clearly the renewed shouts of the imprisoned captives and jim putting his hands to his mouth screamed with all the force he could put into the effort coming it carried and something articulate returned which to leocraft sounded like come quick their strength renewed the two men began again their brave combat with the elements and forced their way across the snowfields towards the houses on the north side of george street which furnished a slight shield against the ferocity of the storm a helpful lull in the blast enabled them to make their way more quickly the walls of st andrew's church were near at hand and all doubts as to the position of the voices were removed the calls came very clearly to their ears creeping along the edges of the houses they succeeded in reaching the church and found that on the back of the drifts they were then at the level of its upper windows the men peered into the darkness beyond the panes of glass and knocked vociferously voices and steps answered them the next moment a man's figure could be discerned advancing and then the window opened leacraft entered first followed by jim and both turned to the yet silent figure beside them his silence lasted scarcely an instant god he exclaimed you have come none too soon we should have died here there's a young girl downstairs a friend of mine we started for the train and just in front of the church she fainted i drew her in here as the door was open a chill followed i could not carry her away in this storm and we were caught it was our last chance i can't explain now the reason for our remaining so long behind the rest of the people who had left edinburgh we're here can you get us out i can shift for myself but ethel you see it is impossible what what leacraft interrupted explanations are not needed we must all get out of this at once we must take her between us and fight our way back already he had begun to move towards the flight of stairs near to them to descend to the man's companion when the man seized him by the arm calling to them to follow they descended rapidly and saw on the ground floor of the church lying in a pew with a flickering gas jet burning feebly above it the figure of the woman the man had mentioned she had propped herself on her hand and elbow and gazed at the three faces looking down on her with a frightened still expression in which relief and confidence however were not altogether absent jim had already brought out the whisky bottle and with unpractised directness offered it to the girl here my lady take a sip of this and let it be a good one and gentlemen turning to laycraft and the stranger it's away with the all oh, us or the dill will make our shrouds leocraft turned to the man 
have you snowshoes he asked yes answered the stranger then continued laycrap we will start out of the window upstairs jim you go ahead and i and the gentleman will carry the lady madame to the lady this is a forlorn trip but it will soon be over and i feel we can trust you to help us oh yes came the rapid reply the girl started to rise and her companion helped her quickly to her feet the party was ready and without further words the four ascended the steps made their way to the window and after one glance at the raging weather outside another reassurance for all from the indispensable bottles the plunge was made end of chapter five part one chapter five part two of the evacuation of england by l p gratticap this librivox recording is in the public domain the two fugitives if such was a proper designation for them were well clothed and the risk of exposure was avoided it now was a question of physical endurance only and partly too of some possible leniency in the weather already their previous steps were thickly buried in the flowing tides of snow and leacraft and jim noted with apprehension that the wind seemed fiercer and the way back towards hanover street blacker and more obscure with volleys of snow-dust thrown upward in increasing clouds for a moment the party hesitated and leacraft and jim both seemed overawed and perplexed almost at the same moment they cast their eyes towards the corner of george and st david streets and saw to their wonder and delight that the front of the commercial bank building was relatively clear of snow and the intimation furnished by its appearance was that the way was more open on st david street and that in that direction egress and safety lay this way was the laconic order from leacraft and they turned eastward leacraft and the stranger who had given his name as thompson supported the woman between them and she was directed to throw her arms around their necks and the sense of support to this frail girl whose face terrified and pale from weakness yet had revealed to leacraft a winning prettiness made both men alert and strenuous an obstacle of some seriousness stood before them two heaped-up mounds occupied the centre of the street it was between these mimic hills that they made the fortunate discovery of the comparative freedom of the opposite corner as it was in a measure the interposition of these very barriers that kept it so but the passage the cleft between these mounds that somehow seemed rigid points underwent startling alterations it was filled up with avalanches of snow which at almost regular intervals were driven out by the massive wind pressure and the dislodged bodies of snow were seen to spread out toward the south on the opposite side of the mounds from the observer's position in geyser-like spouts it was necessary to thread this pass but it would be inevitable danger if they were caught in one of the recurrent avalanches sinister as the chance seemed it must be taken and towards this triangular cut they slowly moved jim was in front of the little group which sheeted with snow with bent heads and in silence resembled arctic explorers as they are pictured bringing in some dying or exhausted companion the wind was somewhat behind them though in the collision of the reflected waves from the houses on the south side the vexed air shot about them in a hundred contradictory directions and held them in a tempest of draughts and now they were at the northern slope of the mounds the cut was open it had been cleared a minute before through it they saw more plainly that the bank steps and the corner of st david street presented more favourable conditions a dash and they would effect their escape leacraft had not failed to notice that the intervals between the inexplicable downrushes of snow into the gap were about three minutes and that something more than that time lapsed before their expulsion 
he whispered to thompson whose fatigue was becoming too evident keep up sir once through this hole we're safe during all this time since their entrance through the window of the church leacraft and jem had remained tied together and the strong steady haul of the workmen upon the rope now greatly assisted leacraft who was quite sensible that he must largely depend on his strength at this critical moment for their preservation it was certainly no exaggeration to say that as they entered that rather inconspicuous gateway between two snow drifts in george street edinburgh in november nineteen o nine they stood on that metropolitan thoroughfare in the jaws of death the simile may sound and look shockingly untrue it is the exact truth the white inclines rose on each side of them and the width of the wintry embrasure was about twenty feet in less than a minute even with their lagging steps they would have crossed it suddenly leacraft felt himself pulled sideways only the rope stretched tightly between himself and jim saved him from falling if falling it could be called where they were so immersed in snow thompson had dropped in his tracks and with a low cry of fear the woman's arm slipped from his neck and she clung convulsively to leacraft it was critical in a little more than two minutes they would probably be buried which at this stage of exhaustion meant death leacraft tugged savagely at the rope and the surprised jim almost thrown on his back returned a glance told him everything leacraft without speaking nodded to the motionless figure beginning by reason of the icy chill smiting his face from the snow to stir and seizing the girl passed on jim managed to jerk thompson to his feet and half holding half pushing him hastened lest leacraft should feel his weight on the rope and be hampered in his own struggles it was slow work the snowshoes so essential for their safety could only be painfully shoved forwards beneath the snow it was like wading in deep water but it was a likeness enormously enlarged in difficulty and strain they had not pushed through the miniature defile when symptomatic showers of snow drifted in upon them in blinding columns the avalanche was coming the terror-stricken alpine climber who behind some serac on the lofty glacier has his ears assaulted with the roar of the descending avalanche in no literal sense has greater reason for fear than did those men in the streets of edinburgh at that moment leacraft shouted on 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 one second and we are lost this despairing cry was not ill calculated to spur their efforts the very agony of fright and summoned in the two men behind him gave them the strength of desperation for one instant the spent muscles became steel they floundered forward and fell together almost in one heap beyond the portal of the two mounds as the swirling snow in torrents obliterated their outlines in new envelopes their fall toppled leocraft over on his side the confused objects looking like some assortment of discarded bundles lay quiet the darting cold had brought with it the treacherous drowsiness into their eyes and had already begun to lock the keyholes of their senses it was jim who had roused himself to action he struck leacraft across the face with his gloved hand and did the same to thompson whom he again lifted to his feet the smart of the stinging blow startled leacraft on his legs his nose bled and he could feel the woman still stiffly clinging to him it was jim who now uttered the warning get out of this i hay the lugger all right get down to the bank leacraft looked quickly the bank steps were beneath them and the vagaries of the storm alternately covered and cleared them of snow half rolling he pitched down the slope following jim who had his arm around thompson's waist and who supporting himself on jim's shoulder was manfully helping his rescuer in a few minutes with staggering steps and frequent falls the four gained the protection of the bank this refuge acted favorably their spirits revived and the whisky flasks assisted their attitude toward the storm 
became a little defiant. We can do it now. It's only a step around to Prince's Street. Ethel, how do you feel? It was the young Scotchman who spoke, and the young woman even smiled as she answered, Oh, Ned, we shall be saved. How can we thank this gentleman? Excuse me, blurted out Leacraft. We won't waste time just now in an exchange of civilities. The opportunity for that formality will come when we are all out of this. He stepped almost impatiently to the edge of the building and found that a narrow crevice intervened between the drifts and the walls of the houses, and a further inspection revealed the utterly unexpected good luck that this peculiar chimney way extended along the west side of St. David Street to Prince's Street. Their safety seemed secured. In a few minutes after this welcome discovery, with careful steps, Leacraft insisting upon the Scotchman and himself lifting the young woman together, with Jim leading, the party slowly crept out and along the buildings on St. David Street, and in a short time had reached Prince's Street, where more arms, vigorous legs, and robust bodies helped them through the shooting drifts into the open rift that the men and sledges were still precariously maintaining leacraft hurried thompson and his charge to the hotel he turned to jim and grasped his hand fervently you've been a true man jim i shan't forget this everyone leaves edinburgh to-night by the train i want you in my compartment this young woman and her friends will be with me i'll find you at the hotel before the train leaves watch for me as he spoke and before the expostulation on jim's lips was uttered a long hoarse whistle like a wail came to their ears it was the warning of the trainmen fearful to delay longer their departure from the doomed city and with it hurrying steps shouts and injunctions along the cut indicated its recognition come with me cried leacraft and together the men ran forwards towards the lothian road finding themselves as they advanced in a jostling crowd animated by but one hope escape from the buried capital the condition indicated in the foregoing narrative may now be more explicitly reviewed the dislocations and subsidences in the caribbean and central american areas had developed along constructional lines and had swept away the lesser antilles and the isthmus these formerly elevated points were simply projections upon two orogenic blocks of the earth's crust one extending from south america to puerto rico the other narrower coastal shelf forming the isthmus more plainly these remarkable strips curved in outline and with a varying length of four hundred to five hundred miles maintained a precarious stability with reference to the adjoining edges against which they abutted and when a shock violent enough to rupture or release those edges supervened they fell out and down like a brick or stone from an arch when the more eastern of these blocks that on which the lesser antilles stood dropped the oceanic heated currents of the equatorial belt of the atlantic rushed into the caribbean basin as usual but with a perceptible acceleration the currents did not meet the frictional resistance of an archipelago of small islands their progress westward continued through the almost simultaneously created outlet into the pacific by the submergence of the isthmus upon the first report of president roosevelt's apprehensions that this catastrophe would involve a disastrous diversion of the gulf stream european geographers had contemptuously treated it as impossible and stigmatized it as an amusing futility of envy they dwelt upon this fact that the gulf stream did not invade the bent arm of water forming the eastern water boundary of the isthmus of panama but shot across this somewhat withdrawn angle passing with undiminished volume in a straight path beyond honduras into the capacious pocket of the gulf of mexico let it be conceded began an authoritative refutation in the london times that the structural impediment to the mixture of the waters of the atlantic and pacific existing in the isthmus of panama is removed does mixture follow by no means 
that is in no way subversive of present hydrographic conditions there will be a marginal intermixture of course where there is actual contact but it is presumptuous and opposed to experience to say that two enormous bodies of water will promiscuously exchange their contents through an opening relatively to their volume and extent what a pinhole would be to the juxtaposed masses of two great reservoirs further this disinclination as a physical impossibility of the waters of the two contiguous bodies of practical equal density to diffuse into each other is increased by the strength and velocity of the gulf stream itself which rushes past the isthmus deflection and instead of being turned aside into that narrow aperture would exert a sectorial influence upon the tides of the pacific actually though this is in no way insisted upon reinforcing its own volume and momentum by their contributions there can be no valid reasons for anxiety in regard to the future of the kingdom so far and that is very far indeed as its prosperity and happiness depend upon a continuance of the supply of warm waters from the west the writer of this article in the london times had not realized or had not heard of the elevation of cuba and the emergence of the broken range of keys between cape gracias de dios and jamaica nor had he considered the sectorial influence of the mexican current in the pacific southward on the west coast of mexico and central america upon the atlantic areas nor had he suspected the quantitative effect of a higher barometric pressure in the atlantic over the pressure resident above the surface of the pacific a difference practically amounting to a push upon the surface distensions of the atlantic in the direction of the pacific the very moment a sensible union between them took place and it was a sensible union his comparison of it to a pinhole was utterly misleading above a certain minimum no matter what the size of the major bodies of water were relatively connection between them meant under the circumstances mixture and a hole four hundred miles wide was much above that minimum at the very moment when he penned this astute demonstration the gulf stream had begun to throw its seething waters across the sunken isthmus and the effects followed with startling rapidity the author of the consoling reflections quoted perhaps had hardly had time to have forgotten the obsequious reception his words received when his admiring listeners were brought face to face with the worst consequences he had considered absurdly impossible the summer in great britain had been noticeably colder and with the passage of the autumnal equinox the winds increased in strength and brought with them a terrifying cold all records were broken and the sinking thermometers withdrawing their silver threads into the diminutive bulbs became suddenly the chief subjects of conversation the corridor of the houses of parliament the state-room of windsor the clubs of pall mall and the parlours of the west end no less than the alcoves of london bridge the shops in white friars or the auction stalls of the ghetto buzzed with the endless comparison of observations made on these hitherto unnoticed instruments of precision and their slightest variations took precedence in the daily prints over the aphorisms of the prime minister or the nullities of the king an enormously increased sale of thermometers accompanied the sinister records of the deepening cold importations of them from the united states spread an unprecedented wonder throughout the world as to the meaning of this change in climate and the range of temperature as the season advanced was as much an object of solicitude as the growing expenditures of london and more talked about than the fancied rupture between spain and france meteorological journals were besieged with subscribers abbey loomis ferrell were as much in demand at the bookstores as glaciers or thompson 
flammarion was as popular as tyndall and the lectures delivered at the british museum had such suffocating success that the red cross societies of london conceived the idea of public instructions for tuppany to replenish their forgotten treasuries the pedestrian and the chance acquaintance of the tramway would interview each other on the prevalent topic of alarm and quote wells and boussingault and daniel and quetelet and forbes helmerson camps and kupfer with more unction and accuracy than he did the current prices of wool or barley the fright began in the north in scotland news first arrived from the hebrides of desolating cold and overwhelming snowstorms then the story was picked up by the shetlands and aberdeen and then the really tragic fate of iceland was recounted the cable between scotland and iceland completed in nineteen o six brought the tale and a freezing tale it was iceland had become a snow heap its interior valleys were filled up from hecla to skalbreed from Scalbreed to Estia, one portentous blanket of snow had leveled all inequities of the surface. The terror-stricken inhabitants deserted their farms and fought their way to Reykjavik, leaving all they possessed of sheep, cattle, and horses to be destroyed by the pitiless tooth of the Ice King. Reykjavik had been deserted, its people fleeing to ships and steamers as the remorseless winds piled up the white shrouds of its arctic burial the cable summoned assistance for those yet fighting for life on the water's edge where the sea air helped them to maintain a margin of cleared ground over ten feet had accumulated and ceaseless blizzards unchecked and even increasing in fury with the tireless and killing cold had renewed the ice age within that boreal republic the panic spread from confidence and scorn the people of scotland and england and ireland plunged into the clamour of despair and maniacal forebodings religious fraternities of frigidists were organized whose exegesis made the prophecy of the end of the world a menace of destruction by ice geikie's ice age and kroll's climate and time were read by earl and bellboy and in the midst of the general consternation the publishers of these books in cheap form doubled their business capacity and their fortunes then came the sudden visitation of edinburgh with the scenes just recounted the transference of these immense swarms of people the evicted tenants of the north poor creatures who had never owned the land they lived on except by the sufferance of some landlord duke or gentleman southward was a task of difficulty sir john c was provost marshal of the city at the time his father before him had held the same office and had devised a scheme of goodly proportions and efficacy he appointed wardens who with assistants selected by themselves visited the families in the several bailiwicks in edinburgh and prepared them for the departure and who also apportioned to the different wards of the town the streaming populations from all the neighbouring villages towns and countrysides the railroads were seized by the government and systematic transportation begun and carried on night and day they were taken to the larger seaports of england and of course to london already secret misgivings that chilled the marrow of their bones and made the blood circling in their hearts freeze with horror were entertained by public men that perchance this was not all nor indeed the worst was the power of the kingdom of great britain to be made the jest of the snowflake and the icicle the thought made reason totter but new gleams of anticipation seemed suddenly to place upon that very thought the consecration of joy they should be driven from their hearthstone to bring the english culture in other english lands and emancipated men men of the new type like h g wells said that that culture torn from the swaddling bands of conventional tradition the silly materialism of forms and dresses of titles and classes of imperialistic gewgaws 
and the impediments of habit would expand into a modern civilization which carrying forward all the strains of strength and imaginative and ideal aims it had before might incorporate in them the new procreative life of a liberal social state well there was some consolation in that but a consolation robbed of much positive consistency when all around them they saw the loss of trade the paralysis of hope the desertion of homes and the rising threats of that inexorable and deaf deity nature End of chapter 5 part 2chapter five part three of the evacuation of england by l p gratacap this librivox recording is in the public domain leacraft had watched and waited every new development each changing report the wearily studied logs of the ships and steamers the daily averages of temperature and rainfall the swelling disorder in the climate of the united states and confirmed rumours of the hot current which might be the gulf stream pouring pouring northward and hugging the shores of california and washington and oregon and even repelling the cold from alaska supplying a stove to its shores which it was promptly surmised would make of it a northern paradise all in a cumulative way pointed to one result the evacuation of england his speculative mind hurried on to the picturing of the changed aspects of the national life and he felt that for once science embedded in the laws of nature was about to put to flight the mentality of men and pour the vials of its confusion over the proud the boasting defiance of their thin optimism and yet what might not opportunity perform perhaps the old receptacles of civilization needed emptying their garnered seeds to be more quickly cast upon the winds of chance to germinate and flower again in the waste places of the world and leacraft hurried to and fro a small inherited competency had dissolved his business bonds a lonely sad man excited by the thoughts of the world's trembling position on a new threshold of events and thus forgetting the gnawing pains of his own disappointment during september he had been at the far north of scotland and retreated day by day with the invading cold fleeing with its fleeing people southward on the memorable evening whose events have been rehearsed he had found edinburgh practically voided and left to its entombment the work of getting the people away of convincing the incredulous of providing for the needy of deporting the treasures of this great depository had been hastily and imperfectly done in spite of sir john c s useful plans it could not be different disorder recriminations riot and clashes were inevitable at a moment of such sudden penetrating terror blocks after blocks of private homes remained with little or nothing of their rich contents removed this condition was understood and predatory bands of desperate men broke into them encamped in them and defied expulsion they laughed at warnings and after filling their improvised camps with coal and stores prepared with exultation to enjoy this novel debauch furniture and household effects had been dumped or deserted in the streets and almost any extemporaneous digging in the drifts would uncover books clothing and utensils a grotesque hogarthian aspect had been produced by the retreat of the cats to the houses and their mingled swarms at windows and on sills whether they were strangely followed by hordes of mice and rats expelled from the country and filtering into the city in scampering lines before the weather had reached the height of its tempestuous inclemency the documentary archives of the city had been locked up in great safes and left for more propitious days in summer this example had been imitated in thousands of the better class houses as the professional the official opinion still hesitated to contemplate the monstrous alternative of a permanent sepulture of their beautiful home <laughs> 
one thing had been accomplished and it was well done the people those who would leave had been gotten away when on the tenth of september the first storm of snow began and the mercury sunk to a few degrees below zero fahrenheit the suffering became intense soon the railroads were blocked enlightened opinion had received its instructions the return of scotland to the bondage of snow and ice was published and the publications carried conviction to a great many the loss of the gulf stream was at length acknowledged the impetus of the discovery made the worst prophecies credible the intensity of this acquiescence was astounding it became a matter of faith that the population should vacate their own city and they obeyed instructions unanimously with a touching self-surrender to fate great numbers left laith by boats and steamers summoned from london the railroads responded with promptitude though by reason of a sudden access of energy in the government nothing less would have been tolerated longer than was necessary to confiscate their property and franchises the phenomenal desertion of the city by three hundred thousand souls seemed as foreordained as obligatory in the regime of events as the setting of the sun or the return of the seasons but no activity of all the available means of transportation would have sufficed to take a population of more than three hundred thousand men and women in less than two months away from the city unless it had been supplemented by other means and a strange and most effective movement accomplished completely what more recondite or artificial methods would have failed to secure the frigidists the group of fanatical preachers and their followers who found in the present calamity an opportunity for religious propaganda or through the fermentation and clouded expectations of their own zeal believed it to be the expression of a supernatural agency had begun a street crusade always in edinburgh popular and familiar to accomplish the removal of the people these singular fanatics served a most benevolent end and their strange hallucinations wisely aided the anxious efforts of the authorities they arrayed themselves in white and went bareheaded through the streets of the city exhorting all who would listen to accept their interpretations of the approaching judgment they wove their texts of prophecy with denunciations of sin and with the crowding evidences of some astounding climactic change repeated with accelerated eagerness in paper pulpit and forum they acquired a tyrannous control over the emotions of the populace then they quickly and with excellent discernment organized the people into small regiments distributed to them white cockades and white rosettes and marched them out of the city southward over the frozen and snow-lined roads this evacuation began scarcely soon enough for the best results but it gave relief these moving companies accompanied with vans and horse carts and vehicles of every description gathering numbers along their way grew in picturesque confusion as flocks of sheep and herds of cattle were united to them or the miners from the coal pits and the artisans from the factories joined in the vast singing army like the inexorable morality of the french mobs in the french revolution who scornfully resisted the temptations of their own hunger in a fierce zeal to protect private property so an overmastering enthusiasm permeated those rough scottish nomads and they marched through the country rigorously just and honest there was suffering and death among them and nothing could have been more sublimely pathetic than the improvised services of burial that were held from time to time along the roads they crossed those who heard its vibrant and powerful melody will remember the eclipsing magnificence of the hymn sung to the air of odestes fidelis which began with the words firm faithful and tried with endless glory crowned the success of these frigidists was phenomenal but it also clearly arose from the awful portents of change which made the stoutest men quail and not inaptly tested the scepticism of the boldest scoffers 
the revolution in nature had not only affected scotland its dire effects were felt in the whole of the scandinavian area and the more southern parts of europe which had owed some measure of their favourable winters to the direct or intermediate influence of the gulf stream were now made to feel their sudden penury in its removal a frightful stagnation invaded the european markets a panic of doubt spread confusion everywhere and those who controlled the sources of money very soon checked its use in the avenues of trade while of necessity speculation and the desire for speculation simultaneously vanished it was the last train intending to leave edinburgh that on november twenty eighth waited for the provost marshal and the little army of workers and which leacraft also expected to take the tracks southward had been patrolled by trains of cars or locomotives for every five miles and these had kept the way cleared while they reinforced each other at critical junctures when this last connection between the muffled city and the south should be broken then practically scotland returned over the sweep of sixty thousand years to a geological phase resembling that which geike scotland's own great historian of nature had described in these words all northern europe and northern america disappeared beneath a thick crust of ice and snow and the glaciers of such regions as switzerland assumed gigantic proportions this great sheet of land ice levelled up the valleys of britain and stretched across our mountains and hills down to the low latitudes of england being only one connected or confluent series of mighty glaciers the ice crept ever downwards and onwards from the mountains following the direction of the principal valleys and pushing far out to sea where it terminated at last in deep water many miles away from what now forms the coastline of our country this sea of ice was of such extent that the glaciers of scandinavia coalesced with those of scotland upon what is now the floor of the shallow north sea while a mighty stream of ice flowing outwards from the western seaboard obliterated the hebrides and sent its icebergs adrift in the deep waters of the atlantic end of chapter five part three chapter six part one of the evacuation of england by l p gratacap this librivox recording is in the public domain the terror of it leacraft and jim reached the hotel at the caledonian station in a crowd of breathless men all anxious to escape to more reassuring neighbourhoods thompson and the young lady so opportunely rescued had availed themselves of the restorative resources of the hotel and had largely recovered from the exposure and scare of their experience leacraft met sir john c standing at the entrance of the hotel his face clouded with grief and anxiety strained to the last limit of endurance by his unwearied exertion to secure the safety of the people and almost prostrated by the desolating sorrow of deserting the great city the distinguished publisher expressed in his looks his intense misery of mind leacraft expressed a few words of condolence which were hardly noticed and then hurried to the former writing-room of the hotel where he found a fire burning and a hastily prepared luncheon around which a dense crowd of men were collected filling the room almost to suffocation greedily devouring the welcome repast and muttering doubts of their eventually escaping at all if they remained any longer sir john hates to get away commented one he just can't make up his mind to go his heart is broke but what's the use we can't stay here and be buried alive the trainmen say it's a hard job now to get through and all the way to glenarkin is full of big drifts i say we must shake this and it's nobody's right to run our heads into danger for the whim of a little love for the old town sure we are all hard enough up and it's we that has not got a roof to our heads nor a bite to our stomachs that has the worst to fear it's a cruel suffering to think of it at all but so it is and it's no use fashing 
weel weel said another it's an awful plight and naebody can say what's next we maun better be dead than to pit our heads in a pother of snaw and wait for next summer to melt us out simmer man is it exclaimed a rough cartman with a huge ham sandwich in each hand and his jaws working on the remnants of their predecessor simmer it's all up with the simmers frying out to the end of the world it's bonnie scotland good-bye and mind you man you'll never see gores again on the queen's drive i'm thinking and you'll never take your bonnet off on arthur's seat nor pluck the daisy on holy rude mead you'll never canter to the pentlands nor hear the sang of praise go up fry the losland chapel and you'll nigh hear the bell toll fray greyfriars kirk nor mark time with the highlanders and st giles and you'll never bide the chance when you can see old hay's shop in high street nor watch the midland stare their e'en out at john knox's aim it's o'er by now and the good fellow turned away in a choking effort to repress his own tears and swallow the generous morsels he had bitten from his overloaded hands leacraft pressed by these disturbed groups and found after he had inducted jim to the hospitalities of the various tables his own strength and composure deserting him he sank into a chair and covered his face with his hands it seemed as if he had lived through some dreadful nightmare and the weird and sickening sense of yet more miseries rising thick and fast covering with gloom a nation's happiness stunned him a soft voice awoke him he looked up hastily and saw the lady whose arms half an hour before had clung unresistingly around his neck she was unquestionably very pretty and the returning flush upon her cheeks gave the alabaster's clearness of her brow a singular effrontery of beauty elsewhere or under different circumstances it would have produced in leacraft a momentary suspicion of artifice as it was it held his attention long enough for him to notice that the hair covering her head luxuriantly was a raven black and was gathered beneath the hood of a soft brown sealskin fur which clothed her form while two wonderful opal bracelets relieved with ruby jewels in alternating links most incongruously graced her wrists the gloves on her fingers were evidently distended by rings and a superb necklace of diamonds and peridots circled closely her neck seen through the half-opened cape leacraft rose mechanically to his feet still conscious of effort and looked wonderingly at the young face and at that of her companion mr thompson the scotchman my cousin and i the voice was exquisitely gentle and expressive can never repay you it is a slight thing to say to you how much we thank you but it is not impossible that we can both yet show you our gratitude in some manner that will mean more than words mean as much for you as your sacrifice meant for us is not that so ned she turned to mr thompson who advanced and accosted leacraft with courteous alacrity i am sure sir you appreciate our sense of devotion to yourself you extricated my cousin and myself from a certain and dangerous imprisonment it might have been something more dreadful and perhaps with a reluctant gaze at the young woman and a smile of understanding for leacraft you may wish to understand better how the perilous predicament you found us in occurred it was very simple this lady miss ethel tobit leacraft bowed was left with myself her cousin at the home of her father and mother on pitt street to complete the packing of a quantity of valuables which were at the last moment to be placed in a safe and left there for recovery later it does now seem as if that word was a poor mask for never we had brought food for the house and felt no fears of escaping before the streets became impassable then this last storm broke and this afternoon late in the day we started out but we had waited too long my cousin sank under the exertion i was disabled by a fall in which my side was seriously bruised we took refuge in st andrew's church whose doors stood providently unclosed though to swing them out i had to dig with my hands a crevice for their movement in the rising snowbanks forcing them constantly back our vigil began the city in all directions around us was deserted we could hear the workers on princes street occasionally in the lulls of the hurricane 
and the whistle from the station sent thrills of anguish through us as we felt we should soon be alone in an empty city it was as impossible for us in our crippled state to return to the house in pitt street as to reach prince's street we then began calling and it was you sir who responded i think hunger and thirst would have made it impossible even in the day for us to have left our retreat and only the don't ned cried the quivering girl don't don't it's too awful to think of we need all our best spirits as it is but to think oh it's too horrible and she hid her face against her cousin's breast and broke into sobs laycraft felt the embarrassment and was ill at ease though somehow at that mournful moment the sight of a beautiful woman seemed a compensation and in this case as she lifted her tearful face to laycraft piteously struggling to smile it awoke in him a kind of ardour to always be near her he looked almost tenderly at her and said i think i have every reason to thank my good fortune and this remarkable weather for a very pleasant adventure well no he continued as he caught the reproachful and grieving glance of miss tobit that is too cynical heaven knows we are all broken-hearted enough to-night to relinquish any false gaiety or even the appearance of it but certainly miss tobit i hope this chance acquaintance will establish a friendship between us it will be the only compensation for this night of agony and perhaps for all the other nights of agony that still await us you will not refuse it miss tobin turned instinctively to her friend and leacraft betrayed into an earnestness perhaps somewhat out of place had a fleeting glance of an evanescent smile and then the words even more sweetly spoken than at first came to his ears it would be all your own fault if we fail to be friends i am sure i can keep my side of the contract mr thompson watched this brief exchange of promises not altogether with approval if the faintly forming frown on his face meant anything and the evident inclination to take miss tobit away from laycraft's proximity but he was entirely courteous and with a half-whispered comment that it would not do now to tire their benefactor any more he moved off and drew the lady with him and then the summons came from the other end of the room that all was in readiness that sir john was on the train and that the attempt to reach the south was to be made there was much confusion and some indecent precipitation to gain the door and in the rush leacraft lost sight of his newly made friends but found to his great satisfaction jim at his side for jim had turned out to be that sort of a fellow that meets predicaments with coolness and quietly without words instils confidence leacraft was a little nettled over his seriousness with miss tobit because it revealed again to himself that prosaic stiffness of language which he consciously recognized as having formed an element of failure with miss garrett whose plastic wit found in it a source of amusement he walked towards the door wondering bitterly why women placed so much value on a turn of speech or the accent of a compliment when his musing discontent was interrupted by a hand laid on his arm he turned around and saw a member of the common council of the city associated with sir john c in the last days of the city's government the stranger accosted him mr leacraft the provost marshal wishes you to share his compartment he has a great desire to speak with you on the affairs of the city and the dreadful things which seem to be before us this way sir and he motioned to a large parlour coach in the centre of the train leacraft retained him placing his hand on jim's shoulder he said this man goes with me the councilman for a moment looked puzzled but almost instantly rejoined certainly sir your personal attendants are welcome leacraft laughed and exclaimed no sir this is no personal attendant of mine this is only a brave man whom i am proud to call my friend and as he turned to jim the latter gave him a glance of the sincerest gratitude and pride the councilman waived the privilege of questions and nodding vigorously his assent led leacraft and jim to the car of sir john it was a car of an american type 
and comfortably provided with couches and seats tables and easy chairs a number of men were already in it and some refreshments with the circulation of bottles of irish whisky showed laycraft the unappeasable claims of man's appetite even in the ruins of his own fortune sir john occupied a chair at a round table in a further corner of the compartment and as laycraft made his way towards him the eyes of the city's chief gazed at him in return with inexpressible weariness and sadness laycraft motioned jim to a seat and took the proffered hand of sir john who let his arm fall heavily on the table and still kept his eyes fixed on laycraft motionless and silent it was laycraft who first spoke i think sir john that it was a few years ago that i secured your intervention for a poor fellow who was condemned off-hand and you were willing to help me turn the law back in its course that it might have an opportunity to find out what it was made for murder or justice yes i do recall it and mr laycraft do you know replied sir john that that day seems unmercifully far away it seems as if you and i lived then in another world and as if we perhaps had died and were living in a quite different one now and one very much worse however bad the old one was i am too dazed with all this i feel as if i must wake up and find it all a horrible nightmare but there can be no excuse for self-deception with me i have studied this question i am one of the most convinced that scotland is doomed yes and the speaker straightened himself with a movement of exhaustion that england is doomed too that we are about to see primal conditions returning which are normal physiographic states but which will destroy our civilization listen and as laycraft sank into a chair near him he leaned again upon the table and spoke with a sort of eager impatience at his own logic as if he invited and expected and hoped for contradiction listen the isothermals as they existed before this calamity were a travesty on the map they were an outrage upon meteorological symmetry see here and sir john drew out a portfolio which he opened on the table before him he opened it and displayed a mercator projection of the world he was about to continue when a shout which had mingled with it a throb of grief like a loud wail entered their ears laycraft noticed at the moment that the train was moving it had been moving for some time he looked out of the compartment window relieving edinburgh his voice sank to a sympathetic whisper as sir c suddenly turned to gaze too along with all the rest upon the shrouded city the snow was falling from a leaden sky and the mantled city with its higher buildings here a spire there a monument like an irregular mound hiding a burial was indistinctly very partially seen the men and one woman the scotch girl saved that afternoon from the tomb of snow were standing in the coaches leaning out of the opened windows to fathom the dull mottling obscurity of the air to catch to be forever remembered some recognized feature of the great beautiful habitation now left in the oncoming night-time to be buried in the whirling wreaths hidden between its hills imperishable but unseen and waiting for its resurrection again into the joy of life and usefulness a dead city save for those brigands who like wolves or ghouls dared death to fatten on abandoned riches amid its solemn terrifying loneliness strange vicissitude and as laycraft decried in a blurred exaggeration of its natural size the dome of st george's church opposite the albert memorial a voice somewhere among the tearful and dumb gazers repeated this verse from burns's invocation to the honoured and historic site with awe-struck thought and pitying tears i view that noble stately dome where scotia's kings of other years famed heroes had their royal home alas how changed the times to come their royal name low in the dust their hapless race wild wandering rome though rigid law cries out twas just
though the train made a toilsome way and interrupted progress with steam sweepers ahead of it the city soon faded away the eye could not long pierce that forest of descending veils of snow the sepulchre would soon be accomplished and the spectators shuddered at the thought of those voluntarily immured and hapless wretches who had seized this chance for a few hours reckless pleasure and then their own death murdered by each other's hand in the furious combat for survival or choked with the many fingers of the frost at their necks and laycraft remained at the window still looking while sir john patiently waited staring at his map or raising his eyes expectantly to laycraft to resume his attention a bitter thought passed through laycraft's mind edinburgh had been faithless dressed in beauty rich in reputation nurtured in elegance and culture she had been wickedly selfish her streets were filled with embruted men and women with the vassals of drink and depravity her picturesque quarters hid misery and vulgar need unsanitary and simply mean corners of wretchedness filled with creatures to whom life was an uneasy mixture of sleep and drunkenness she had done nothing for these her life was part of the life of the whole kingdom and the word of that life was selfishness the stupid adhesion to conventional usage which kept the land from the people which loaded taxes and rents upon a slaving many for the perpetuation of an indulgent and luxurious life to the few the upper surfaces of society brilliant and dazzlingly sleek with pride and puffed up with the vanity of knowledge cushioned upon a contemptuous forgetfulness of duty of sympathy conceitedly viewing their reflections in burke's peerage or chalmers landed gentry begrudging every concession to modern sense of justice denying the equality of men fostering the silly homage of their inferiors and rankly gathering around the idiocy of a futile monarchy it was a class life a class gospel a class cultus the arrogance of a classification of the humans of society which made the joy of the world the prerogative of those who by birth or fortune found themselves foreordained to possess it and who now god willing would fight every inch of their vantage ground to keep that advantage believing that a fine suavity of demeanour a generous support of fashion a supercilious deference to education as an aristocratic embellishment a pretentious clemency of judgment and an unfailing church attendance would save them before any supernatural tribunal if indeed such a tribunal existed of particular blame those among them yet endowed with the pulses of human feeling gentle in spirit and blessed with the better sentimentalities of religion visited the poor and dropped lunch baskets at their doors and assumed the fine benison of stooping angels a shallow thoughtlessness which did nothing for the regeneration of permanent social outrages the unemployed might clamour the poor might continue to multiply and the young and ambitious might sail away on white wings to the new life of america but the lord and landlord must still remain because in the sight of the lord god almighty the lord and the landlord are part and parcel of the eternal order of things an appanage of his eternal throne and a reflection of the rule of heaven and beneath all this was the sickly obsequiousness and snuffling adoration of ordinary men which of course the lord and ladies despised but which after all was helpful in keeping up the distinguished humbug end of chapter six part one Chapter Six, Part Two of the Evacuation of England by L. P. Gratacap. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. This on its best side, but there was a worse side. There was moral depravity. There was ruthless wickedness. There was a set so smart that they defied decency and rectitude and travelled on the currents of their passions to all the maelstroms of moral rottenness the king himself had violated the measures of sobriety and faithfulness 
and this imposing and historical structure must now totter to its fall before the drifting snowflake truly the simple shall confound the wise leocraft turned from his melancholy thoughts to the friendly face of sir john who catching his eye resumed his conversation this map will make it quite plain that the position of our nation as a commercial as a political fabric is a geographical absurdity a necessary paradox look and sir john pinned down the map on the table and drew leocraft down towards its attentive examination here is an ocular demonstration of our false position a charted proof that we are in a wrong place a spot of possible change that will reverse all previous experiences if the right conditions supervene the change has come and scotland returns to its appointed allegiance it belongs to the kings of the ice see and he leaned over the map in a kind of ecstasy of despair speaking rapidly as his fingers traced the lines he indicated see consider these enormities land's end and the silly islands where palms grow are on the degree of fifty degree north latitude which is the same as notre dame bay in newfoundland the same as manitoba the same as the most northern Kurile islands do you know what the temperature of these places are i will tell you the average winter temperature of northern newfoundland is ten degrees that of manitoba nine degrees and that of the curile islands twelve degrees the average temperature of land's end is forty degrees well that may not strike you as a contrast so sharp as to warrant my dire prediction but you must learn to see an average temperatures much more than is simply indicated in the mere differences in degrees averages are utterly misleading so far as they mean habitable conditions a temperature of zero for six months and a temperature of eighty degrees for the remaining six months furnishes the harmless average of forty degrees but a land suffering from the affliction of a climate such as that would be useless for the larger purposes of a civilized community averages produce an impression of uniformity whereas they conceal the most obstreperous changes and a small difference such as you observe between the temperature of the silly islands and these inclement and impossible districts of canada or kamchatka means that though all are on the same latitude they are as diversely adapted for modern life as the tropics and the north pole why are the silly islands adapted for tulips and spring peas when manitoba yet sleeps in snow from the point of view of a primary instruction in temperature hottest at the equator coldest at the pole and graded all the way in between it is a preposterous caprice it is a caprice and a civilization flourishing under the auspices of a caprice will come to grief climate is a symbol of vagaries contradictions and sudden affinities it is the atmospheric expression for the feminine and the poetic in men as a matter of fact contingencies of interfering land surfaces of changing barometric pressure of ocean tides of air currents of solar radiation combine into a labyrinth of possibilities to make places that ought to be hot cold and vice versa but they are evanescent possibilities and the founders of empires who rely on them will some day be brought back with stunning abject terror as we now are to the realization of first principles that latitudes are invincible barriers to the diffusion of the race and that the nations neglecting their plain meaning court disaster well you know the explanations of all these whims of nature the old story the gulf stream with its millions of units of heat forced northward by wind pressure and accelerated eastward by the equatorial velocity it starts out with our insular position bathed in oceanic waters holding immense deposits of the sun's heat the open seas north of us the great furnace stores of heat in africa like a nearby factory heating our thin coasts that is common knowledge but these accidents of position these migratory tides are holding in check invincible tendencies like a child's push against an evenly balanced boulder they keep off the descent of disaster but like another child's push in the opposite direction 
a sudden alteration of coastlines reduces our boasted exemption to a shadow and london edinburgh liverpool glasgow paris amsterdam berlin hamburg the great cities of the world pay at last the penalty of an infringement of nature's common law heat is life and cold is death and no blank optimism may hope for national achievement in the frosts of winter our civilization the civilization of northern europe has overstepped the limits of climatic permission as this globe is made we are the victims of a deception primary conditions of temperature are returning a meteorological hoax is exploded and fifty degrees north latitude will mean in europe what it has always meant elsewhere but look at edinburgh look at these isothermals on the map attributing to her the temperature of far southern latitudes too obvious an absurdity to last true enough yes but fugitive an episode only so flat a contradiction of the economy of this round earth should never have misled us and we have had warnings mr c stopped his agitation fairly choked him leacraft sympathized with the gentleman's distress his bitterness of heart had created a mental hallucination an unbalanced affectation of epigram leacraft interposed well sir john the empire of great britain has no reason to regret its existence even if it is based on a climatic fallacy there have been some things done in it which no change in temperature will obliterate unless the ice age is returning and we all decline into extinction north and south and the earth is again without form and void you speak of caprices how can you tell this is not a caprice too a monstrous subterfuge of nature to teach us a lesson letting us come back again when we are better when we can feel and keep grateful to her for letting us live at all you err in deduction sir john a round earth exposed to the sun's heat with a zenith movement from twenty three twenty eight north latitude to twenty three twenty eight south latitude must exhibit water currents flowing north and bringing with them equatorial temperatures such a fact is as normal as that the same earth must be colder at the poles than at the equator you are involved in a sophism because you assume a principle which is imaginary so far as its invariable truth is concerned and what mornings have we ever had warnings said sir john after a moment's silence during which he regarded leacraft with a guarded hopefulness warnings many and he took out a notebook from which he read the winters of fifteen forty four sixteen o eight seventeen o nine were terrific the thermometer at paris in seventeen o nine sank to nine degrees below zero fahrenheit in seventeen eighty eight seventeen eighty nine the river seine froze over in november then there was seventeen ninety four five seventeen ninety eight nine when the rivers of europe were frozen over in seventeen ninety five the mercury in paris registered ten degrees below zero although at the same time in london the temperature was nearly seven degrees above zero and then we have eighteen twelve thirteen when napoleon failed defeated by the cold rather than the russians in eighteen nineteen twenty in eighteen twenty nine thirty in eighteen forty forty one in eighteen fifty three four eighteen seventy seventy one during the franco-german war with the cold greater at the south than in the north of france and when this is worth noting the gulf stream was driven backward by a north wind and banked up as it were at spain and portugal in all these years there were intensely cold winters which if continued and reinforced by storms and increased by the disappearance of some of the helpful agencies that now keeps up our supply of caloric would mean could only mean our extinction now as for degrees of cold and i quote from flammarion the greatest cold yet experienced has been twenty four degrees below zero in france five degrees below in england twelve below in belgium and holland sixty seven degrees in denmark sweden and norway 
forty six in russia thirty two in germany and ten degrees below in spain and portugal these are fahrenheit records these severities tell us our danger it seems to me rejoined laycraft that they tell us nothing of the sort it is a mild madness to misconstrue them so completely these extremes of temperatures are far lower than any we have observed and yet we have been expelled from scotland it is the snow these endless heaping torrents from the skies that have driven us out and they i do believe it will continue but it has no parallel nothing warned us of this and as to our climatic safety it was as fixed as the change of day to night when without warning without precedent a bridge of mountains tumbles into a hole in the sea another bridge rises as a dam and either occurrence seemed about as likely as that the moon would fall into the sun i think indeed the advantage of a guess might have lain with the latter supposition well the snow you say it will continue said sir john with a sudden reflex action of revolt why will it continue i estimate the probability for that in this way answered leacraft the atmosphere is a system of balances never at rest unless in equilibrium and never in equilibrium except at rare intervals and then in limited and favoured spots this state of inequilibrium causes constant motion currents storms winds and precipitation whether of rain or snow depending on temperature and position now the motor power of the movement in all this atmospheric mass is difference of temperature the hot air rising and flowing to the poles and the cold air of the poles descending and flowing to the equator that is the a b c of meteorological physics but the revolution of the earth causes the cold polar winds to blow from the northeast and the warm equatorial winds to blow from the southwest that is with reference to our position in the northern hemisphere now if we are undergoing a progressive refrigeration the contrast in temperatures between our latitude and the temperature of the equator increases and because of that the velocity of the wind blowing from the latter increases too and the moisture that these winds would have dropped over the equatorial zones is carried further north and our annual precipitation is thereby increased our snowfalls become more continuous and thicker think what the removal of the gulf stream means kroll has clearly shown that the heat-bearing capacity of the gulf stream is enormous it seems incredible i recall some of his statements he says that the gulf stream conveys as much heat as is received from the sun by over one million and a half square miles at the equator and the amount thus conveyed is equal to all the heat which falls upon the globe within thirty-two miles on each side of the equator further that the quantity of heat conveyed by the gulf stream in one year is equal to the heat which falls on an average on three millions and a half square miles of the arctic regions and that there is actually therefore nearly one half as much heat transferred from the tropical regions by the gulf stream as is received from the sun by the entire arctic regions the quantity conveyed from the tropics by the stream to that received from the sun by the arctic regions being nearly as two to five and it is this fact of the tremendous drain that the gulf stream makes on the equatorial regions those immense manufactories of heat that its removal meaning the sudden abstraction of this heat or much of it from our latitude produces a more forceful interchange in the airs of the north and the south it produces winds of a higher velocity and because of this the wind coming to us from the equator does not so quickly free itself of its contained moisture kroll has shown in his splendid work of theory and proof that the winds warmed by the gulf stream are the true causes for our unusual and exceptional heat above corresponding positions on the western side of the atlantic basin the gulf stream gone these warming winds will bring us heat no longer but they will bring us moisture and in larger quantities and then the process of refrigeration over our chilled coasts will turn that into snow the snows will be deeper and they will last longer in this way kroll defending himself against the criticism of findlay shows that the winds the anti-trades 
blowing from the south to replace the atmospheric emptiness i suppose we might say vacuum left by the descent of the cold winds from the poles parted with the most of their moisture in the equatorial belt now by reason of their greater velocity they will not do that they will reach us much less despoiled of their watery burdens our highlands and our coast position make us natural condensers to-day we have a rainfall in the year of about thirty inches that may now be doubled the southwest winds are our most general winds out of a thousand as a maximum during the year two hundred and twenty-five are from the southwest these are wet winds and in the same total there are one hundred and eleven south winds which also carry moisture making a possible percentage of one-third of all the winds that blow over us as rain winds or now by reason of our altered state as snowmakers but this relative frequency will now be increased there will be a longer continuation of the west winds because as i have suggested they will be stronger they are to-day most intense in the winter months our south and southwest winds gather moisture from a wide expanse of sea the same expanse from which they formerly gathered heat from the gulf stream was widely diffused over the north atlantic both north and south for as kroll shows by reason of a high barometric pressure somewhere off the west of madeira and a low pressure north of iceland the tendency of the air south of the english isles at that point is to flow north but these winds are no longer heat carriers they bring moisture only they bear to us through the air the winding sheets of our burial the two men looked at each other and it was a look of anguish the sudden cruel dreadfulness the hideous mutation which might send the english people out of their land on the strange quest for a new home crushed them into an emotional inanition they did not seem to exist their lips lost their colour and only the paralysis of stupor saved them from breaking down into sobs it was a few moments later that leocraft spoke he asked and the people of glasgow how did they get away sir john scarcely raised his head and his words scarcely formed an articulate whisper they went by steamers End of chapter 6 Part 2chapter seven part one of the evacuation of england by l p gratacap this librivox recording is in the public domain in london february nineteen ten in the smoking-room of the bothwell club on cheapside back of st paul's london on february twelfth in the year of grace nineteen ten two men sat in attitudes of earnest attention a third man older than either with his back to a blazing fire whose simulated effect of comfort arose from the curling tendrils of gas flames that swept over another simulation of heaped-up logs was speaking with desperate emphasis he seldom looked at his arrested auditors nor indeed moved except when he raised his head and his eyes strained with a hopeless longing sought the gay frescoes of the ceiling or when in pauses of his declamations he walked to a window and raising the curtain looked out upon the city up to the dome of st paul's which rose like an irkutsk igloo above a plain of snow the man was alexander leacraft the auditors were mr archibald edward thompson and jim scaith both familiar to the reader as rescued and rescuing in that awful day of november twenty eighth when the last little band of citizens led by the provost marshal had slipped away in the storm from edinburgh strange things had happened since then much stranger were in store the train in which sir john c and his companions escaped had made its way with painful slowness and before the english line was reached had stopped repeatedly until it was necessary to desert it and then the weary crowd of refugees had staggered on their way to a distant station along a countryside emptied of its inhabitants 
with the low houses of the country people evident only as mounds of snow and with many struggles with mutual assistance with prayers and suffering the men pushed on in the closest companionship brought by the terrors and dangers of the journey into the usual unhesitating intimacy of peril they took each other's places in the work of excavation helped all to flounder and press through the drifts divided their company into the weak and strong and so allotted tasks that the cooperation of all helped their common progress camps were made in which shelters were clumsily provided with tents brought from edinburgh and which only the industry of the watchers saved also from burial in the tossing drifts the frugal meals snatched by chance or at the favourable moments where inequalities of the ground permitted a more regular distribution and preparation of food served well enough now and then they espied a deserted house and into this they crowded enjoying the heat of fires made of the woodwork the floors and windows of the house itself while they dried their clothing changed their shoes and gaining a respite and new strength sallied out again into the desolate landscape with its blue-gray skies flaming with crimson when the day set and the snow cleared and a sharpened icy edge of cold vibrated like an unseen but intensely realized cord stretched nippingly through the air the leaders expected to reach a place called tway stone where a train was in waiting which would carry them south of this immediate zone of the greatest snowfalls gruesome sights were encountered and the blanched faces of men turned away from the uncovered sepulchre of a horse and rider now a child and mother and sometimes in the wet morasses still unfrozen beneath the towering ridges the forlorn immured body of a young woman with blanketed face and streaming hair Leacraft and thompson with jim worked unremittingly with the young scotch woman they patched up a rude litter and they carried her on this trudging toilsomely along and watching her needs their care was affectionate and touching and soon other strong men offered their help for gradually the sensation gained place so quickly does the human fancy cling to the vaporous skirts of superstition that the girl's safety meant the rescue of all that her security carried with it the common weal she became a fetish and they rejoiced in caring for her as if contribution to her welfare conveyed its unseen benefits to all who engaged in the kind ministry nor did she fail with the living hopefulness of youth and with her fresh winning loveliness to establish a return her smile the lingering gratitude she showed to all her own usefulness and ready help at the stop and waiting places when her eager intelligence watched and directed the provisioning and cooking rewarded the toilers she was quick and resourceful cheerful in exhortation and advice and certainly to leacraft always lovely thompson had forgotten his first resentment at leacraft's apparent admiration for his cousin the two men had become very intimate both felt themselves on the edge of new events which were in part to be shaped by the blind forces of the earth and in larger part as they affected england by the sagacity and steadfastness of men they talked much over these things together both were sombre and frightened the invincible powers of nature the unconquerable ferocity of nature which is deaf to reason blind to suffering made them shrink and quail to meet its urgency with makeshifts was impossible to resist it madness the line of retreat was the only line of escape they felt this the thought became oppressively dominant they began at first to hint at it they ended quite quickly too in predicting it with mutual confessions of dismay both loved miss tobit yet as far as appearances went only the guardian spirit of her dreams could have told the direction of her inclinations perhaps both seemed to her too dear too much involved in the one peril with herself 
to stand apart from each other in any guise or place of preference thompson was the younger man and he had the advantage of a handsome face a fine form and a particularly deferential tenderness cupid and his mother are not slow to give such gifts their heartiest commendation but thompson was generous to his somewhat reticent and probably not greatly feared rival the prowess of beauty is generally undaunted and oftentimes magnanimous when the worst hardships of their journey were over and in the less afflicted regions of england where at the time the snowfalls were not as deep or the winds as tempestuous leocraft had many chances to talk with miss tobit and he found her extremely affable well informed and sympathetic certainly not endowed with the mischievous drollery and the roguish merriment of miss garrett and therefore not so piquant tantalizing and desirable but very kindly and soothing the provost-marshal and most of the party went to liverpool whither before many of the inhabitants of edinburgh had fled but leocraft and thompson kept on to london they found conditions in london full of fright and trepidation and the business interests floundering and collapsed leocraft took up his headquarters at the bothwell club and thompson and his cousin found a home and a maiden aunt's in claverhouse place but much as leocraft would have craved an indulgence of sympathy and response the audience of sense and appreciation and the agreeable picture before his eyes of acquiescent if not admiring beauty the fatal progress of events in the world of england kept him away from miss tobit more than he wished these events were far from reassuring they were directly and successively catastrophic their logic seemed inexorable and europe became rigid with attention as it watched with most varying feelings of commiseration the tightening grasp of frost and snow wind and tempest upon the destiny of england not that an actual submergence beneath snowdrifts was threatened a hyperboreal sepulchre under which every englishman lay like the excelsior youth lifeless but beautiful no such shocking and shattering misery as had befallen scotland had as yet engulfed england especially its southern counties but the darkening days brought more clearly to the observation of the most recalcitrant and obtuse the most reluctant and temporizing the fact that england's climate was approaching that of labrador that the restraints of trade would soon become enormous that its products would be unmitigatedly diminished and restricted and that it could no longer raise wheat that its railroads for half the year would endure a dangerous embargo that its population would perish that its industries would undergo the most serious curtailment that foreign ports would absorb its commerce steal its prestige insinuate themselves by its crippled resources into the markets of the earth in its place that the ramifications of disaster would penetrate its social intellectual and political life and cloud its mental horizon with the gaunt and stupid spectres of torpor and helplessness this monstrous dilemma submerged all minor passions and plunged england into the noisiest outbreak of argument suggestion and panic-stricken questionings leocraft buried himself in the questions that now with the more forward and statesmanly thinkers were coming to the front with relentless insistence amongst these conspicuously outstrode and outshone the rest h g wells the brilliant author and prophet of the new republicanism whose book had five years before roused an intense and frightened protest from the servitors of antiquity and the selfish lackeys of a superannuated and mythical class system mr wells with his trained skill in scientific deduction and the exercised powers of imagination with a reckless and defiant desire to unravel the future with the slenderest regard for the prejudices of religion or old fogey political conservatism was now half deluded himself with the sudden dream of starting the english nation on new grounds released from the impedimenta of ceremonies and ruins names and titles 
furnished with a tabula rasa where the new ideals of which he set himself up as a sort of avatar and preacher might most keenly set and develop themselves he believed as in a measure leacraft did himself that the english cultus would put on those insignia of the coming eras which meant intellectual emancipation and a social and civil regime where the greatest happiness and the widest material prosperity would unite in which too would not be wanting a radical rearrangement of the relations of the sexes hinted at in the same author's later books but which again naturally by many who followed mr wells a certain way was indignantly repudiated a more dignified and august group of men among whom the names of churchill chamberlain rosebery balfour professor stubbs and bryce led had assembled themselves in a council of deeply concerned and profoundly patriotic advisers these men secured a very noble elevation above the wild and unclassified miscellany of men and women who with cries denunciations nostrums whims hallucinations guesses and queries deluged the pages of the times stood at the corners of the streets where such standing was possible in the hard weather and preached their fantastic mental wares a still more obvious and ear-assailing group were the religious zealots who thrive at moments of peril filling the brains of their listeners with adjurations exhortations prayers pictures and prophecies for one moment doleful with wailing execrations of past wickedness and the next piteously shrieking eloquent appeals for repentance and confession the singular and amazing thing in all this was the convinced assent given to the prediction of science whereas at first the geologists and the meteorologists belittled and ridiculed the warnings of the president they now enlarged extended and enforced them with a greater authority and more illuminated reasoning hardly believing that the people of england would realize this approaching disaster what it meant what steps should be contemplated to escape its worst effects how permanent and deep-seated were its causes the british association for the advancement of science had resolved itself into a body of educators lectures were given where practicable leaflets circulated letters published in the leading dailies and a comprehensive educational crusade started and with one object to instil a deeper dread of the future a distrust of the possibility of the longer occupancy of the british islands and yet a firm reliance that under changed auspices of place the same civilization with unchanged features would still continue to rule the world parliament was constantly in session and to it the worshipful english householder and pew-renter looked with unwavering faith waiting for its sublime wisdom and intrinsic patience to devise ways and means and some safe policy of safety even the king became earnest perhaps a little anxious as among the most popular doctrinaire plebiscites was the reiterated need of an abolition of the discarded system of the royal household from the midst of all this confusion organized and disorganized movements the collapse of trade the desertion of workers the sudden emergence of a thousand voices claiming clamouring debating the physical wreck of business the inflamed transcendentalism that saw ahead of the present moment readjudication rehabilitation renovation of all social wrongs and with the cruel winter breathing its desolating rigours the snow rising in the streets the poor dying from starvation or exposure the steamers crowded to their taffrails daily exporting the timid and selfish rich or the pinched poor escaping with a bare competency to establish themselves under less penurious skies from all this there suddenly grew into stalwart and national proportions the resolve to leave england it grew with a certain flaming ardour of noble hopes and resolves it grew also with an agony of doubt the whole implication of the idea was grievously wounding to pride and it strained at the very heart-string of the english nature 
to go away from england was to become un-englished to lose the rich heritage of pastoral beauty the treasured wealth of historic associations the spot and home of literary triumphs the soil the air which by some impalpable union of efficacies made the english blood and temperament and which could not be taken away to make the same fine product elsewhere the pathos of it a nation wandering homeless with its lares and penates in its arms its face darkened with humiliation its shoulders that erstwhile bore the burdens of states bowed with the shame of enforced desertion its voice that summoned the freemen of the earth to convocation silent with fear or perhaps broken by the irrepressible echo wrung from its own anguish at turning its back on the cradle and the home of its greatness and yet it grew this same resolve and eloquence and poetry and prayers and science and statescraft united to make it strong and beautiful to blend in it the supernatural benisons of religion the purified affections of the heart and the resolute affirmations of conviction my friends it was leocraft speaking from the fireside of the bothwell club in cheapside on the night of february twelfth nineteen ten i think the speech to-day of the members from scotland in parliament was decisive it leaves no alternative we cannot hopelessly in the face of this modern world's competition fight out a narrowing chance for existence under the conditions facing us and it is an unmistakable alternative our climate has changed and the change is irrevocable and it is subversive too we must go away taking all that we have with us the english nation has reached a sublime crisis we transplant our virtues we will relinquish our failings we have a world of our own to choose from and we are given an opportunity unparalleled in history it's a great chance to begin all over again expostulated jim not at all resumed leocraft his voice rising with that peculiar english intonation of tenuity which often animates their sluggish accents if it does not soon soar into nasal squeaks not at all we leave england with not a thing forgotten or lost the machinery of our greatness is in our history and in ourselves the products of industry and art so far as they are necessary fixtures stay what of it a cathedral a palace here and there they often stand for things it would be best for us to forget and under which perhaps only revolution and violence will make us forget if we remain as we are what stirs my imagination what grows visibly before me both Thompson and jim watched intently the fervent englishman released into a sort of mystic clairvoyance is a new land which is a physical unit which has no known political subdivision which holds within it no inherited rages and taunting bitternesses as these islands do to-day let it be australia let it be south africa though there i admit is the memory of a bungle but we enter it a single people blended into homogeneity by adversity and we set about the tremendously interesting task of recreating england at least in all things pertaining to her that are great and lovable i fail to see said thompson that the probabilities are that way on the contrary freed from the geographical confinement of neighbouring islands governed from london in a new land irish scotch english will segregate again and then scatter just as might mixed races of birds who while they are in the same cage mingle but when they fly out fall back into their natural groups by the most certain of all animal tendencies that like seeks like well and what of it retorted leocraft these elements are together in a new country it is one there is no history behind it of subjugation and ill-treatment there can be no reversion to bickeries and recriminations where even the monuments and milestones familiarly associated with injustice have disappeared besides we leave behind the obnoxious shameless law of entail at least we shall be free of that disgrace and at last but 
he added his voice again singing to a pained whisper with what a wrench well mr leacraft spoke up jim scaith again it's mair than moving that has to be done there's the new land to be bought and settled there's getting there and biding there there's schools to be built and hames and shops and it seems to me with pardon for being so forward that if it took so many years to make a great city it's no fuel's wart to sail over the seas and put it up again then after a pause and it's never the old home no resumed laycraft that is true it's not the old home and a big city the greatest cannot be boxed up in straw and packing cloth and get set up by order in another place with the precision of a movable bungalow but we need not trifle we all know that it's no child's work we expect something very different from london we can meet the emergencies of place and room our population can be distributed remember we are on trial and the new strange chapter opening before us will bring again into view the inalienable fortitude and power of the english mind it's a test the conditions are irreversible and mind and character will win must win or slowly surely the stars of our ascendancy pale and disappear nature for a moment has thrown us in a great peril but was it nature or ourselves that won us footholds throughout the world open coasts await us hundreds of thousands will welcome us the influences of a common language ancestry and institutions have chained together the links of our supremacy around the world and made of it an inseparable girdle shall we falter now when nature again challenges our mind to quell her hostility opposing her impediments of sense to our invisible treasuries of thought invention and self-confidence it is a new step our best step in the march of human liberty we need to be divorced from the material constants amid which the long-fought battle for free thought and action has been waged we are yet entangled in the meshes of tradition the stumbling blocks of convention and now they're shattered we rise to splendid hopes or shall we say it is retribution it is punishment for many sins let it be so a chastened pride will not hurt us nor will it hurt our chances yes leacraft interrupted thompson i feel better to hear you talk this way but i must look at some very disagreeable facts too they are not easily eliminated by words or fancies and even seem to evince a provoking facility to become more numerous the more they are considered take the mechanical problem of transportation we are some forty millions of people the extravagant powers of assimilation of the united states barely digests the one million of emigrants that come to their shores each year what conceivable powers of absorption will dispose of our forty millions without an attack of industrial gastritis that will induce the worst political convulsions and the carrying skill and capacity of our whole merchant marine cannot in less than ten years take away this monstrous human cargo together with all the colossal accumulation of paraphernalia stocks chattels goods treasures books and belongings that have gathered in this rich island until they seem like a sort of pactolian alluvium that is indigenous and irremovable think of the women the children what method of domiciliation will you devise to accommodate these armies and with this removal comes the crash of all domestic values railroad stock gas stock mill stock warehouses land values everything goes with the removal of the human vitality that gives them worth it staggers the imagination to think how the disorganization radiates and increases in all directions in nineteen o five six this great britain consumed in one industry alone nearly four millions of bales of cotton spun them out into merchantable goods on her fifty million spindles do you measure the almost unfathomable depths of distress the stoppage of this one industry means is it not better to fight it out here 
to defeat nature if i may be allowed to copy your own enthusiasm to put on our own heads the regalia of the ice king and rule him wrest from him his own sceptre and excel his power with the power of this new century of invention impossible leacraft's retort was quick and impetuous impossible no expedients of man will overcome the deliberate intentions of nature we utilize her forces but we may not deflect her purposes it is the voice of that very science which has made us such powerful masters of her utilities that now tells us we must go to quote the words of professor darwin spoken at the cape town meeting of the british association for the advancement of science stability is further a property of relationship to surrounding conditions it denotes adaptation to environment there can be no adaptation to this new environment which will retain our former greatness nature opposes us indeed in forcing us away but we thwart her niggardliness by subterfuge and endurance and courage we can make her plastic enough for our purposes if we do not overstep the limits of her last negation the practical question the panic the loss ah well if all should be as it has been if the inequality still remained the very moral significance and regeneration which i hope for could not come it means the levelling process by which the new brotherhood is visibly and violently enforced and as to place and means thousands upon thousands will establish themselves in america blessing every community they enter and being blessed in turn with opportunity australia and south africa and canada with its millions upon millions of square miles of unused land will furnish us with new homes revivification regeneration rehabilitation will be rapid we shall not see its final outcome but we shall know the virile impulse of self-help at its inception if social differences if social pageantry vanish the constraining push of christian tolerance and fellowship succeeds differences may emerge later but they will be differences of endowment and industrious energy no other and as to the transportation problem it can be solved we should not all go at once it may be a slow movement perhaps the slower the better but see how we become unified like refugees or shipwrecked outcasts we shall help each other and every man's hand will help his neighbour but also we shall organise on the basis of each man's aptitude the farmer to his ploughshare the mechanic to his workshop the preacher to his pulpit the artist to his easel the banker to his counting-room at last an ideal assortment of talents End of chapter 7, part 1chapter seven part two of the evacuation of england by l p gratticap this librivox recording is in the public domain thompson hid a slight yawn and made a smile of incredulity serve the ends of a salutation of encouragement there's no denying the contagion of your confidence leacraft but really i think that we are all mournfully in the dark as to what we best can do and in the meanwhile it's a matter of positive terror what we are going to live on i brought all the available cash i could for ethel and myself but already famine has unfurled its banners and you know how cramped and shrunk our living has become in london the thames alone saves us from starvation it's no longer a question of having a bank balance but the more definite and fundamental one of finding something to buy by the by balfour closes the debate at ten to-night you have admission to the gallery of the commons let us go down it promises to be a fine effort i only hope it's not going to be a funeral oration leacraft pulled out his watch and found the time a half hour after nine yes he would go in fact he had already engaged a boatman at blackfriars bridge to be in waiting for him at almost that very moment jim stepped to the window and looked out 
the night was pure and clear huge hummocks of snow encumbered the streets below and the moon blazed in the keen sky like some target of disaster weel mr laycraft you won't want me along and somehow i'd rather sit here and think over your own words little as i believe it will all come out so good like no jim keep the fire on and watch out for us and you might remember to brew us a stiff snack after your own heart it won't come amiss jim assented with alacrity and leacraft and mr thompson muffled up to their ears and almost hermetically enclosed in fur ulsters left the room descended the stairs and appeared at the doorway on the street a tolerable path led through a part of cheapside but it was not their intention to follow that thoroughfare they turned towards the church and clambered along a devious footway that imitated the sinuous and irregular wanderings of a mountain trail it led them to ludgate hill where they encountered a few other travellers like themselves making their way to the bridge for the same purpose bridge street was just passable and soon the ice-laden waters of the river were seen blazoned like some spectacle of enchantment in the deluge of argent light they found the boatman in the basement of the hotel royal which was dead to the last stories of its ornamented facade silent and dark he was a part of the indications that london already had lost its visitors the bargemen stole out of their retreat and leacraft and thompson followed them the shadows of the party printed in ink on the winnowed snow two men accompanied the boat one rowed and the other stood at the prow pushing off the cakes of ice and correcting the passage of the boat through the lanes of water flowing like limpid threads of molten silver between the crunching and veering flows leacraft and thompson watched with fascinated eyes the broad terrace of the victoria embankment illuminated with the moon's effulgence whose unchecked glory met a feeble rivalry in a few sickly gas mantles and a solitary electric lamp the noble houses of legislation and to the eyes of leacraft they never seemed more imbued with the supremely delicate and elevating beauty rose from the water's edge like some creation of an inspired dreamer woven of splintered rays of light with penciled lines of ebony filched from the darkest night it embodied a loveliness past even the powers of thought to measure or describe the houses flamed with light and the strong light on the clock tower announcing the sitting of parliament sent back to the moon a terrestrial radiance that resembled the pulsations of a fallen star as they passed the westminster bridge their eyes caught the distant lights of lambeth palace both knew that to-night the king dined with the archbishop slowly their boat drew near the landing and the two men who guided it motioned to its occupants to get ready to disembark as the landing was deprived of its usual outfit owing to the clogging cakes of ice which clung to the wall the heavy nose of the boat was pushed into the wall and leacraft and thompson scrambled up the steps and gained the walk which led to the victoria arch and the entrance of the parliament house here a jam was encountered and the news was soon learned that balfour had begun his speech an hour before the announced time and was now engaged in the closing appeal on the motion before the house and what was this motion to explain it, it is necessary to rehearse some of the preceding events which had finally eventuated in this most marvellous situation a debate in the house of parliament as to whether the english people should evacuate england this momentous and world-moving spectacle was now actually contemplated by the fixed attention of every nation on the earth its awful solemnity the convulsing pathos of it the immense commercial dislocation it involved its social agony the calamitous doubts it summoned as to the stability of europe itself and the fiercer sudden question of the meaning of human existence on this planet it aroused made the debate of the english parliament then pending the most extraordinary discussion ever known in human annals 
the occasion for it had practically been forced or precipitated by the coercive power of scientific opinion and the curious thing about this same scientific opinion was that it first resisted the overwhelming proof of the subsidence of the isthmus and the elevation of the caribbean wall of transgression and then fervently accepted it with not one scintilla more of demonstration and in accepting it proposed for itself the unwelcome task of convincing the english people that they should evacuate their country it would be hard to conceive of anything to the english mind less conceivable than such a desertion its mere mention raised the most violent denunciation and poured a torrent of abuse upon the unfortunate advisers the thought of it sapped the very foundations of the english sense of existence it seemed the vertigo of madness it deranged the most obvious assertions of common sense it was an impeachment of the english reality to think of it was a betrayal of trust a breach of faith a succinct defiance of the almighty a blasphemous rejection of the lessons of history a timorous surrender to the threats of the weather but later when the scottish population began to throw its inundating tides of people into england and the englishman read at his breakfast-table of the flows of ice in the clyde and the buried grampians the insurmountable drifts about stirling and the incipient neve masses on skirna Glen and skye the reluctant embarkation of the merchants of aberdeen the closing of its great university the shrinkage of business in glasgow when they realized that in truth the atlantic and pacific oceans had become united by a broad gateway through which the gulf stream which erstwhile transported the heat of the equator to europe now emptied its torrid waters bathing the western coasts of north america as far north as alaska and bringing to that arctic country almost the same blessing of fructifying warmth with which it had before endowed england when still further they began to hear and to realize by private letters the affectionate summons and offers of the colonies the overwhelming loyalty of the brothers across the sea their frenzied eagerness to place their lands almost gratuitously in the hands of the mother people and assume towards them the role of honored beneficiaries then a strange unwonted wondering began as to whether it might not be best to look into the matter and then intelligence aroused with continued inspection the impression grew that indeed the prospects were alarming the english mind once startled in a certain direction soon takes on an impetus proportionate to the inertia of its first movements and therefore by a natural law of psychology and mechanics gains in accelerated velocity with each succeeding moment so it was now the industry of the scientific propaganda its inventive persistency was followed by the conversion of the large financial and commercial interests and then a panic seized the great masses of the nation parliament took it up the papers bulged and teemed with information discussion advice and reports a determining influence with the large trading classes was the decline in some instances the positive disappearance of business while to others not chained in insular possessions a new world of adventure and chance seemed not altogether undesirable the pressure of popular approval hastened in the parliament the formation of a plan for the slow and careful removal of the population the law of exodus as it was termed was a thoroughly english legislative work and that meant a wise adequate and deliberate evacuation it involved a retabulation so to speak of the wealth and occupations of the individuals of the country and so adjusted their departure their association their duties their facilities and trades that the least competition would arise in the new quarters and then they were also so distributed in the colonies that they met the requirements of these as it was ascertained from the authorities the latter demanded 
thousands upon thousands had already sailed away forming for themselves combinations as their acquaintances and connections permitted and still other thousands with property invested abroad made a home in the land in which their support lay a singular consequence of the situation was the speculative gale it produced in america where large amounts of unemployed or released capital took flight it settled tumultuously in wall street voraciously attacking every variety of security and driving stock values out of sight in a tremendous boom that disconcerted the tried veterans of the famous mart all the time the londoner was himself gaining some convincing insight into the dread nature of the climatic change about him the snows covered the greater part of the streets of london the parks became desolate tracks deserted uncleared unused swept over by the freezing winds and chased from end to end with buffeted wreaths of snow whose ghostly swirling columns ran over the wintry exposures like a race of titanic spirits crossing each other in cyclonic confusion or meeting in shivering collisions dissolving in cloud bursts of microscopic and penetrating needles of ice the thames was almost closed the shipping stayed idle at the wharfs almost unmitigated suffering spread among the poor for miles the streets were only traversed by footpaths worn by their occupants and the strangest sights occurred in the smaller reservations like lincoln inn fields st paul's churchyard the temple gardens the artillery grounds finsby circus and other confined spaces by a freak of circumstances and the curious and entirely unexpected vagary of the winds the snow piled up and up in these quarters because of a peculiar inrush of wind from the converging streets around and this sweeping effect continued until the mound of snow circumvallating the buildings reached to their windows or overtopped them while in enclosures not preempted by buildings as highbury fields and the various cemeteries the hills of snow formed colossal billows which seemed like a phalanx of rigid waves tortured into fantastic pinnacles by the storms of wind such spectacles turned back the life-blood of the bravest and converted the most recalcitrant objectors to the new view of the necessity of leaving the immemorial splendours of england's capital it was a demoralizing and distressing picture of change to visit the great docks on the thames the london docks the commercial and the west india docks and in the place of the varied throngs the miscellaneous rabble of labourers in which the forms faces and even the dresses of the people of the world made a composite aggregate which was a suggested reflex of the myriad-handed toil and industry of london a significant hint of the immense wealth and opulent indulgence of the great metropolis in place of all this the harsh winds whistled over deserted yards shrieked through the rigging of idle ships or blew tempestuous volleys of rime and sleet across the river between wapping and rotherhight before this awful change english fortitude and confidence quailed or wrapping itself in the reserve of bitterness and distrust turned silently away for an instant at least driven to confess that the time-honoured legend of english destiny had become a perverted and silly shibboleth february twelfth which has in meteorology along with the twelfth of november may and august been isolated as the period of the ice saints viz four periods characterized in an unaccountable manner by a fall in temperature this twelfth of february nineteen ten had been determined by the parliament for the closing of the great debate on the motion of evacuation it was this night that leacraft and thompson found so clear and cold a keen and perilous intensity of cold probably never before experienced in the english islands unless one in his enviable task of comparison could have found an equivalent in the ice age itself when leocraft and his companion attained the victoria tower already the debate on the motion which in an enlarged way had been before the english nation for more than a month had reached its final stage 
balfour had been chosen to close in a long peroration the tremendous forensic display which had been limited to the walls of the houses of parliament but it was only an episodic and distinguished incident in an argument which had convulsed every household in england which had sent its clamorous assertions and appeals to the whole english-speaking people throughout the world and which would by all rational expectations remain to the end of historic time the most startling venture in language the most dramatic performance in oratory ever known the two men hurried in past the flaming chandeliers of the beautiful archway upon leocraft showing his particular cards of admission an attendant escorted them through the royal gallery the house of peers the peers lobby all of which were deserted they chased in most indecorous fashion through the marvellous rooms only intent upon catching the last words of the great speech whose purport and end was to empty those glorious apartments of their human interest and bring expatriation upon all the memories they harboured they passed through the central hall the commons lobby the division lobby and were expeditiously inserted in the reporters gallery where backed up against the topmost wall they surveyed the thronged mass beneath them every inch of space every point of observation was packed and the scene on which a softened flood of light fell with an enhancing effect of wonder was eloquent in picturesque power and interest lords and ladies to-night no interfering screen concealed the women earls dukes baronets the clergy even bishops in their robes merchants men of science bankers and the whole house of peers standing at the bar of the house of commons were arrayed in a vast and irrelevant assemblage pierced by one thought the anguish of a supreme decision and balfour upon an erect and stalwart figure moved by an instinct of regnancy at this sublime instant to stand free of his compeers in the broad way between the benches of the government and those of the opposition and facing the speaker all the eyes of that assemblage were riveted the classic sentences of macaulay in describing the trial of warren hastings hackneyed as they are by innumerable repetitions might well apply to this unwanted and intense spectacle the long galleries were crowded by an audience such as has rarely excited the fears or the emulations of an orator there were gathered together from all parts of a great free enlightened and prosperous empire grace and female loveliness and learning the representatives of every science and every art and the comparison can be illuminatively emphasized at the trial of the illustrious proconsul curiosity in a man sympathy with a race admiration for the local splendour of a gorgeous scene summoned to the hall of william rufus the resplendent galaxy but the motives were objective in the present case thought leocraft how pathetic how tragic their subjective force it was as if the children of a home about to disappear in some horrible engulfment calmly prepared to leave its threshold but it was that sorrow multiplied by all the individuals of a nation and magnified by the moral surrender of the associations of two thousand years a nervous tension that was expressed in the almost petrified stare of some faces the startling pallor of others the half-opened lips the strained attitudes the involuntary shudders the curious grieved looks of inattention overmastered the assembly its contagious thrill seized leocraft and brought his mental receptivity up to a quickened pitch of almost deranged alertness while every sense seemed preternaturally awake he heard a woman sob somewhere in front of him and far down the left gallery in the glare and glitter he saw a noble head white-haired but still wearing the flush of manhood's prime upon his cheeks leaning on a hand and turned towards him with unchecked tears coursing silently from its upraised eyes 
he saw a little girl clasping the neck of her mother and father as she sat half on the laps of each and heard the soft lisp of her kisses on their brows he saw the almost saturnine face of a dowager stonily gazing at the speaker and most strangely he detected on her finger a topaz ring cut in relievo with the head of queen victoria and yet while his senses reported these trifles with startling keenness they were also all enlisted in catching every gesture every movement every accent of the man whose plastic power of eloquence was there engaged in pleading for english abdication how the words rang in his ears how persuasively the voice sank and rose and with what a soaring melody some of the cadences seemed to linger in the scented air let us it said bow before the revelation of our own destiny the ordination of nature is the express reflection nay it is the objective expression of divine will accept it with submission with the subserviency of faith and act on that condition with the abundance of that native resolution that from the time of alfred has made our path upward outward onward i do not sir underestimate the tremendous ordeal i cannot be blind to the colossal undertaking it resumes in one herculean exertion all the efforts of our race through two thousand years it is without precedent or else it shall only be reverently compared to the exodus of the children of god from egypt and in that light sir without subterfuge or apology without extenuation of rhetoric without rivalry or vanity i do regard it we are solemnized by some vast scheme in the order of things to carry with us the genius of our civilization to another home where its power and beauty shall both benefit others and become themselves more powerful and more beautiful we have lived through a stadium of progress and achievement we certainly advance to the opening of another let the gathered multitudes of our race here at its ancestral hearth gird up their loins and accept the august command to go forth from the whitean of the angles and the saxons through a feudal hierarchy to magna carta through the provisions of oxford the model parliament of edward i by the rise in political privileges by the towns by merchant guild and craft guild by the good parliament of thirteen seventy six by the relentless rebukes of richard in the merciless parliament by reason of popular censure and the eloquence of common men as with john ball in the revolts of thirteen eighty in the insurrection of wat tyler followed as it was by shameless mad ventures through wycliffe by the glories of the tudors the overthrow of the stuarts by pym hampton cromwell by william of orange by parliamentary reform and legislative extension from the first glimmerings of civic life to the light of the modern day this nation has grown in strength in reason in the deliberate purpose of holding even the scales of justice but sir with new positions new prospects new opportunities in illimitable areas of expansion we enter upon undreamed of material enlargements a greater london will in the coming centuries appear in which through the phase of exaltation we shall assume will be seen the miracle of time in which we all have learned the highest technical skill our loftiest constructive creative mind will be realized the social power the redemptive agencies the final product of his thought aspirations skill will be incorporated in this city of man for men the city of the future and it will be ours all ours london redivava london redux london sempier turna et ne plus ultra a greater england shall be gathered within its walls it will hold our sanctified patriotism our emancipated reason our ennobled disciplined applied science the embodiment of our imagination 
and to its doors the world will gather too in fealty in trust in homage o oh, et presidium et dulce decus meum the voice ceased the speaker dropped dumbly into his seat and for an instant held his hands over features convulsed with feeling the surprising thing then was the awful silence the deadness of that living throbbing almost frantic audience who looking out upon a blackness of uncertainty felt the happy past radiant with ease and fame ceremonial and cultured luxury slipping out of their possession forever and uttered no sound the speaker of the house rose there was a shifting of heads the rustle of turning bodies a simultaneous orientation but no other sound and leocraft scanned the multitude more again the portentous silence the speaker with quite unusual ardour alluded to the imposing power and beauty of the speech and put the motion and then another thing more astonishing happened that house of commons leaped to its feet and shouted in one long vibrant roar i i i the eager agony of the assemblage then split and tore the proud repression that had almost strangled it cry upon cry started from various points and the clamour grew the agitation took on the aspect of disorder and panic and then it resolved itself into thundering cheers for the king and then with electrifying unanimity the multitude sang the national anthem it was over the house of commons had ordered the evacuation of england the house of peers would follow their lead and while that evacuation would take place slowly covering a long space of time and permit the recreant forces of nature to reform if they would the face of the world as it had been while it had consideration for all the conflicting interests involved and was so skilfully framed as to cause the least shock of derangement to the immense business agencies still it was a surrender of the proudest people on the face of the earth to the blind powers of nature and it meant for englishmen a new heaven and a new earth leocraft and thompson returned that night to their lodgings at the bothwell club through pall mall where but a few of the clubs were still in action and as they moved painfully along over the debris and dirt the disturbed and shapeless heaps of snow the abandoned articles of furniture in front of some houses and saw the darkened fronts of others with broken windows and broached and falling doors noted the signs of interior commotion in the treasury the admiralty the foreign and indian offices the war office and the horse guards they felt that parliament had already been forestalled and that the evacuation of london and with it all england had already begun end of chapter seven part two chapter eight part one of the evacuation of england by l p gratacap this librivox recording is in the public domain events were moving rapidly ever since the parliament by a legislative decree had authorized the desertion of england and the eventful day approached when the king and his household the parliament itself and the church and the titled estate should in a formal and expressive manner leave england's shores the mass of the population had been diligently hunting about for refuge and occupation steamers and ships had scattered in all directions the fleeing multitudes relatives abroad friends and even acquaintances offered homes and employment no utility now was too small to be considered nor any designation too insignificant to merit attention this scampering was largely among those who felt the pinch already of idleness and the diminishing chance of work among operatives and workmen clerks and the breadwinners of the middle class the nobleman and the pauper did not stir the english nation had decreed through its legislature that the evacuation of the country should be conducted with pageantry 
that the solemn parting should be enrolled in all time-honoured ceremony and stately pomp with which kings had been crowned and for which with all its heart and mind the english nature cries out with unappeasable hunger so the moment for the king's departure which meant the official desertion of the old home might justly be compared to the flight of the queen bee in the bee colony when her faithful followers swarm after and upon her and with resolute constancy create a new city about her inviolable person the king was to leave england in june nineteen ten and when he left with sumptuous and melancholy observance with splendour of colour and depth and power of music with uniform and ritual with prayer and chorus and prophecy with august and intolerable grandeur with the art of tradition and the ornaments of invention he was to pass down to tilbury and sail away beyond gravesend to the new realm of his possession on the shores of australia it was a pretty hard thing to believe it was a harder thing to do but it was to be done with all the gorgeous effectiveness which accumulated traditions of centuries and the practice of every day and the mere resources and artifices and equipment of a magnificent realm could display the day came with splendid beauty the sun shone over an england which somewhat returned to the flowery loveliness of its old and sweet estate the city had been cleared though the snowfalls had reached the most unexpected depth and the severity of the winter had been appalling the meteorologists discovered the fact that the western and northwestern zones of extreme precipitation those of eighty inches had moved inward and had even exceeded this maximum and the condition of the country was really extraordinary and desperate the immense accumulations of snow in the outlying districts had risen to such heights that the low long houses of the peasantry were covered and the aspect of the country was that of a labrador landscape transplanted to southern latitudes where trees stone walls and villages assumed the place of the more familiar tundra plains and stone-floored plains suffering had been very general and the importunity of nature had done more to convince the people that the necessity of removal was an actual threat not to be avoided or placated than the speeches the tracts of the scientific societies or the deliberations of statesmen and editors but in london on this twelfth of june though the air bore the strange traces of the changed climate in its tingling sharpness yet this exhilaration only served the purpose of adding swiftness to the movement of the hosts of people in the streets and a new and wonderful tremor of excitement to their eagerness in awaiting the development of the day's great preparations in the morning the king was to be enthroned in westminster abbey and to receive the homage of the peers and as usual at a coronation the day itself was inaugurated with the firing of a royal salute at sunrise a measure of the august and overpowering rites and observances that marked the assumption of a king's rule was now to be gone through with as a symbol and memento before the king transferred his throne to another land and this ceremonial was emblematic of the unbroken allegiance of the english nation to his removed majesty the king was to ascend the theatre of the abbey and be lifted into his throne by the archbishops and bishops and other peers of the kingdom and being enthronized or placed therein all the great officers those that bear the swords and sceptres and the rest of the nobles should stand round about the steps of the throne and the archbishop standing before the king should say the exhortation beginning with the words stand firm and hold fast from henceforth the seat of state of royal and imperial dignity which is this day delivered unto you in the name and by the authority of almighty god and by the hands of us the bishops and servants of god though unworthy etc etc and then the homage being offered and accepted the king attended and accompanied the four swords being the sword of mercy 
the sword of justice to the spirituality the sword of justice to the temporality and the sword of state were to be carried before him he should then descend from his throne crowned and carrying his sceptre and rod in his hands should go into the area eastward of the theatre and pass on through the door on the south side of the altar into king edward's chapel the organ and other instruments all the while playing the king should then standing before the altar deliver the sceptre with the dove to the archbishop who would lay it upon the altar there the king would then be disrobed of his imperial mantle and be arrayed in his royal robe of purple velvet by the lord great chamberlain the archbishop should then place the orb in his majesty's left hand then his majesty should proceed through the choir to the west door of the abbey in the same manner as he came wearing his crown and bearing in his right hand the sceptre with the cross and in his left the orb all peers wearing their coronets and the archbishops and bishops their caps the interior arrangements in the abbey were familiar from the west door where the procession should enter to the screen which divides choir from nave two rows of galleries were to be erected on each side of the centre aisle the one gallery level with the vaultings the other with the summit of the western door these galleries should have their fronts fluted with crimson cloth richly draped at the top and decorated with broad gold fringe at the bottom on the floor of the centre aisle a slightly raised platform or carpeted way should be laid down along which the king and queen in procession should pass to the choir this was to be matted over and covered with crimson cloth on the pavement of the aisle bordering this carpeted way should stand the soldiery as a fence against interference the theatre where the principal parts of the ceremony were to be enacted lies immediately under the central tower of the abbey and was a square formed by the intersection of the choir and the transepts extending nearly the whole breadth of the choir on this square a platform was to be erected ascended by five steps the summit of this platform and also the highest step leading to it was to be covered with the richest cloth of gold from that step down to the flooring of the theatre all was covered with carpet of rich red or purple colour bordered with gold in the centre of the theatre the sumptuously draped chair was to be placed for the sovereign in which he receives the homage of the peers this interior pomp and splendour escaped the observation of leacraft though he was not unfamiliar with the details of the solemn pageant but now it hardly interested him his mind by a natural emancipation from the thrall of such spectacles dwelt rather on the attitude of the people in this extreme peril and solicitude he felt inquisitive to learn their feelings their hopes their cohesiveness in the changed estate were they likely to resolve into a chaos of preferences with only the cry of sauve qui peut in their mouths or would they follow the new destinies and preserve the nation at length the populace were coming into their own it was pretty evident that a king and queen and regalia and peers and peeresses and a much surpliced clergy would not make a nation without the workers the rent-payers the men of action the breadwinners the clerks artisans and merchants the householder and his family and that the sacred classes would be suddenly subjected to a reductio ad absurdum if they formed the only inhabitants of the new regime and their titles lost their raison d'etre with the disappearance of the untitled mass after the rendering of the homage at the abbey the procession was to take place and the king arriving at tilbury with the royal family a selection of the peers the highest episcopal prelates and certain representative men from the commons including the ministry would be received on the dreadnought and with a glorious escort of the largest battleships carrying the royal equipage the furniture of windsor castle and of st james palace and of the buckingham mansion the archives of the parliament at least a portion steam away from england to australia to melbourne 
this nucleus of government holding the inseparable insignia and the actual essence of the english nation would there with pomp and solemn allegations with rolling music and pious prayers with thunders of the guns by the navy and the salute of the army be as it were reinstalled but the rout of the procession was not to be straight out of london it comprised a broader purpose it was proposed to circumvallate london to impregnate it with the sentiment of the king's leaving it should be traversed and penetrated in all directions gathering thus the public allegiance and absorbing its loyalty shedding the effulgence of the royal splendour upon the populace and enchaining them anew to the principle and fact of english sovereignty it was a stupendous project it involved stations and relays camps of the military were to be established at st james park at victoria park at regent's park at the west end near paddington at wormwood scrubs and in the southern districts around clapham common and towards putney the king was to stop at resting places and in the largest local churches a reduced form of the homage was to be instituted involving the enthronization with the displays of the regalia and the jubilation and the reverence of the people expressed as always in the shouts god save king edward long live king edward may the king live for ever the bells of the churches were to ring the houses were to hang out their banners flags were to cover the streets bands stationed on prominent balconies at points covering the entire long journey through and around the city were to play national airs that so there might be generated an overwhelming enthusiasm a tumult of devotion and thus constrain the englishman afresh in the religion of the nation's immortality it was finally conceived this elevation of the king it was gorgeously executed the imagination of the people was tremendously impressed and the ark of the covenant of the internal supremacy of the english crown seemed thus visibly incorporated and presented to them the procession was glittering and it was majestic it ponderously emphasized the english idea there were really two processions the first from westminster to buckingham palace the second through london in the first the king issued from westminster his crown borne before him but holding in his right hand the sceptre with the cross and in his left the orb then began the most wonderful state ride through london the superb chariot of the king surrounded by heralds kings in arms pursuivants with judges councillors lords and dignitaries was followed by the open carriages of the nobility the king was immersed in colour garter principal king-at-arms was a miracle of dress he wore a frock or tabard crimson and gold emblazoned with the quarters of the united kingdom then there was the clarencieux of the south and norroy of the north and the heralds of lancaster somerset richmond all wonderfully bedight and the pursuivants rouge croix rouge dragon portcullis and blue mantle looking like the genii of a christmas pantomime and here with the king were the lord chamberlain the lord steward and the master of the house and there followed this cavalcade surrounding the king like a many-coloured fringe the carriages of the nobles wherein all the signs of degree order rank were sumptuously shown here the robes of the peers crimson velvet edged with miniver the capes furred with the same and powdered with bars or rows of ermine according to degree rolled together in a bank of oscillating glory beneath the mantles a court dress a uniform or regimentals were decried the coronets were even worn and as the scintillating groups passed eager admirers separated the coronet of the baron with its six silver equidistant balls from the coronet of a viscount with sixteen from the coronet of an earl with eight balls raised on points and with glistening gold strawberry leaves between the points from the coronet of a marquis with four gold strawberry leaves alternating with four silver balls and from the coronet of a duke with the eight gold strawberry leaves 
nor did beauty hesitate to add its witchery to the sports of splendour and in behalf of that ancient idea of monarchy which now was enlisted against a deep peril of mistrust and repudiation the peeresses formed part of the procession their scarlet kirtles over the petticoats of white satin and lace their flowing sleeves slashed and furred their cushioned trains heaped in confusion in the carriages and relieved by shining plaques of silver silk were still more bewilderingly graced by jewellery by oceans of gems resplendently transfigured in the blazing sun in this momentous pageant the limits of the spectacular were invaded even distended in which some saw not only a lack of good taste but the pressure of a little fear even the church advanced the bold bid for admiration and wonder it sent out its archbishops bishops rectors canons prebendaries and deacons to compose parts of the vast exhibit to be interwoven in the variegated human carpet that filled the streets before the churches that were passed choirs gathered and sang melodiously the strong religious fibre of the english men and women was sedulously appealed to or else it was the elemental flaming forward of their powerful conviction at this strange moment there was less of pretence and trick than sincerity the heart of the people was steadfastly united with the old traditions they clung unbrokenly to the inheritance of english greatness there was no reason to doubt their faith the route of the second marvellous procession was from the abbey through birdcage walk past victoria monument to procession road to the strand to fleet street over ludgate hill past st paul's to cheapside to bishop street to shoreditch to hackney street and so out to victoria park and homerton back again to highbury fields south by essex road to pentonville road to euston road to marlbone road through regent's park through hampstead road to hampstead to west side through edgewood road to hyde park and the bayswater to holland park to hammersmith road by hammersmith bridge road to castle now thence to putney to battersea to clapham to camberwell thence to walworth road by london road by waterloo road to westminster bridge to the houses of parliament and on the banks of the river thames to the tower and on through whitechapel mile end road bow road to bromley to stratford to barking to tilbury nothing so prodigious had ever been conceived and the resources of the empire of the military and the squadrons of the colonists who should again as at the jubilee of queen victoria present the diversified elements of english power would be involved at tilbury on the essence bank opposite gravesend where rise the low bastions of tilbury fort originally constructed by henry the third king edward the seventh would in a fashion diverse and with a different end in view also declare that he had the heart and stomach of a king and of a king of england too as had said queen elizabeth but now it should be said by a king unappalled by the invasion of the powers of the air as she was before the power of spain but now said with undiminished confidence and high hope though said too with obedience to the supreme mandate of expulsion before it took place leocraft and thompson began their long walk from ludgate hill and leocraft intently watched the street crowds he noted also with recording interest the groups in the balconies with lunch baskets the expectant air everywhere was not unnoticeably mingled with a kind of frightened silence there was not much noise no indiscriminate hubbub in the streets and where groups were encountered hurrying to their destination they were quiet and restrained tension was evident a high-strung expectancy verging with impalpable approach upon tears and the agony of penitential promises 
the fundamentally religious optimism of the englishman was confounded and his acceptance of invisible guidance made itself seen in faces desolated by the grief of tears the preparations were remarkable and elaborate the windows were filled with chairs platforms were erected almost luxuriously draped with red cloth and scarlet velvet and surging crowds in spots seemed to belie the significance of the portentous moment from time to time as the two observers walked in the middle of the street they stopped reluctantly to notice signs of mourning these took on the form of trailing streamers of crape hung upon white cloth and their singularity amid the almost bombastic surplusage of scarlet dressings awoke protest and resentment at one point there was a particularly conspicuous dismal challenge to the susceptibilities of the spectators in a balcony loaded with sombre trappings which gained a startling prominence because of the patriotic and cheerful decorations on either side of it before this lugubrious appeal a small group of malcontents had gathered and were indulging in incendiary criticism it's no use turning a sour face to the thing what's got to be is got to be and a little heart will keep a sour stomach from making itself sick i say we're all in the same boat and cheerfulness makes pleasant company such a show as that ought not to be tolerated i say this belligerency came from the thick lips of a red-faced man who had his coat over his arm and whose leathern leggings corduroy knee breeches and flaming waistcoat with a high collar strapped to his muscular neck by a pea-green scarf betokened a representative of the fancy or an ostler turned out for a day's holiday indeed i think so squealed a thin short man with a red nose and a curious habit of wiping his mouth with a yellow handkerchief it's hard enough for the suffering masses to leave hearth home and i may say family not to be saddened more than is natural with these funereal suggestions well shouted a sturdy arrival on the other limit of the circle let's tear them down the quickest way to cure trouble is to get rid of it it's rotten and sultan to stick those weeds under our noses under the influence of these defiant words the knot of men moved towards the objectionable drapery with evidently unfriendly intentions but they had not been unobserved from the inside of the house on whose front these sad reminders hung a window shot up and a tall slender woman advanced to the edge of the balcony she was dressed deeply in black her neck was surrounded by some white crepe stuff and the sentiment as howells has it of her dress was a pathetic suggestion of bereavement and misfortune her hair yet luxuriant was plentifully sprinkled with grey her face had the authorised look of nobility and distinction she was yet prepossessing though the crowding years had brought her past middle life the distinctive impression she made upon leocraft as he and thompson somewhat withdrawn watched the denouement of this street episode was that of abiding sorrow patiently borne and doubtless united in her with christian resignation and unsullied piety a beautiful picture of the englishwoman who resolutely lives her earnest life of prayer and self-sacrifice holding intensely to her heart some fond memory wreathed in amaranth and leocraft as an englishman blessed providence there were such the men on the street were a little abashed by the pale face and lofty mien of the lady who had recognized their purpose and placed herself there to thwart it she came forward and instantly spoke her voice was excessively clear but an underlying mellowness imparted an extreme sweetness to its tones my friends you wish these morning signs taken away they offend you but when you know that they express to me the approaching loss of all my friends you will not i think feel so harshly about them the king in a week leaves the shores of england 
the evacuation of england begins to-day and with the king goes the great english nation and this wonderful city with all its memories with its beauty its historic power its incessant interest our common home for all our lifetimes will dwindle and dwindle and disappear lost in arctic snows and ice at least so they tell us but i shall stay in this house suffering has come to me it has never left me i shall not leave it i mourn for those who in going away die to english pride to english love to english devotion and she leaned out over the sullen men beneath her and die to me these black films are for them she stopped the men worried and puzzled and surprised looked a little sheepishly at each other oh well said he of the hostler type my lady no offence seeing how you feel about it i say have your way yes yes squealed the preacher if the empty badges of mourning give any one any one satisfaction why it's not in reason to question their motives in this excruciating moment gad the lady's right shouted the former belligerent whose prompt hint had at first neatly precipitated the riot she's got the right ring and i'm damned if any one titches the rags there i'll bust his cock-eyed head off his shoulders this vociferous statement produced a hubbub of approval and won many distinct admissions of entire acquiescence and with these reassuring murmurs the lady retired after telling her thanks and the gathering withdrew down the street leocraft and thompson continued their way westward before them suddenly after a half hour's sauntering shone an avenue of military splendour they were in charing cross having pushed down the strand and they were on the south side of trafalgar square and not far from the equestrian statue of charles i trafalgar square was filled with troops the effect of colour was transporting the massed regiments of infantry were broken by parks of artillery while immediately under nelson's column the nineteen hussars the dumpies of seventeen fifty nine the fifteenth hussars elliot's light horse the sixteenth lancers the queen's and the thirteenth hussars the ragged brigade were confusedly stationed their mingling busbies and dependent bags looking like a garden patch from point to point issued galloping vedettes carrying their pennants on lance heads affixed to the stirrups which undulated in the air as the horses pranced and caracalled the tramp of troops the sighing of bugles and the resounding surges of music surrounded them it was afternoon the beginning of the first day's procession from the abbey doubtless was at hand the stirring air communicated the thrills of an immense event and the people petrified into attention stood crushed against each other in rows of forlorn expectancy the suffocating excitement was unbearable the more so because of its immobility leocraft decided to rush through london and reach victoria park the hackney marshes and clapton in order to determine the attitude the action of the poorer classes thompson was unwilling to desert the fermenting throngs around trafalgar square or miss for a moment the kaleidoscope of changing soldiery and so leocraft leaving him entered a hansom and shot off he was not averse to this solitude his affections for miss tobit had lately warmed into a less indifferent kindliness and he began to feel a gnawing anxiety lest the pretty scotch woman thought less of him in the way lovers like than she did of her cousin the handsome and obnoxiously unconcerned thompson thompson knew exactly leocraft's feelings and regarded them with unconcealed forbearance and what was more provoking with a frank condescension of sympathy and yet the men had become good friends they had talked long and seriously with all the elements of critical guidance they could summon about the strange reversal or revolution in the nation's affairs 
but at these moments they were in an impersonal frame of contact and the personal exigencies which later crept between them were all absent lecraft's intellectual weight easily made itself felt in these discussions and thompson with cordial alacrity assumed the obedient position of audience and pupil end of chapter eight part one chapter eight part two of the evacuation of england by l p gratacap this librivox recording is in the public domain as lecraft was driven eastward in the swinging vehicle he flung himself against its cushions and again thought of the monstrous and incredible metamorphosis in the fortunes of his people the vigorous life of ten centuries with all its memories the heaped-up riches of its achievements the splendid literary legacy of the past with its art its lineaments of beauty its dusky shadows the solicitous charm of its contrasted periods of history the deep encrustation nay rather the unfathomable deposits of character and accomplishment which overlaid the kingdom of england and in this city of london the beating heart of its vast interests thickly choked each avenue and current of its life to abandon all this at the summons of a temperatural caprice at the tempestuous whim of an earthquake before the blind violence of frost and snow and ice was the most unendurable of humiliations it bit too deeply at the generalized assumption of the whole world that man ruled the earth it soured the contentment of his avid vanity and to the englishman it assailed the hitherto impregnable fortress of his heroic conceit and yet the old dream of a greater england arose as it had arisen a hundred times before in all these troubling and disconcerting months an england leaping forward as an exultant youth bearing in his hands the trophies of new and brighter conquests flushed under changed environments with the inspiration of new ambitions and new powers of creation issuing into a greater chapter of human growth than had ever before been conceived or written and yet what an eviction this glorious old england with its sweet homes its innumerable beauties its convincing happiness of downs and glade and gardens flowering into clouds of blossoms its lakes its gentle streams its aesthetic softness and dimness its manifold and opulent charm of landscape the hurrying and constant kisses of its moist skies in league with all the graces of the seasons to cast this aside and begin again elsewhere in regions drear and sterile of all these things ah that was too hard too hard and as he had often done leocraft covered his face with his hands and sobbed amid these fluctuating thoughts and feelings the hansom swung with vehement oscillations along the streets in the more deserted parts of london and brought its occupant in sight of the bethnal green museum from which a diversion along old ford road and approach road flung him into victoria park the huge playground of the poorer eastern section of the city he was driven to the eastern part of the immense reservation and was gratified to find a public meeting in progress the exact thing he most wished to be present at and to estimate in a broad and treeless area of the park with the grass showing hesitatingly after the long winter but vivid also in spots in the strong light of the afternoon with an atmosphere strangely variant from the traditional and to leocraft much loved velvety softness and mellowed obscuration of former days were gathered a multitude of people they surrounded a speaker who on some sort of improvised platform with a knot of associated leaders with a swaying body and occasionally outstretched hands was engaged in a harangue which was received with attention unattended by the slightest demonstration of assent or disapproval 
it looked from a short distance almost like a devotional assembly it seemed so reverently silent and as leacraft approached this impression was partially at least verified for the speaker's hands ceased their agitated appeal the occasional higher cries proceeding from his lips died away and a song or a hymn burst suddenly from the still motionless multitude it lasted for an instant perhaps a single verse and as leacraft drew near another man from the platform group stood up and stepped to the front of the small stand at that precise moment the cannonading agreed upon as a signal announced the starting of the royal cortege and the sad beginning of the imperial evacuation of england it was heard with far-away reverberations as it was repeated from other nearer points and this vagueness by a congruity of effect with the dull misery weighing on leacraft's heart seemed to give to it a deeper poignancy of grievous import it produced the impression of an irrevocable doom as the sounds were heard by the assembled crowds the speaker lifted his hand and raised his face skyward as if in supplication the heads were all uncovered by one spontaneous impulse and caught in the same wave of feeling leacraft sought the invocation of his own blessing on the king and all he stood for the interrupted speaker began his address the man was a strong type his face was somewhat leisurely framed in short whiskers confined to his cheeks his eyes were large blue and unblinking with a resolute look in them that had the merit of extorting at least a respectful recognition his complexion met all the requirements of the english reputation for colour but it left no impression of having attained its superior brilliancy through less innocent means than exercise and personal care his broad high forehead a little heightened in its expansive effect through the faltering recession of the iron-grey hair that stood a little stiffly above it rose above the admirably firm nose whose size and contour formed to the reader of physiognomies another compelling admonition to give its wearer the rational allegiance of attention the man's voice was musical with a single intonation that imparted to it much carrying power and it yielded to certain tendencies of relaxation in speaking that gave it almost a feminine sweetness leacraft put him down for a labour leader of a sort character and design belonging to the best elements of the current labour thought and organisation a man of that impressive stamp in modern adjustments of self-assertion of which john burns was so extraordinary an example he had begun his speech as leacraft with insistent zeal pushed his way deeply toward the centre and margins nearer the stage of the attentive throng my friends we must think for ourselves we are not likely to have our thinking done for us to the best advantage now there are some plain undeniable facts they are the kind of facts which cannot be hid under a bushel basket nor for that matter under a king's crown one of the most intelligible of these facts and it is fundamental is that the number of individual heads apportioned to the same number of paired legs make up the population and units of population make nations and nothing else can an aggregate of gentlemen dressed in wigs or holding truncheons sticking out of purple and gold braided shawls never has and from sheer destitution never could make a nation by all the signs around us and i'm willing to accept them without any question this country of ours is going to move is about to begin housekeeping somewhere else and i think it is an imperative necessity for the success of such a change that every one living now on this island and calling himself an englishman must move also and move to the same place here here but that moving is conditioned it is indispensably necessary that we proclaim that condition and insist upon its acceptance we hold the situation in our own hands we control the key to the future to make or mar to destroy the continuity of the english name why because if to-morrow the english workingman refused to follow the english flag to australia and took his wisdom his tools and his savings somewhere else that flag would lose twenty millions of subjects 
and would wave over a remnant that could not ensure its protection or its support hear hear but the condition the speaker paused sweeping his eyes over the sea of upturned faces as if he was hunting through the chaotic assemblage for the disclosure of some particular visage which either as an ally or an opponent might receive the shock of his omnipotent secret whether he discovered the facial invitation or not was not revealed in his subsequent action he wheeled sideways to the stiffened line of men behind him doubtless expectant and impatient numbers in the afternoon's programme and bringing his clenched hand into the hollowed palm of his left hand shouted and not discordantly the condition is the abolition for ever of the law of entail that to-day makes us a servile race again he paused as if so ponderous a statement so fiercely declared would elicit a demonstration but to leocraft's abounding wonder not a sound rose from the vast audience whether it was appalled or thrilled interested or pleased or dumbfounded it gave no sign its immutable decree for the speaker to go on was its very silence no public order could conveniently with respect to his own sensitive needs for public encouragement stop there but he had become cautious he felt that perchance his auditors yet held mental reservations in favour of things as they were as they wished them to continue i say with all my heart and soul he went on stay with the flag stay with the king stay with our lords and ladies but on one condition as freemen to whose keeping now in this hour of peril they are wholly given into your hands the god of nations entrusts their fate but that fate can only be propitious as you are true to yourselves your children and your children's children then came the long delayed approval a wave of excited pleasure brushed across the crowds and the hand clapping begun in many separate centres ran together and with shouts of acquiescence with cheers with central and periphera agitation the huge aggregate expressed its tumultuous adhesion leacraft felt that the loyalty of these people was not impaired and that the logic of events would still hold them united in a consentaneous allegiance at least to the idea of the english nation though it was pretty evident that the democratic claims of a wider opportunity for personal for family promotion leavened all their feelings and that in the new regime it might be expected that a great deal of the present relation of the classes would be swept away and that the old-time idolatry of degree the mere flunkeyism of homage to name and genealogical prestige among the masses had shrunken into nothingness the stage was again occupied by a speaker who was interested in very practical and urgent questions the how and where and when the disposition of the emigrants to the new country and he revelled in plans provisions details of occupancy and employment he showed conclusively the power and effectiveness of organization and the surprising accommodations that can be extracted from the most forlorn prospects by a shrewd use of forethought and combination funds had been scraped together settlements as yet in the dream stage of realization created and a practical socialism consummated in the confederation of a large numbers in one common venture this aspect of the emigration was dwelt upon by the speaker with some rigour it was a surprise to leacraft and lent a strange expression to the still irreconcilable spectacle of englishmen looking for a new home leacraft soon tired of sums schedules names and lists and wandered away over the park through the scattered groups many centred around one of those popular tribunes who by reason of a little more leisure perhaps a little more application and always much more labial facility influenced their class profoundly the broad lawns were filled with these improvised parliaments in which too banter argument retort query admonition bore a part the perplexing thing was the average satisfaction shown by the people a kind of holiday anticipation as if they were off for an excursion 
to them perhaps it seemed a new start in life with the ground less encumbered by rivals by restrictions less shadowed by priority and favours for a few and by the intimidation of a necessary subserviency they almost seemed happy in the thought of change there was bitterness in this and yet to leacraft with his undissembling and emancipated mind it was understood it meant chance to these people this removal and to most of them chance never came never could come as they were and then to linger was starvation loneliness disuse death the business of the country had enormously shrunken its productive power had been halved commerce was drifting in stronger and steadier currents elsewhere and nowhere so strongly as to germany while the overmastering preeminence of america loomed up in proportions that paralyzed conjecture pondering on all these things leacraft in his absorbed way stumbled over a little girl on the edge of one of the shaded walks he quickly stooped and picked her up and confronted by the young mother already hastening to the rescue of her child i should have been more careful said the embarrassed gentleman well indeed we have all good reason to be thinking more than seeing these times said the smiling mother i wonder what we'll all be like this time come twelve month oh i dare say that we shall be doing much the same thing that we do here in a different place and then we shall be a year older the young woman laughed and attested a complete willingness to talk more as she raised the ruffled child from the grass and moved nearer to leacraft nor was leacraft indifferent he felt nettled and wilful with a subconsciousness of disappointment and fear this human and healthy mother with the fresh guerdon of her blushing youth in her arms was a helpful companion and then she carried the solace of some new story perhaps a new need and leacraft was not averse to being sympathetic or helpful willie that's my man sir continued the girl is right glad to get away last candlemas his mother died and left willie her savings and that and what we have will guide us to america and willie he says that he can get a home and have a little land and willie will be better of his sickness he's not here the day because of his cough and the fever that he has ah sir it makes me chill at my heart to see him and to think that we are going so far and the sweet face looked piteously at leacraft and the tears overran the sad grey eyes leacraft saw it all a consumptive father poor out of work staking everything now to reach that bourne where the hopeless of all nations saw the welcome light of opportunity as he thought of this he saw how great this avulsion was what a tearing up of the roots of family and home life and how ruthlessly they were to be planted in all sorts of soils under alien skies with inauspicious hands to tend and raise them he turned to the young mother and said it won't seem so far if a face from the old home greets you there i shall be there also and i will not only be glad to see you but glad to help you if you need it take this and opening his card case he wrote an address in new york city if he continued you do not remain in new york this will always find me good-bye he extended his hand and shook with unaffected warmth the hand of the young englishwoman to whom the future loomed up in misty and insecure perhaps menacing shadows how merciful is sympathy with what a solacing hand it soothes the ruffled brow of care and how genially it bids the springs of life still follow and for a moment at least flow too in the sunlight of affection the englishwoman seized leacraft's hand and pressed it tightly and her face looked into his with almost an enamoured thankfulness she raised the baby girl and held it close to leacraft and the restrained englishman kissed it with quaint shyness at the instant all the shifting helplessness about him moved him inexpressibly again they shook hands and the englishman betrayed into emotional excess walked rapidly away reassuring her at the last that he would indeed be soon in america
a few feet away a different encounter swept him into a contrasted realm of emotional excitement a rude brawling loafer none too sober and reckless in oaths and obscenity had seized the small flags of two little boys union jacks and throwing them down on the ground with an outburst of profanity trampled and defaced them the englishman inflamed and ardent holding a wounded heart stood stupefied and insulted the next instant he had snatched the flags from their degradation and with an instantaneous revulsion struck the culprit of this outrage squarely in the face the blow was unmistakably adequate the ruffian reeled and fell and failed to regain his feet before a shout of applause greeted leacraft and a concourse of men who had hastened to the spot on the outcry of the children surrounded him with welcome salutation a fine blow well hit and straight as a gunshot man that was the right medicine for his complaint i'm thinking that a little water might wash it down i say boys let's duck him souse him in the lake a tubbing might clean his sassy mouth and a man is none too good to be rolled in the mud himself who treads on the english flag the subject of this criticism was on his feet again in a rather belligerent mood blinking and rolling his fists in a minatory fashion and sputtering defiance and presenting a transient spectacle of inebriety and coarseness that would have been ludicrous if the temper of the men behind the new speaker had not seemed so hostile leacraft felt that they would do some serious mischief to the miserable delinquent and he stepped in front of them interposing his body between the foremost of the ranks and the now somewhat intimidated drunkard i think my friends that you should spare yourselves the trouble to punish this miscreant just now let him alone neither he nor his kind are likely to hurt our flag he has learned his lesson Today, my friends it becomes us to command ourselves and hold ourselves above resentment we are all sad our hearts are heavy the old manse is to be left and new conquests across the waters made new homes oh how large the vision grows the men had enclosed leacraft in a dense circle he saw that he had their attention while the stumbling object of their first anger effected a shuffling retreat with ignominious haste his ruse now was to entirely capture their thoughts it is a vision of a new england one made so by our devotion the fixed quality of our patriotism an undeviating union among ourselves and just pride in our history our race our king it may be a better england it cannot be a more beautiful england we are deeply stricken while we bow to this necessity let us make the grandest display of fortitude of resource of hope of courage of skill of judgment ever known in our disaster we shall again conquer the world and hold it submissive at our feet leacraft had enough disengagement of thought to half smile to himself at this grandiloquent pretense but he knew his audience it was quite british imbued with that cloutish conceit which all popular masses in every successful nation instinctively display he had appealed to their conceit though not only to that and they responded enthusiastically as he finished this mild buncombe not without some misgivings as to his own honesty as he intended at first to repair to the united states the men nearest to him grasped his hand others shouted approbation and still others in silence moved away shaking their heads leacraft talked with the men about him he found that they had been assigned places in the scheme of emigration some were going to australia with a systematic dispersion over the region which most needed their labor others to new zealand into socialistic farming others to the cape and rhodesia and still others to canada so that his exalted sentiment of solidarity lost a little of its impressiveness 
leocraft lingered a while longer and as the day ended in a refulgent sunset with church bells near and far ringing to the services that now for a week would be held at all hours inaugurating an unbroken intercession at the throne of grace for the guidance and protection of the people he left his cordial acquaintances and went westward he reached park lane near the kensington gardens gloucester house and the fountain of thornycroft the region of mayfair the dazzling centre the illustrious apse of english social splendour where the inherited privileges of life were not discordantly blended with the no less inherited gifts of fortune that spot in all london which to relinquish would seem to sound the depths of national disgrace the moon swam in the lucent sky the air was clear but cold and the familiar ravishing softness of the june nights as london knew them once was gone those illumined mists the dewiness that spread from the ground to the enveloping air and threw veil over veil of shimmering opacity upon arch and tower sward tree bridge and storied palace was all gone too and the beautiful neighbourhood as leofcraft wandered through it from cumberland gate where he saw snow still resting in sheltered recesses along park lane to hyde park corners through grosvenor place to chapel street to belgrave square was revealed in an aerial sincerity that gave its splendour an almost scintillant loveliness and drove still deeper into leofcraft's heart the sense of a bewildering bereavement the streets were filled with flying equipages and the mansions were ablaze the sidewalks held few pedestrians and as leocraft sorrowfully moved through the stately purlieus music swept out from open windows or swinging doors often he paused and watched the descending occupants of the carriages they were entrancing women and peerless men their laughter was silvery and undismayed unchecked by tears could it be possible that these inner esoteric circles of london high life and unimaginable wealth indulged in revelry could not the crash and fall of empires turn the votaries of gaiety to soberer thoughts or stifle the intoxicating voice of pleasure leocraft wondered and the weariness of a great suspense weighed him down the ingrained puritanism of his nature raged against this heartlessness this indecent bravado a mockery of joy where all should be shadowed with the sighs of penitence and supplication leocraft was bitterly offended at this apparent heartlessness it startled him beyond the limits of endurance he looked for some representative of this foolish life upon whom to turn with rebuke and denunciation leocraft wandered on in a disconsolate mood and the growing indications with the falling night that the fashionable world of london was engaged in a preconcerted way to spend the last hours of its metropolitan sojourn in a spendthrift vortex of excitement and conviviality moved him to muttered objurgations he had slipped past hyde corners past the apsley house had glided with hastening steps as his passion of revolt at this unseemly loss of self-respect rose to a towering indignation into grosvenor square he stood facing the long facade where in repetitive elegance with columned porches and mansard roofs and wall-like chimneys the mansions of the very rich illumined at all their windows poured forth a torrent of light aggrieved and stupefied he shot into berkeley square and still no interruption to the aspect of mad revelry could it be a frenzied spasm of indulgence before separation for ever from the bliss of the west end that terrestrial paradise of swelldom and financial and social glory he wondered and thus wondering he came to devonshire house fronting piccadilly the comfortable home with its small brickwork peaking chimney-pots the low entablature and triple doors behind the iron gateway and the unbroken watch of the woman-headed sphinxes on either side of the elevated escutcheon of the kingdom was there encompassed by its imprisoning walls and here too the effrontery of lavish gaiety assaulted his eyes the gates were flung wide open powdered footmen were ranged before the doors 
arriving and departing carriages threaded piccadilly with conscienceless celerity music uttered its delicious melodies and in them was no requiem note no throb of sorrow and the guests crowding into its dazzling halls seemed untouched by thoughts less careless than the joys of the fleeting moments whose hurrying steps were bringing the dawn of disaster to england exasperated leocraft turned on his heel in disgust and was going towards leicester square when a sharp report somewhere on the side of the geological museum and ahead of his position startled him and the next instant he saw a carriage with prancing steeds plunging down the street the swaying figure of the driver denoting his complete loss of control while on one side of the equipage that side toward leocraft the pale face of a gentleman was seen and beside him the distractive visage of an elderly lady as the carriage approached leocraft it crossed the street and the front wheels collided with the curbing this administered a slight detention and the struggling horses turned again to the opposite side of the thoroughfare quick to see his advantage leocraft sprang to the head of the nearer horse and exerting all his strength which was not inconsiderable he succeeded in tripping the beast and as it fell the traces holding its companion broke and the freed creature raced away down the avenue the driver leaped to the sidewalk and held the now imprisoned horse which starting to its feet stood trembling beside him while leocraft hastened to the door of the vehicle to liberate its occupants he had already been forestalled by the gentleman himself who pushed the door back as leocraft reached it and stepped to the walk followed instantly by the lady in much commotion and disorder their agitation was short-lived and succumbed to the exercise of their own self-control it was the gentleman who first spoke i am under the deepest obligation to you sir for your quickness and your courage you readily have saved us from a miserable fate and leocraft interrupted you were going to some rendezvous of pleasure this sir in my opinion on the eve of the nation's assassination deserved punishment the speech was crude rude perhaps and the bitter taunt smote the stranger like a physical blow he recoiled from it as if the sting of a cowhide had crossed his face his face itself was a study he stared at leocraft and as the latter met his gaze unflinchingly the pale face distinguished in outline feature and expression flushed to the temples while the eyes seated under bushy brows gazed at leocraft with a peculiar earnestness not relieved of the dangerous suggestion of a rising passion his companion understood his excitement she clutched his arm and seemed to apprehend a physical outbreak then the mouth opened and spoke and the voice was unexpectedly calm and the utterances measured we are under deep obligation to you sir but it is difficult for me to restrain myself before the false statements you have ventured to make can you explain this insult he moved nearer to leocraft who did not budge but inspired with an increasing vigour of disgust and eager to summarily remonstrate at the seeming cruelty of the parade about him its grotesque wickedness said i do not wish to take advantage of the accidental relations which have thus unexpectedly thrown us together but surely it is known among men and known bitterly among englishmen that the shadows of an awful twilight are falling about them and the nation's day is closing at such a crisis can it be possible for men and women calling themselves english in whom the memory of english fame and english glory is still a present pride can it be possible that at this moment they still consort for amusement for display for the fugitive follies of mutual admiration this aristocracy is the head and forefront of the nation and it should now be bowed in penitence in supplication in the agony of self-inquiry and it stupefies me to find them gay when the heart of england is breaking with grief a curious metamorphosis worked in the lineaments of the gentleman he was addressing the hard lines relaxed and a wistful smile that drew its occult meaning from the man's interior sadness stole softly over his face he put out his hand which leocraft accepted and he returned leocraft's pressure 
there was an instant's silence and then the stranger spoke still holding leocraft's hand and retaining his undeviating inspection of leocraft's face as if he would force upon himself the recognition of a friend these are just words sir he began but how much you misunderstand what is going on here this apparent revelry is an effort to keep from swooning it is the forced continuance of a life familiar to us when that life is to be crushed into nothingness it is the defiance of habit the revolt against extinction the mortal protest against the infamous tyranny of circumstances it is a delirium of indulgence to forget what is coming upon us a moment's arbitrary refusal to think of the future a dance in whose whirl we shall remit the impulses of suicide it is unreasonable but its monstrous unreasonableness to you sir measures our appalling sense of the disaster we cannot stop to think of measures the intensity of the recoil from obliteration like the dressed and garlanded victim of an aztec immolation we taste again the festive sweets upon which perhaps our cloyed appetites are no longer to feed we are the sufferers in this eviction the greatest the poor the artisan labourer the vast mediocrity lose something but it amounts to little more than the exchange of one station here for another of the same sort somewhere else in a material sense our loss is incalculable half our riches disappears but with that loss goes social prestige title and the moral consciousness of elevation the breath of our nostrils i sir am leocraft did not move his astonishment was too sharply focused upon all the astounding previous confession and continued the man the ruin of worldly fortune seems small after all compared with the sacrifice of that dignified and sheltered life which moved serenely with every accompaniment of joy in these delightful abodes and under the protecting aegis of an inexpressible separation from the rest of the world but he seemed to wish to justify himself somehow as he noticed the still petrified stare of leocraft we have not been neglectful of the matters of adjustment committees have been appointed plans laid funds appropriated agents dispatched for the selection of our new homes and though we take our flight with lopped wings our plumage may in time resume its former beauty do not misunderstand us because of these assemblies we too carry deeper than you the pain of an unutterable grief he finished and leocraft drawn into a reverie over the singular confession which was anything but reassuring and partook to his mind of the dementia of the foolish victim of a depraved habit was silent he felt the imperious requirements of speech but he could say nothing he felt pity he was not without sympathy though perhaps in that matter a certain savour of self-denying control and a practical judgment interfered with his approval of the hyperbole of the speaker and almost dreaming he stood there while the stranger and his lady re-entered their carriage to which the runaway horse had been reattached and drove off leocraft watched them mechanically and then turned walked down piccadilly crossed green park and looked at buckingham palace the huge structure was partially illuminated and the square in front of it was filled with soldiers many of whom were at rest around the victoria memorial to an officer lounging near by leocraft said can you tell me where the king is to-night he sleeps at st leonard's in shoreditch was the laconic reply End of chapter eight part two